Chapters forty one and forty two of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter forty one. We levy contributions on the shipping. Scarcely a week went by after the Julia's sailing when, with the proverbial restlessness of sailors, some of the men began to grow weary of the Calabooza Baratani and resolved to go boldly among the vessels in the bay and offer to ship. The thing was tried, but though strongly recommended by the commodore of the beachcombers, in the end they were invariably told by the captains to whom they applied that they bore an equivocal character ashore and would not answer. So often were they repulsed that we pretty nearly gave up all thoughts of leaving the island in this way, and growing domestic again, settled down quietly at Captain Bob's. It was about this time that the whaling ships, which have their regular seasons for cruising, began to arrive at Papati, and of course their crews frequently visited us. This is customary all over the Pacific. No sailor steps ashore, but he straightway goes to the Calabooza, where he is almost sure to find some poor fellow or other in confinement for desertion, or alleged mutiny, or something of that sort. Sympathy is proffered, and, if need be, tobacco. The latter, however, is most in request. As a solace to the captive, it is invaluable. Having fairly carried the day against both consul and captain, we were objects of even more than ordinary interest to these philanthropists and they always cordially applauded our conduct. Besides, they invariably brought along something in the way of refreshments, occasionally smuggling in a little pisco. Upon one occasion, when there was quite a number present, a calabash was passed round, and a pecuniary collection taken up for our benefit. One day a newcomer proposed that two or three of us should pay him a sly nocturnal visit aboard his ship engaging to send us away well freighted with provisions. This was not a bad idea, nor were we at all backward in acting upon it. Night after night every vessel in the harbor was visited in rotation, the foragers borrowing Captain Bob's canoe for the purpose. As we all took turns at this, two by two, in due course it came to Longost and myself, for the sailors invariably linked us together. In such an enterprise, I somewhat distrusted the doctor, for he was no sailor and very tall, and a canoe is the most ticklish of navigable things. However, it could not be helped, and so we went. But a word about the canoes before we go any further. Among the society islands, the art of building them, like all native accomplishments, has greatly deteriorated, and they are now the most inelegant as well as the most insecure of any in the South Seas. In Cook's time, according to his account, there was at Tahiti a royal fleet of seventeen hundred and twenty large war canoes, handsomely carved and otherwise adorned. At present, those used were quite small, nothing more than logs hollowed out, sharpened at one end, and then launched into the water. To obviate a certain rolling propensity, the Tahitians, like all Polynesians, attached to them what sailors call an outrigger. It consists of a pole floating alongside, parallel to the canoe, and connected with it by a couple of cross sticks, a yard or more in length. Thus equipped, the canoe cannot be overturned, unless you overcome the buoyancy of the pole, or lift it entirely out of the water. Now Captain Bob's gig was exceedingly small, so small and of such a grotesque shape, that the sailors christened it the pill-box, and by this appellation it always went. In fact, it was a sort of sulky, meant for a solitary paddler, but on an emergency capable of floating two or three. The outrigger was a mere switch, alternately rising in air and then depressed in the water. Assuming the command of the expedition, upon the strength of my being a sailor, I packed the long doctor with a paddle in the bow, and then shoving off, leaped into the stern, thus leaving him to do all the work, and reserving to myself the dignified sinecure of steering. All would have gone well were it not that my paddler made such clumsy work 
that the water spattered and showered down upon us without ceasing. Continuing to ply his tool, however, quite energetically, I thought he would improve after a while, and so let him alone. But by and by, getting wet through with this little storm we were raising, and seeing no signs of its clearing off, I conjured him in mercy's name to stop short and let me wring myself out. Upon this, he suddenly turned round, when the canoe gave a roll, the outrigger flew overhead, and the next moment came rap on the doctor's skull, and we were both in the water. Fortunately, we were just over a ledge of coral, not half a fathom under the surface. Depressing one end of the filled canoe, and letting go of it quickly, it bounced up and discharged great part of its contents, so that we easily bailed out the remainder and again embarked. This time my comrade coiled himself away in a very small space, and enjoining upon him not to draw a single unnecessary breath, I proceeded to urge the canoe along by myself. I was astonished at his docility, never speaking a word, and stirring neither hand nor foot. But the secret was he was unable to swim, and in case we met with a second mishap, there were no more ledges beneath to stand upon. "'Drowning's but a shabby way of going out of the world,' he exclaimed upon my rallying him, "'and I'm not going to be guilty of it.' At last the ship was at hand, and we approached with much caution, wishing to avoid being hailed by any one from the quarter-deck. Dropping silently under her bows, we heard a low whistle, the signal agreed upon, and presently a goodly-sized bag was lowered over to us. We cut the line, and then paddled away as fast as we could, and made the best of our way home. Here we found the rest waiting impatiently. The bag turned out to be well filled with sweet potatoes boiled, cubes of salt beef and pork, and a famous sailor's pudding, what they call duff, made of flour and water, and of about the consistence of an underdone brick. With these delicacies and keen appetites, we went out into the moonlight and had a nocturnal picnic. Chapter 42 Motu Otu, A Tahitian Casuist the pillbox was sometimes employed for other purposes than that described in the last chapter. We sometimes went a pleasuring in it. Right in the middle of Papatee Harbor is a bright green island, one circular grove of waving palms, and scarcely a hundred yards across. It is of coral formation, and all round, for many rods out, the bay is so shallow that you might wade anywhere. Down in these waters, as transparent as air, you see coral plants of every hue and shape imaginable, antlers, tufts of azure, waving reeds like stalks of grain, and pale green buds and mosses. In some places you look through prickly branches down to a snow-white floor of sand, sprouting with flinty bulbs, and crawling among these are strange shapes, some bristling with spikes, others clad in shining coats of mail, and here and there round forms all spangled with eyes. The island is called Motu Otu, and around Motu Otu have I often paddled of a white moonlit night, pausing now and then to admire the marine gardens underneath. The place is the private property of the queen, who has a residence there, a melancholy-looking range of bamboo houses, neglected and falling to decay among the trees. Commanding the harbor as it does, Her Majesty has done all she could to make a fortress of the island. The margin has been raised and leveled, and built up with a low parapet of hewn blocks of coral. Behind the parapet are ranged at wide intervals a number of rusty old cannon, of all fashions and calibers. They are mounted upon lame, decrepit-looking carriages, ready to sink under the useless burden of bearing them up. Indeed, two or three have given up the ghost altogether, and the pieces they sustained lie half buried among their bleaching bones. Several of the cannon are spiked, probably with a view of making them more formidable, as they certainly must be to anyone undertaking to fire them off. Presented to Pomery at various times by captains of British armed ships, these poor old dogs of war, thus toothless and turned out to die, formerly bayed in full pack as the battle-hounds of old England. 
there was something about Motu Otu that struck my fancy, and I registered a vow to plant my foot upon its soil, notwithstanding an old bareheaded sentry menaced me in the moonlight with an unsightly musket. As my canoe drew scarcely three inches of water, I could paddle close up to the parapet without grounding, but every time I came near, the old man ran towards me, pushing his piece forward, but never clapping it to his shoulder. Thinking he only meant to frighten me, I at last dashed the canoe right up to the wall, purposing a leap. It was the rashest act of my life, for never did coconut come nearer getting demolished than mine did then. With the stock of his gun, the old warder fetched a tremendous blow, which I managed to dodge, and then falling back, succeeded in paddling out of harm's reach. He must have been dumb, for never a word did he utter. But, grinning from ear to ear, and with his white cotton robe streaming in the moonlight, he looked more like the spook of the island than anything mortal. I tried to effect my object by attacking him in the rear, but he was all front, running about the place as I paddled, and presenting his confounded musket wherever I went. At last I was obliged to retreat, and to this day my vow remains unfulfilled. It was a few days after my repulse from before the walls of Motu Otu that I heard a curious case of casuistry argued between one of the most clever and intelligent natives I ever saw in Tahiti, a man by the name of Arhitu, and our learned Theban of a doctor. It was this, whether it was right and lawful for any one being a native to keep the European Sabbath, in preference to the day set apart as such by the missionaries, and so considered by the islanders in general. It must be known that the missionaries of the good ship Duff, who more than half a century ago established the Tahitian reckoning, came hither by the way of the Cape of Good Hope, and, by thus sailing to the eastward, lost one precious day of their lives all round, getting about that much in advance of Greenwich time. For this reason, vessels coming round Cape Horn, as they most all do nowadays, find it Sunday in Tahiti, when, according to their own view of the matter, it ought to be Saturday. But as it won't do to alter the log, the sailors keep their Sabbath, and the islanders theirs. This confusion perplexes the poor natives mightily, and it is to no purpose that you endeavor to explain so incomprehensible a phenomenon. I once saw a worthy old missionary essay to shed some light on the subject, and though I understood but few of the words employed, I could easily get at the meaning of his illustrations. They were something like the following. Here, says he, you see this circle, describing a large one on the ground with a stick. Very good. Now you see this spot here, marking a point in the perimeter. Well, this is Baratani, England and I'm going to sail around to Tahiti. Here I go, then, following the circle round. And there goes the sun, snatching up another stick and commissioning a bandy-legged native to travel round with it in a contrary direction. Now, then, we are both off and going away from each other, and here you see I have arrived at Tahiti, making a sudden stop. And look now where bandy-legs is. But the crowd strenuously maintained that bandy-legs ought to be somewhere above them in the atmosphere, for it was a traditionary fact that the people from the duff came ashore when the sun was high overhead. And here the old gentleman, being a very good sort of man, doubtless, but no astronomer, was obliged to give up. Arhitu, the casuist alluded to, though a member of the church, and extremely conscientious about what Sabbath he kept, was more liberal in other matters. Learning that I was something of a meconery, in this sense a man able to read and cunning in the use of a pen, he desired the slight favor of my forging for him a set of papers, for which he said he would be much obliged and give me a good dinner of roast pig and Indian turnip in the bargain. Now Arhitu was one of those who board the shipping for their washing, and the competition being very great, the proudest chiefs not disdaining to solicit custom in person, though the work is done by their dependents, he had decided upon a course suggested by a knowing sailor, a friend of his. 
he wished to have manufactured a set of certificates purporting to come from certain man-of-war and merchant captains known to have visited the island recommending him as one of the best getters-up of fine linen in all polynesia at this time arhitu had known me but two hours and as he made the proposition very coolly i thought it rather presumptuous and told him so but as it was quite impossible to convey a hint that there was a slight impropriety in the thing i did not resent the insult but simply declined end of chapters forty one and forty two recording by tricia g chapters forty three and forty four of omu this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas, by Herman Melville. Chapter 43. One is judged by the company he keeps. Although, from its novelty, life at Captain Bob's was pleasant enough for the time, there were some few annoyances connected with it, anything but agreeable to a soul of sensibility prejudiced against us by the malevolent representations of the consul and others many worthy foreigners ashore regarded us as a set of lawless vagabonds though truth to speak better behaved sailors never stepped on the island nor any who gave less trouble to the natives but for all this whenever we met a respectably dressed european ten to one he shunned us by going over to the other side of the road this was very unpleasant, at least to myself, though, certes, it did not prey upon the minds of the others. To give an instance, of a fine evening in Tahiti, but they are all fine evenings there, you may see a bevy of silk bonnets and parasols passing along the broom road, perhaps a band of pale little white urchins, sickly exotics, and, oftener still, sedate elderly gentlemen with canes at whose appearance the natives here and there slink into their huts. These are the missionaries, their wives and children, taking a family airing. Sometimes, by the by, they take horse and ride down to Point Venus and back, a distance of several miles. At this place is settled the only survivor of the first missionaries that landed, an old, white-headed, saint-like man, by the name of Wilson, the father of our friend the consul. The little parties on foot were frequently encountered, and recalling as they did so many pleasant recollections of home and the ladies, I really longed for a dress coat and beaver that I might step up and pay my respects. But, situated as I was, this was out of the question. On one occasion, however, I received a kind inquisitive glance from a matron in gingham, sweet lady i have not forgotten her her gown was a plaid but a glance like hers was not always bestowed one evening passing the veranda of a missionary's dwelling the dame his wife and a pretty blonde young girl with ringlets were sitting there enjoying the sea breeze then coming in all cool and refreshing from the spray of the reef as i approached the old lady peered hard at me and her very cap seemed to convey a prim rebuke. The blue English eyes by her side were also bent on me. But, oh, heavens, what a glance to receive from such a beautiful creature! As for the mob cap, not a fig did I care for it, but to be taken for anything but a cavalier by the ringleted one was absolutely unendurable. I resolved on a courteous salute to show my good breeding, if nothing more, but happening to wear a sort of turban, hereafter to be particularly alluded to, there was no taking it off and putting it on again with anything like dignity. At any rate, then, here goes a bow. But another difficulty presented itself. My loose frock was so voluminous that I doubted whether any spinal curvature would be perceptible. "'Good evening, ladies,' exclaimed I at last, advancing winningly. "'A delightful air from the sea, ladies. "'Hysterics and hard-shorn! Who would have thought it? "'The young lady screamed, and the old one came near fainting. "'As for myself, I retreated in double-quick time, "'and scarcely drew breath until safely housed in the calabooza.'" Chapter 44 
Cathedral of Papawar, the Church of the Coconuts. On Sundays I always attended the principal native church on the outskirts of the village of Papati, and not far from the Calabusa Baratani. It was esteemed the best specimen of architecture in Tahiti. Of late, they have built their places of worship with more reference to durability than formerly. At one time there were no less than thirty-six on the island, mere barns, tied together with thongs, which went to destruction in a very few years. One, built many years ago in this style, was a most remarkable structure. It was erected by Pomery the Second, who, on this occasion, showed all the zeal of a royal proselyte. The building was over seven hundred feet in length, and of a proportionate width. The vast ridge pole was, at intervals, supported by a row of thirty-six cylindrical trunks of the breadfruit tree, and, all round, the wall plates rested on shafts of the palm. The roof, steeply inclining to within a man's height of the ground, was thatched with leaves, and the sides of the edifice were open. Thus spacious was the royal mission chapel of Papawar. At its dedication, three distinct sermons were, from different pulpits, preached to an immense concourse gathered from all parts of the island. As the chapel was built by the king's command, nearly as great a multitude was employed in its construction as swarmed over the scaffolding of the great temple of the Jews. Much less time, however, was expended. In less than three weeks from planting the first post, the last tier of palmetto leaves drooped from the eaves, and the work was done. Apportioned to the several chiefs and their dependents, the labor, though immense, was greatly facilitated by every one's bringing his post, or his rafter, or his pole strung with thatching, ready for instant use. The materials thus prepared being afterwards secured together by thongs, there was literally neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was building. But the most singular circumstance connected with the South Sea Cathedral remains to be related. As well for the beauty as the advantages of such a site, the islanders love to dwell near the mountain streams and so a considerable brook, after descending from the hills and watering the valley, was bridged over in three places, and swept clean through the chapel. Flowing waters! What an accompaniment to the songs of the sanctuary, mingling with them the praises and thanksgivings of the green solitudes inland! But the chapel of the Polynesian Solomon has long since been deserted. Its thousand rafters of hibiscus have decayed and fallen to the ground, and now the stream murmurs over them in its bed. The present metropolitan church of Tahiti is very unlike the one just described. It is of moderate dimensions, boarded over, and painted white. It is furnished also with blinds, but no sashes. Indeed, were it not for the rustic thatch, it would remind one of a plain chapel at home. The woodwork was all done by foreign carpenters, of whom there are always several about Papati. Within, its aspect is unique, and cannot fail to interest a stranger. The rafters overhead are bound round with fine matting of variegated dyes, and all along the ridge pole, these strappings hang pendant, in alternate bunches of tassels and deep fringes of stained grass. The floor is composed of rude planks. Regular aisles run between ranges of native settees, bottomed with crossed braids of the coconut fiber, and furnished with backs. But the pulpit, made of a dark, lustrous wood, and standing at one end, is by far the most striking object. It is preposterously lofty. Indeed, a capital bird's-eye view of the congregation ought to be had from its summit. Nor does the church lack a gallery, which runs round on three sides, and is supported by columns of the coconut tree. Its facings are here and there daubed over with a tawdry blue, and in other places, without the slightest regard to uniformity, patches of the same color may be seen. In their ardor to decorate the sanctuary, the converts must have borrowed each a brush full of paint, and zealously daubed away at the first surface that offered. As hinted, the general impression is extremely curious. 
little light being admitted, and everything being of a dark color, there is an indefinable Indian aspect of duskiness throughout. A strange, woody smell also, more or less invading every considerable edifice in Polynesia, is at once perceptible. It suggests the idea of worm-eaten idols packed away in some old lumber-room at hand. For the most part, the congregation attending this church is composed of the better and wealthier orders, the chiefs and their retainers. In short, the rank and fashion of the island. This class is infinitely superior in personal beauty and general healthfulness to the Marinhor, or common people the latter having been more exposed to the worst and most debasing evils of foreign intercourse. On Sundays, the former are invariably arrayed in their finery, and thus appear to the best advantage. Nor are they driven to the chapel, as some of their inferiors are, to other places of worship. On the contrary, capable of maintaining a handsome exterior, and possessing greater intelligence, they go voluntarily. In respect of the woodland colonnade supporting its galleries, I called this chapel the Church of the Coconuts. It was the first place for Christian worship in Polynesia that I had seen, and the impression upon entering during service was all the stronger. Majestic-looking chiefs, whose fathers had hurled the battle club, and old men who had seen sacrifices smoking upon the altars of Oro, were there. And hark! Hanging from the bough of a breadfruit tree without, a bell is being struck with a bar of iron by a native lad. In the same spot, the blast of the war conch had often resounded, but to the proceedings within. The place is well filled. Everywhere meet the eye the gay calico draperies worn on great occasions by the higher classes, and forming a strange contrast of patterns and colors. In some instances, these are so fashioned as to resemble as much as possible European garments. This is an excessively bad taste. Coats and pantaloons, too, are here and there seen, but they look awkwardly enough and take away from the general effect. But it is the array of countenances that most strikes you. Each is suffused with the peculiar animation of the Polynesians when thus collected in large numbers. Every robe is rustling, every limb in motion, and an incessant buzzing going on throughout the assembly. The tumult is so great that the voice of the placid old missionary, who now rises, is almost inaudible. Some degree of silence is at length obtained through the exertions of half a dozen strapping fellows in white shirts and no pantaloons. Running in among the settees, they are at great pains to inculcate the impropriety of making a noise by creating a most unnecessary racket themselves. This part of the service was quite comical. There is a most interesting Sabbath school connected with the church, and the scholars, a vivacious mischievous set, were in one part of the gallery. I was amused by a party in the corner. The teacher sat at one end of the bench with a meek little fellow by his side. When the others were disorderly, this young martyr received a rap, intended probably as a sample of what the rest might expect if they didn't amend. Standing in the body of the church and leaning against a pillar was an old man, in appearance very different from others of his countrymen. He wore nothing but a coarse, scant mantle of faded tappa, and from his staring, bewildered manner, I set him down as an aged bumpkin from the interior, unaccustomed to the strange sights and sounds of the metropolis. This old worthy was sharply reprimanded for standing up, and thus intercepting the view of those behind. But not comprehending exactly what was said to him, one of the white liveried gentry made no ceremony of grasping him by the shoulders and fairly crushing him down into a seat. During all this, the old missionary in the pulpit, as well as his associates beneath, never ventured to interfere, leaving everything to native management. With South Sea Islanders, assembled in any numbers, there is no other way of getting along. End of chapters 43 and 44 Recording by Tricia G.
Chapters forty five and forty six of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter forty five. A missionary's sermon with some reflections. Some degree of order at length restored, the service was continued by singing. The choir was composed of twelve or fifteen ladies of the mission, occupying a long bench to the left of the pulpit. Almost the entire congregation joined in. The first air fairly startled me. It was the brave tune of Old Hundred, adapted to a Tahitian psalm. After the graceless scenes I had recently passed through, this circumstance, with all its accessories, moved me forcibly. Many voices around were of great sweetness and compass. The singers also seemed to enjoy themselves mightily, some of them pausing now and then and looking around, as if to realize the scene more fully. In truth, they sang right joyously, despite the solemnity of the tune. The Tahitians have much natural talent for singing, and on all occasions are exceedingly fond of it. I have often heard a stave or two of psalmody, hummed over by rakish young fellows, like a snatch from an opera. With respect to singing, as in most other matters, the Tahitians widely differ from the people of the Sandwich Islands, where the parochial flocks may be said rather to bleat than sing. The psalm concluded, a prayer followed. Very considerately, the old missionary made it short, for the congregation became fidgety and inattentive as soon as it commenced. A chapter of the Tahitian Bible was now read, a text selected, and the sermon began. It was listened to with more attention than I had anticipated. Having been informed from various sources that the discourses of the missionaries, being calculated to engage the attention of their simple auditors, were, naturally enough, of a rather amusing description to strangers. In short, that they had much to say about steamboats, Lord Mayor's coaches, and the way fires are put out in London, I had taken care to provide myself with a good interpreter, in the person of an intelligent Hawaiian sailor, whose acquaintance I had made. Now, Jack, said I, before entering, hear every word and tell me what you can as the missionary goes on. Jack's was not, perhaps, a critical version of the discourse, and at the time I took no notes of what he said. Nevertheless, I will here venture to give what I remember of it, and, as far as possible, in Jack's phraseology, so as to lose nothing by a double translation. Good friends, I glad to see you, and I very well like to have some talk with you today. Good friends, very bad times in Tahiti, it make me weep. Pomeree is gone, the island no more yours, but the wee-wees, French. Wicked priests here, too, and wicked idols in woman's clothes and brass chains. Footnote meaning the showy image of the Virgin in the little Catholic chapel. End footnote. Good friends, know you speak or look at them, but I know you won't. They belong to a set of robbers, the wicked wee-wees. Soon these bad men be made to go very quick. Baratani ships of thunder come, and away they go. But no more about this now, I speak more by-by. Good friends, many whale-ships here now and many bad men come in em. No good sailors living, that you know very well. They come here, cause so bad they no keep em home. My good little girls, no run after sailors. No go where they go, they harm you. Where they come from, no good people talk to em, just like dogs. Here they talk to Pomery, and drink arva with great pufai. Footnote. The word arva, as here employed, means brandy. Pufai was one of the highest chiefs on the island, and a jolly companion. End footnote. Good friends, this very small island, but very wicked and very poor, these two go together. Why Baratani so great? Because that island good island, and send missionary. Footnote. This word, evidently a corruption of missionary, is used under various significations by the natives. Sometimes it is applied to a communicant of the church, but above it has its original meaning. And footnote. To poor Kanaka. Footnote. A word generally used by foreigners to designate the natives of Polynesia. 
End footnote. In Baratani, every man rich, plenty things to buy, and plenty things to sell, houses bigger than Pomeries and more grand. Everybody, too, ride about in coaches bigger than hers. Footnote. Pomeree, some time previous, had received a present of a chariot from Queen Victoria. It was afterwards sent to Oahu, Sandwich Islands, and there sold to pay her debts. End footnote. And wear fine tapa every day. Several luxurious appliances of civilization were here enumerated and described. Good friends, little to eat left at my house. Schooner from Sydney no bring bag of flour, and Kanaka no bring pig and fruit enough. Mickenary do great deal for Kanaka, Kanaka do little for Mickenary. So, good friends, we've plenty of coconut baskets, fill em and bring em tomorrow. Such was the substance of great part of this discourse, and, whatever may be thought of it, it was specially adapted to the minds of the islanders, who are susceptible to no impressions except from things palpable or novel and striking. To them a dry sermon would be dry indeed. The Tahitians can hardly ever be said to reflect. They are all impulse, and so, instead of expounding dogmas, the missionaries give them the large type, pleasing cuts, and short and easy lessons of the primer. Hence, anything like a permanent religious impression is seldom or never produced. In fact, there is, perhaps, no race on earth less disposed by nature to the monitions of Christianity than the people of the South Sea. And this assertion is made with full knowledge of what is called the Great Revival at the Sandwich Islands about the year 1836, when several thousands were, in the course of a few weeks, admitted into the bosom of the church. But this result was brought about by no sober moral convictions, as an almost instantaneous relapse into every kind of licentiousness soon afterwards testified. It was the legitimate effect of a morbid feeling, engendered by the sense of severe physical wants, preying upon minds excessively prone to superstition, and by fanatical preaching inflamed into the belief that the gods of the missionaries were taking vengeance upon the wickedness of the land. Footnote. At this period, many of the population were upon the verge of starvation. End footnote. It is a noteworthy fact that those very traits in the Tahitians which induced the London Missionary Society to regard them as the most promising subjects for conversion, and which led, moreover, to the selection of their island as the very first field for missionary labor, eventually proved the most serious obstruction. An air of softness in their manners, great apparent ingenuousness and docility, at first misled. But these were the mere accompaniments of an indolence bodily and mental, a constitutional voluptuousness, and an aversion to the least restraint, which, however fitted for the luxurious state of nature in the tropics, are the greatest possible hindrances to the strict moralities of Christianity. Added to all this is a quality inherent in Polynesians, and more akin to hypocrisy than anything else. It leads them to assume the most passionate interest in matters for which they really feel little or none whatever, but in which those whose power they dread, or whose favor they court, they believe to be at all affected. Thus, in their heathen state, the Sandwich Islanders actually knocked out their teeth, tore their hair, and mangled their bodies with shells, to testify their inconsolable grief at the demise of a high chief or member of the royal family. And yet Vancouver relates that, on such an occasion, upon which he happened to be present, those apparently the most abandoned to their feelings immediately assumed the utmost light-heartedness on receiving the present of a penny whistle or a Dutch looking-glass. Similar instances also have come under my own observation. The following is an illustration of the trait alluded to, as occasionally manifested among the converted Polynesians. At one of the Society Islands, Riotair, I believe, the natives, for special reasons, desired to commend themselves particularly to the favor of the missionaries. Accordingly, during divine service, many of them behaved in a manner otherwise unaccountable, and precisely similar to their behavior as heathens. They pretended to be wrought up to madness by the preaching which they heard. They rolled their eyes, foamed at the mouth, 
fell down in fits, and so were carried home. Yet, strange to relate, all this was deemed the evidence of the power of the Most High, and as such, was heralded abroad. But, to return to the Church of the Coconuts, the blessing pronounced, the congregation disperse, enlivening the broom road with their waving mantles. On either hand, they disappear down the shaded pathways, which lead off from the main route, conducting to hamlets in the groves, or to the little marine villas upon the beach. There is considerable hilarity, and you would suppose them just from an old-fashioned hevar, or jolly heathen dance. Those who carry Bibles swing them carelessly from their arms by cords of sinate. The Sabbath is no ordinary day with the Tahitians. So far as doing any work is concerned, it is scrupulously observed. The canoes are hauled up on the beach, the nets are spread to dry. Passing by the hen-coop huts on the roadside, you find their occupants idle, as usual, but less disposed to gossip. After service, repose broods over the whole island. The valleys reaching inland look stiller than ever. In short, it is Sunday, their taboo day. The very word, formerly expressing the sacredness of their pagan observances, now proclaiming the sanctity of the Christian Sabbath. Chapter 46 Something About the Canna Kippers A worthy young man, formerly a friend of mine, I speak of Kulu with all possible courtesy, since after our intimacy there would be an impropriety in doing otherwise, this worthy youth, having some genteel notions of retirement, dwelt in a maro boro, or breadfruit shade, a pretty nook in a wood, midway between the Calabooza Baratani and the Church of the Coconuts. Hence, at the latter place, he was one of the most regular worshippers. Kulu was a blade, standing up in the congregation in all the bravery of a striped calico shirt, with the skirts rakishly adjusted over a pair of white sailor trousers, and hair well anointed with coconut oil, he ogled the ladies with an air of supreme satisfaction, nor were his glances unreturned. But such looks as the Tahitian bells cast at each other, frequently turning up their noses at the advent of a new cotton mantle recently imported in the chest of some armorous sailor. Upon one occasion I observed a group of young girls, in tunics of coarse soiled sheeting, disdainfully pointing at a damsel in a flaming red one. Ui tutai auri, they said with ineffable scorn, itai maitai. You are a good-for-nothing huzzy, no better than you should be. Now Kulu communed with the church, so did all these censorious young ladies. Yet, after eating breadfruit at the Eucharist, I knew several of them, the same night, to be guilty of some sad derelictions. Puzzled by these things, I resolved to find out, if possible, what ideas, if any, they entertained of religion. But as one's spiritual concerns are rather delicate for a stranger to meddle with, I went to work as adroitly as I could. Farno, an old native who had recently retired from active pursuits, having thrown up the business of being a sort of running footman to the queen, had settled down in a snug little retreat, not fifty rods from Captain Bob's. His selecting our vicinity for his residence may have been with some view to the advantages it afforded for introducing his three daughters into polite circles. At any rate, not averse to receiving the attentions of so devoted a gallant as the doctor, the sisters, communicants be it remembered, kindly extended to him free permission to visit them sociably whenever he pleased. We dropped in one evening and found the ladies at home. My long friend engaged his favorites, the two younger girls, at the game of now, or hunting a stone under three piles of tapa. For myself, I lounged on a mat with Idea, the eldest, dallying with her grass fan, and improving my knowledge of Tahitian. The occasion was well adapted to my purpose, and I began. Ah, Idea, Mickenary Oe? The same as drawling out, By the by, Miss Idea, do you belong to the church? Yes, me Mickenary, was the reply. But the assertion was at once qualified by certain reservations, so curious that I cannot forbear their relation. Mickenary Anna, church member here, exclaimed she, laying her hand upon her mouth, 
and a strong emphasis on the adverb. In the same way, and with similar exclamations, she touched her eyes and hands. This done, her whole air changed in an instant, and she gave me to understand, by unmistakable gestures, that in certain other respects she was not exactly a mickenary. In short, Idea was, a sad good Christian at the heart, a very heathen in the carnal part. Footnote. Pope, Epistle to a Lady. End footnote. The explanation terminated in a burst of laughter, in which all three sisters joined and, for fear of looking silly, the doctor and myself. As soon as good breeding would permit, we took leave. The hypocrisy in matters of religion, so apparent in all Polynesian converts, is most injudiciously nourished in Tahiti, by a zealous and, in many cases, a coercive superintendence over their spiritual well-being. But it is only manifested with respect to the common people, their superiors being exempted. On Sunday mornings, when the prospect is rather small for a full house in the minor churches, a parcel of fellows are actually sent out with rattans to the highways and byways as whippers in of the congregation. This is a sober fact. Footnote. With abhorrence and disgust, the custom is alluded to by a late benevolent visitor at the island. See page 763 of The Memoirs of the Life and Gospel Labors of the Late Daniel Wheeler a work hereafter to be more particularly alluded to. End footnote. These worthies constitute a religious police, and you always know them by the great white diapers they wear. On weekdays, they are quite as busy as on Sundays, to the great terror of the inhabitants, going all over the island and spying out the wickedness thereof. Moreover, they are the collectors of fines, levied generally in grass mats, for obstinate non-attendance upon divine worship and other offences amenable to the ecclesiastical judicature of the missionaries. Old Bob called these fellows canna kippers, a corruption, I fancy, of our word constable. He bore them a bitter grudge, and one day, drawing near home, and learning that two of them were just then making a domiciliary visit at his house, he ran behind a bush, and as they came forth, two green breadfruit from a hand unseen, took them each between the shoulders. The sailors in the Calabusa were witnesses to this, as well as several natives, who, when the intruders were out of sight, applauded Captain Bob's spirit in no measured terms, the ladies present vehemently joining in. Indeed, the canna kippers have no greater enemies than the latter, and no wonder, the impertinent varlets, popping into their houses at all hours, are forever prying into their peccadilloes. Kulu, who at times was patriotic and pensive, and mourned the evils under which his country was groaning, frequently inveighed against the statute which thus authorized an utter stranger to interfere with domestic arrangements. He himself, quite a ladies' man, had often been annoyed thereby. He considered the canna kippers a bore. Besides their confounded inquisitiveness, they add insult to injury by making a point of dining out every day at some hut within the limits of their jurisdiction. As for the gentleman of the house, his meek endurance of these things is amazing. But, good easy man, there is nothing for him but to be as hospitable as possible. These gentry are indefatigable. At the dead of night prowling around the houses, and in the daytime hunting amorous couples in the groves yet in one instance the chase completely baffled them. It was thus. Several weeks previous to our arrival at the island, someone's husband and another person's wife, having taken a mutual fancy for each other, went out for a walk. The alarm was raised, and with hue and cry they were pursued. But nothing was seen of them again until the lapse of some ninety days when we were called out from the Calabooza to behold a great mob enclosing the lovers and escorting them for trial to the village. Their appearance was most singular. The girdle accepted, they were quite naked. Their hair was long, burned yellow at the ends, and entangled with burrs, and their bodies scratched and scarred in all directions. It seems that acting upon the love-in-a-cottage principle, they had gone right into the interior, and throwing up a hut in an uninhabited valley, had lived there, 
until in an unlucky stroll they were observed and captured they were subsequently condemned to make one hundred fathoms of broom road a six months work if not more often when seated in a house conversing quietly with its inmates i have known them betray the greatest confusion at the sudden announcement of a can of kippers being in sight to be reported by one of these officials as a tutai auri in general signifying a bad person or disbeliever in christianity is as much dreaded as the forefinger of titus oates was levelled at an alleged papist but the islanders take a sly revenge upon them upon entering a dwelling the canakippers oftentimes volunteer a pharisaical prayer-meeting hence they go in secret by the name of bura artois literally pray to gods End of chapters 45 and 46. Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 47 and 48 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 47. How they dress in Tahiti except where the employment of making tapa is inflicted as a punishment the echoes of the cloth mallet have long since died away in the listless valleys of tahiti formerly the girls spent their mornings like ladies at their timbre frames now they are lounged away in almost utter indolence true most of them make their own garments but this comprises but a stitch or two the ladies of the mission by the by being entitled to the credit of teaching them to sew. The kaihi waihini, or petticoat, is a mere breadth of white cotton or calico, loosely enveloping the person from the waist to the feet. Fastened simply, by a single tuck, or by twisting the upper corners together, this garment frequently becomes disordered, thus affording an opportunity of being coquettishly adjusted. Over the kaihi, they wear a sort of gown, open in front, very loose, and as negligent as you please. The ladies here never dress for dinner. But what shall be said of those horrid hats? Fancy a bunch of straw, plaited into the shape of a coal scuttle, and stuck, bolt upright, on the crown, with a yard or two of red ribbon flying about like kite strings. Milliners of Paris, what would ye say to them? Though made by the natives, they are said to have been first contrived and recommended by the missionaries' wives, a report which I really trust is nothing but scandal. Curious to relate, these things for the head are esteemed exceedingly becoming. The braiding of the straw is one of the few employments of the higher classes, all of which but minister to the silliest vanity. The young girls, however, wholly eschew the hats leaving those dowdy old souls their mothers to make frights of themselves as for the men those who aspire to european garments seem to have no perception of the relation subsisting between the various parts of a gentleman's costume to the wearer of a coat for instance pantaloons are by no means indispensable and the bell-crowned hat and a girdle are full dress the young sailor for whom kulu deserted me presented him with a shaggy old pea-jacket, and, with this buttoned up to his chin, under a tropical sun, he promenaded the broom-road quite elated. Dr. Longghost, who saw him thus, ran away with the idea that he was under medical treatment at the time, in the act of taking what the quacks call a sweat. A bachelor friend of Captain Bob rejoiced in the possession of a full European suit, in which he often stormed the ladies' hearts. Having a military leaning, he ornamented the coat with a great scarlet patch on the breast, and mounted it also, here and there, with several regimental buttons, slyly cut from the uniform of a parcel of drunken marines, sent ashore on a holy day from a man of war. But in spite of the ornaments, the dress was not exactly the thing. From the tightness of the cloth across the shoulders, his elbows projected from his sides, like an ungainly rider's and his ponderous legs were jammed so hard into his slim nether garments that the threads of every seam showed, and at every step he looked for a catastrophe. In general, there seems to be no settled style of dressing among the males. They wear anything they can get. In some cases, 
awkwardly modifying the fashions of their fathers, so as to accord with their own altered view of what is becoming. But ridiculous as many of them now appear in foreign habiliments, the Tahitians presented a far different appearance in the original national costume, which was graceful in the extreme, modest to all but the prudish, and peculiarly adapted to the climate. But the short kilts of dyed tappa, the tasseled morose, and other articles formerly worn, are at the present day prohibited by law as indecorous. For what reason necklaces and garlands of flowers among the women were also forbidden, I never could learn, but it is said that they were associated in some way with a forgotten heathen observance. Many pleasant and seemingly innocent sports and pastimes are likewise interdicted. In old times, there were several athletic games practiced, such as wrestling, foot racing, throwing the javelin, and archery. In all these they greatly excelled, and, for some, splendid festivals were instituted. Among their everyday amusements were dancing, tossing the football, kite-flying, flute-playing, and singing traditional ballads, now all punishable offenses, though most of them have been so long in disuse that they are nearly forgotten. In the same way, the opio, or festive harvest home of the breadfruit, has been suppressed, though, as described to me by Captain Bob, it seemed wholly free from any immoral tendency. Against tattooing of any kind, there is a severe law. That this abolition of their national amusements and customs was not willingly acquiesced in, is shown in the frequent violation of many of the statutes inhibiting them, and especially in the frequency with which their hevars, or dances, are practiced in secret. Doubtless, in thus denationalizing the Tahitians, as it were, the missionaries were prompted by a sincere desire for good, but the effect has been lamentable. Supplied with no amusements, in place of those forbidden, the Tahitians, who require more recreation than other people, have sunk into a listlessness, or indulge in sensualities, a hundred times more pernicious than all the games ever celebrated in the temple of Tani. Chapter 48. Tahiti as it is. As, in the last few chapters, several matters connected with the general condition of the natives have been incidentally touched upon, it may be well not to leave so important a subject in a state calculated to convey erroneous impressions. Let us bestow upon it, therefore, something more than a mere cursory glance. But, in the first place, let it be distinctly understood that in all I have to say upon this subject, both here and elsewhere, I mean no harm to the missionaries, nor their cause. I merely desire to set forth things as they actually exist. Of the results which have flowed from the intercourse of foreigners with the Polynesians, including the attempts to civilize and Christianize them by the missionaries, Tahiti, on many accounts, is obviously the fairest practical example. Indeed, it may now be asserted that the experiment of Christianizing the Tahitians and improving their social condition by the introduction of foreign customs has been fully tried. The present generation have grown up under the auspices of their religious instructors, and although it may be urged that the labors of the latter have at times been more or less obstructed by unprincipled foreigners, Still, this in no wise renders Tahiti any less a fair illustration. For, with obstacles like these, the missionaries in Polynesia must always and everywhere struggle. Nearly sixty years have elapsed since the Tahitian mission was started, and during this period it has received the unceasing prayers and contributions of its friends abroad. Nor has any enterprise of the kind called forth more devotion on the part of those directly employed in it. It matters not that the earlier laborers in the work, although strictly conscientious, were as a class ignorant, and in many cases deplorably bigoted. Such traits have in some degree characterized the pioneers of all faiths. And although, in zeal and disinterestedness, the missionaries now on the island are, perhaps, inferior to their predecessors, they have, nevertheless, in their own way at least, labored hard to make a Christian people of their charge. Let us now glance at the most obvious changes wrought in their condition. The entire system of idolatry has been done away, 
together with several barbarous practices engrafted thereon. But this result is not so much to be ascribed to the missionaries as to the civilizing effects of a long and constant intercourse with whites of all nations, to whom for many years Tahiti has been one of the principal places of resort in the South Seas. At the Sandwich Islands, the potent institution of the taboo, together with the entire paganism of the island, was utterly abolished by a voluntary act of the natives, some time previous to the arrival of the first missionaries among them. The next most striking change in the Tahitians is this. From the permanent residence among them of influential and respectable foreigners, as well as from the frequent visits of ships of war, recognizing the nationality of the island, its inhabitants are no longer deemed fit subjects for the atrocities practiced upon mere savages. And hence, secure from retaliation, vessels of all kinds now enter their harbors with perfect safety. But let us consider what results are directly ascribable to the missionaries alone. In all cases, they have striven hard to mitigate the evils resulting from the commerce with the whites in general. Such attempts, however, have been rather injudicious, and often ineffectual. In truth, a barrier almost insurmountable is presented in the dispositions of the people themselves. Still, in this respect, the morality of the islanders is, upon the whole, improved by the presence of the missionaries. But the greatest achievement of the latter, and one which in itself is most hopeful and gratifying, is that they have translated the entire Bible into the language of the island, and I have myself known several who were able to read it with facility. They have also established churches and schools for both children and adults. The latter, I regret to say, are now much neglected which must be ascribed, in a great measure, to the disorders growing out of the proceedings of the French. It were unnecessary here to enter diffusely into matters connected with the internal government of the Tahitian churches and schools, nor upon this head is my information copious enough to warrant me in presenting details. But we do not need them. We are merely considering general results, as made apparent in the moral and religious condition of the island at large. Upon a subject like this, however, it would be altogether too assuming for a single individual to decide, and so, in place of my own random observations, which may be found elsewhere, I will here present those of several known authors, made under various circumstances, at different periods, and down to a comparatively late date. A few very brief extracts will enable the reader to mark for himself what progressive improvement, if any, has taken place. Nor must it be overlooked that of these authorities, the two first in order are largely quoted by the Right Reverend M. Russell in a work composed for the express purpose of imparting information on the subject of Christian missions in Polynesia. And he frankly acknowledges, moreover, that they are such as, quote, cannot fail to have great weight with the public. End quote. Footnote. Polynesia, or an historical account of the principal islands of the South Sea, by the Right Reverend M. Russell, LLD. Harper's Family Library Edition, page 96. End footnote. After alluding to the manifold evils entailed upon the natives by foreigners, and their singularly inert condition, and after somewhat too severely denouncing the undeniable errors of the mission, Kotzebue, the Russian navigator, says, quote, A religion like this, which forbids every innocent pleasure, and cramps or annihilates every mental power, is a libel on the divine founder of Christianity. It is true that the religion of the missionaries has, with a great deal of evil, effected some good. It has constrained the vices of theft and incontinence, but it has given birth to ignorance, hypocrisy, and a hatred of all other modes of faith, which was once foreign to the open and benevolent character of the Tahitian. Footnote. A new voyage round the world in the years 1823, 24, 25, 26, by Otto von Kotzebue, post-captain in the Russian Imperial Service, London, 1830, two volumes octavo. Volume 1, page 168, and footnote. Captain Beachy says that while at Tahiti, he saw scenes, quote, which must have convinced the greatest skeptic 
of the thoroughly immoral condition of the people, and which would force him to conclude, as Turnbull did many years previous, footnote, the author of A Voyage Round the World, in the years 1800 to 1804, three volumes, octavo, London, 1805, and footnote, that their intercourse with the Europeans had tended to debase rather than exalt their condition. Footnote, narrative of a voyage to the Pacific and Bering Straits, under the command of Captain F. W. Beechey, R. N., London, 1831, volume 1, page 287, and footnote. About the year 1834, Daniel Wheeler, an honest-hearted Quaker, prompted by motives of the purest philanthropy, visited, in a vessel of his own, most of the missionary settlements in the South Seas. He remained some time at Tahiti, receiving the hospitalities of the missionaries there, and from time to time exhorting the natives. After bewailing their social condition, he frankly says of their religious state, quote, Certainly, appearances are unpromising, and however unwilling to adopt such a conclusion, there is reason to apprehend that Christian principle is a great rarity. Footnote. Memoirs of the Life and Gospel Labors of the Late Daniel Wheeler, a Minister of the Society of Friends. London, 1842, Octavo, page 757. End footnote. Such, then, is the testimony of good and unbiased men who have been upon the spot. But how comes it to differ so widely from impressions of others at home? Simply thus, instead of estimating the result of missionary labors by the number of heathens who have actually been made to understand and practice, in some measure at least, the precepts of Christianity, this result has been unwarrantably inferred from the number of those who, without any understanding of these things, have in any way been induced to abandon idolatry and conform to certain outward observances. By authority of some kind or other, exerted upon the natives through their chiefs, and promoted by the hope of some worldly benefit to the latter, and not by appeals to the reason, have conversions in Polynesia been in most cases brought about. Even in one or two instances, so often held up as wonderful examples of divine power, where the natives have impulsively burned their idols, and rushed to the waters of baptism, the very suddenness of the change has but indicated its unsoundness. Williams, the martyr of Aromanga, relates an instance where the inhabitants of an island professing Christianity voluntarily assembled and solemnly revived all their heathen customs. All the world over, facts are more eloquent than words, and the following will show in what estimation the missionaries themselves hold the present state of Christianity and morals among the converted Polynesians. On the island of Imeo, attached to the Tahitian mission, is a seminary under the charge of the Rev. Mr. Simpson and wife for the education of the children of the missionaries exclusively. Sent home, in many cases at a very early age, to finish their education, the pupils here are taught nothing but the rudiments of knowledge, nothing more than may be learned in the native schools. Notwithstanding this, the two races are kept as far as possible from associating, the avowed reason being to preserve the young whites from moral contamination. The better to ensure this end, every effort is made to prevent them from acquiring the native language. They went even further at the Sandwich Islands, where, a few years ago, a playground for the children of the missionaries was enclosed with a fence many feet high, the more effectually to exclude the wicked little Hawaiians. And yet, strange as it may seem, the depravity among the Polynesians, which renders precautions like these necessary, was in a measure unknown before their intercourse with the whites. The excellent Captain Wilson, who took the first missionaries out to Tahiti, affirms that the people of that island had, in many things, quote, more refined ideas of decency than ourselves. Footnote. A Missionary Voyage to the South Pacific Ocean, Appendix, page 336-342. End footnote. Vancouver also has some noteworthy ideas on this subject respecting the Sandwich Islanders. Footnote. See Vancouver's Voyages, Porto Edition, Volume 1, page 172. End footnote. That the immorality alluded to is continually increasing, is plainly shown in the numerous, severe, 
and perpetually violated laws against licentiousness of all kinds in both groups of islands it is hardly to be expected that the missionaries would send home accounts of this state of things hence captain beechey in alluding to the polynesian researches of ellis says that the author has impressed his readers with a far more elevated idea of the moral condition of the tahitians and the degree of civilization to which they have attained than they deserve or at least than the facts which came under his observation authorized he even goes on to say that in his intercourse with the islanders quote, they had no fear of him and consequently acted from the impulse of their natural feelings so that he was the better enabled to obtain a correct knowledge of their real disposition and habits footnote beechey's narrative page two hundred sixty nine and footnote from my own familiar intercourse with the natives this last reflection still more forcibly applies to myself end of chapters forty seven and forty eight recording by tricia g Chapters forty nine and fifty of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter forty nine. Same subject continued. We have glanced at their moral and religious condition. Let us see how it is with them socially and in other respects. It has been said that the only way to civilize a people is to form in them habits of industry. Judged by this principle, the Tahitians are less civilized now than formerly. True, their constitutional indolence is excessive, but surely, if the spirit of Christianity is among them, so unchristian a vice ought to be, at least, partially remedied. But the reverse is the fact. Instead of acquiring new occupations, old ones have been discontinued. As previously remarked, the manufacture of tapa is nearly obsolete in many parts of the island. So, too, with that of the native tools and domestic utensils, very few of which are now fabricated, since the superiority of European wares has been made so evident. This, however, would be all very well were the natives to apply themselves to such occupations as would enable them to supply the few articles they need. But they are far from doing so and the majority being unable to obtain european substitutes for many things before made by themselves the inevitable consequence is seen in the present wretched and destitute mode of life among the common people to me so recently from a primitive valley of the marquesas the aspect of most of the dwellings of the poorer tahitians and their general habits seemed anything but tidy nor could I avoid a comparison immeasurably to the disadvantage of these partially civilized islanders. In Tahiti, the people have nothing to do, and idleness everywhere is the parent of vice. There is scarcely anything, says the good old Quaker Wheeler, so striking or pitiable as their aimless, nerveless mode of spending life. Attempts have repeatedly been made to rouse them from their sluggishness, but in vain. Several years ago, the cultivation of cotton was introduced, and with their usual love of novelty, they went to work with great alacrity. But the interest excited quickly subsided, and now not a pound of the article is raised. About the same time, machinery for weaving was sent out from London, and a factory was started at Afrehitu in Aimeo. The whiz of the wheels and spindles brought in volunteers from all quarters, who deemed it a privilege to be admitted to work. Yet in six months, not a boy could be hired, and the machinery was knocked down and packed off to Sydney. It was the same way with the cultivation of the sugar cane, a plant indigenous to the island. Peculiarly fitted to the soil and climate, and of so excellent a quality, that Bly took slips of it to the West Indies. All the plantations went on famously for a while, the natives swarming in the fields like ants and making a prodigious stir. What few plantations now remain are owned and worked by whites, who would rather pay a drunken sailor eighteen or twenty Spanish dollars a month than hire a sober native for his fish and taro. It is well worthy remark here 
that every evidence of civilization among the South Sea Islands directly pertains to foreigners, though the fact of such evidence existing at all is usually urged as a proof of the elevated condition of the natives. Thus, at Honolulu, the capital of the Sandwich Islands, there are fine dwelling houses, several hotels, and barber shops, aye, even billiard rooms. But all these are owned and used, be it observed, by whites. There are tailors and blacksmiths and carpenters also, but not one of them is a native. The fact is that the mechanical and agricultural employments of civilized life require a kind of exertion altogether too steady and sustained to agree with an indolent people like the Polynesians. Calculated for a state of nature, in a climate providentially adapted to it, they are unfit for any other. Nay, as a race, they cannot otherwise long exist. The following statement speaks for itself. About the year 1777, Captain Cook estimated the population of Tahiti at about 200,000. Footnote. I was convinced, he adds, that from the vast swarms that everywhere appeared, this estimate was not at all too great. End footnote. By a regular census, taken some four or five years ago, it was found to be only 9,000. Footnote. For an allusion to this census, see one of the chapters on Tahiti in the volumes of the U.S. Exploring Expedition. And for the almost incredible depopulation of the Sandwich Islands in recent years, see the same work. The progressive decrease in certain districts for a considerable period is there marked. Ruschenberger, an intelligent surgeon in the United States Navy, takes the following instance from the records kept on the islands. This district of Rohalo in Hawaii at one time numbered 8,679 souls. Four years after, the population was 6,175. Decrease in that time, 2,504. No extraordinary cause is assigned for this depopulation. Vide a voyage around the world in the years 1835-36-37 by W. S. Ruschenberger, M.D., Philadelphia, 1838, Octavo, the chapter on the Sandwich Islands. End footnote. This amazing decrease not only shows the malignancy of the evils necessary to produce it, but from the fact the interference unavoidably follows that all the wars, child murders, and other depopulating causes alleged to have existed in former times were nothing in comparison to them. These evils, of course, are solely of foreign origin. To say nothing of the effects of drunkenness, the occasional inroads of the smallpox, and other things which might be mentioned, it is sufficient to allude to a virulent disease which now taints the blood of at least two-thirds of the common people of the island, and in some form or other is transmitted from father to son. Their first horror and consternation at the earlier ravages of the scourge were pitiable in the extreme. The very name bestowed upon it is a combination of all that is horrid and unmentionable to a civilized being. Distracted with their sufferings, they brought forth their sick before the missionaries when they were preaching, and cried out, Lies, lies, you tell us of salvation, and behold, we are dying. We want no other salvation than to live in this world. Where are there any saved through your speech? Pomery is dead, and we are all dying with your cursed diseases. When will you give over? At present, the virulence of the disorder in individual cases has somewhat abated, but the poison is only the more widely diffused. How dreadful and appalling, breaks forth old Wheeler, the consideration that the intercourse of distant nations should have entailed upon these poor, untutored islanders a curse unprecedented and unheard of in the annals of history. In view of these things, who can remain blind to the fact that so far as mere temporal felicity is concerned, the Tahitians are far worse off now than formerly, and although their circumstances upon the whole are bettered by the presence of the missionaries, the benefits conferred by the latter become utterly insignificant when confronted with the vast preponderance of evil brought about by other means their prospects are hopeless, nor can the most devoted efforts now exempt them from
from furnishing a marked illustration of a principle which history has always exemplified years ago brought to a stand where all that is corrupt in barbarism and civilization unite to the exclusion of the virtues of either state like other uncivilized beings brought into contact with europeans they must here remain stationary until utterly extinct the islanders themselves are mournfully watching their doom several years since pomery the second said to tyreman and bennett the deputies of the london missionary society quote, you have come to see me at a very bad time your ancestors came in the time of men when tahiti was inhabited you are come to behold just the remnant of my people end quote. of like import was the prediction of tiarmoar the high priest of pari who lived over a hundred years ago i have frequently heard it chanted in a low sad tone by aged tahitians a hairy tafau a toro tafararo a now tatararta the palm tree shall grow the coral shall spread but man shall cease Chapter 50. Something Happens to Long Ghost. We will now return to the narrative. The day before the Julia sailed, Dr. Johnson paid his last call. He was not quite so bland as usual. All he wanted was the men's names to a paper, certifying to their having received from him sundry medicaments therein mentioned. This voucher, endorsed by Captain Guy, secured his pay but he would not have obtained for it the sailor's signs manual had either the doctor or myself been present at the time now my long friend wasted no love upon johnson but for reasons of his own hated him heartily all the same thing in one sense for either passion argues an object deserving thereof and so to be hated cordially is only a left-handed compliment which shows how foolish it is to be bitter against any one. For my own part, I merely felt a cool, purely incidental, and passive contempt for Johnson, as a selfish, mercenary apothecary, and hence I often remonstrated with Longghost when he flew out against him, and heaped upon him all manner of scurrilous epithets. In his professional brother's presence, however, he never acted thus, maintaining an amiable exterior to help along the jokes which were played i am now going to tell another story in which my long friend figures with the physician i do not wish to bring one or the other of them too often upon the stage but as the thing actually happened i must relate it a few days after johnson presented his bill as above mentioned the doctor expressed to me his regret that although he johnson had apparently been played off for our entertainment yet nevertheless he had made money out of the transaction and i wonder added the doctor if that now he cannot expect to receive any further pay he could be induced to call again by a curious coincidence not five minutes after making this observation dr longghost himself fell down in an unaccountable fit and without asking anybody's leave captain bob who was by at once dispatched a boy hot foot for johnson meanwhile we carried him to the calabooza and the natives who assembled in numbers suggested various modes of treatment one rather energetic practitioner was for holding the patient by the shoulders while somebody tugged at his feet this resuscitatory operation was called the patata but thinking our long comrade sufficiently lengthy without additional stretching we declined patata ing him presently the physician was spied coming along the broom road at a great rate and so absorbed in the business of locomotion that he heeded not the imprudence of being in a hurry in a tropical climate he was in a profuse perspiration which must have been owing to the warmth of his feelings notwithstanding we had supposed him a man of no heart but his benevolent haste upon this occasion was subsequently accounted for it merely arose from professional curiosity to behold a case most unusual in his polynesian practice now under certain circumstances sailors generally so frolicsome are exceedingly particular in having everything conducted with the strictest propriety accordingly they deputed me as his intimate friend 
to sit at Long Ghost's head, so as to be ready to officiate as spokesman, and answer all questions propounded, the rest to keep silent. "'What's the matter?' exclaimed Johnson, out of breath, and bursting into the calabooza. "'How did it happen? Speak, quick!' And he was looking at Long Ghost. I told him how the fit came on. Singular, he observed. Very good enough pulse, and he let go of it and placed his hand upon his heart. But what's all that frothing at the mouth? he continued, and bless me, look at the abdomen. The region thus denominated exhibited the most unaccountable symptoms. A low rumbling sound was heard, and a sort of undulation was discernible beneath the thin cotton frock. "'Colic, sir?' suggested a bystander. "'Colic be hanged!' shouted the physician. "'Who ever heard of anybody in a trance of the colic?' During this the patient lay upon his back, stark and straight, giving no signs of life except those above mentioned. "'I'll bleed him!' cried Johnson at last. "'Run for a calabash, one of you!' "'Life ho!' here sung out Navy Bob, as if he had just spied a sail. "'What under the sun's the matter with him?' cried the physician, starting at the appearance of the mouth which had jerked to one side and there remained fixed. "'Perhaps it's St. Wittis's hornpipe,' suggested Bob. "'Hold the calabash!' and the lancet was out in a moment. But before the deed could be done, the face became natural. A sigh was heaved, the eyelids quivered, opened, closed, and Long Ghost, twitching all over, rolled on his side and breathed audibly. By degrees, he became sufficiently recovered to speak. After trying to get something coherent out of him, Johnson withdrew, evidently disappointed in the scientific interest of the case. Soon after his departure, the doctor sat up, and upon being asked what upon earth ailed him, shook his head mysteriously. He then deplored the hardship of being an invalid in such a place, where there was not the slightest provision for his comfort. This awakened the compassion of our good old keeper, who offered to send him to a place where he would be better cared for. Longghost acquiesced, and being at once mounted upon the shoulders of four of Captain Bob's men, was marched off in state like the Grand Lama of Tibet. Now I do not pretend to account for his remarkable swoon, but his reason for suffering himself to be thus removed from the calabooza was strongly suspected to be nothing more than a desire to ensure more regularity in his dinner hour, hoping that the benevolent native to whom he was going would set a good table. The next morning we were all envying his fortune, when, of a sudden, he bolted in upon us, looking decidedly out of humor. Hang it, he cried, I'm worse off than ever. Let me have some breakfast. We lowered our slender bag of ship stores from a rafter and handed him a biscuit. While this was being munched, he went on and told his story. After leaving here, they trotted me back into a valley and left me in a hut where an old woman lived by herself. This must be the nurse, thought I, and so I asked her to kill a pig and bake it for I felt my appetite returning. Ita, Ita, ui mati, mati nui. No, no, you too sick. The devil mati ye, said I, give me something to eat. But nothing could be had. Night coming on, I had to stay. Creeping into a corner, I tried to sleep, but it was to no purpose. The old crone must have had the quincy or something else, and she kept up such a wheezing and choking that at last I sprang up and groped after her, but she hobbled away like a goblin, and that was the last of her. As soon as the sun rose, I made the best of my way back, and here I am. He never left us more, nor ever had a second fit. End of chapters 49 and 50 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 51 and 52 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 51. Wilson Gives Us the Cut. Departure for Imeo. 
about three weeks after the julia's sailing our condition began to be a little precarious we were without any regular supply of food the arrival of ships was growing less frequent and what was worse yet all the natives but good old captain bob began to tire of us nor was this to be wondered at we were obliged to live upon their benevolence when they had little enough for themselves besides we were sometimes driven to acts of marauding such as kidnapping pigs and cooking them in the groves at which their proprietors were by no means pleased in this state of affairs we determined to march off to the consul in a body and as he had brought us to these straits demand an adequate maintenance on the point of starting captain bob's men raised the most outrageous cries and tried to prevent us though hitherto we had strolled about wherever we pleased this grand conjunction of our whole force upon one particular expedition seemed to alarm them but we assured them that we were not going to assault the village and so after a good deal of gibberish they permitted us to leave we went straight to the pritchard residence where the consul dwelt this house to which i have before referred is quite commodious it has a wide veranda glazed windows and other appurtenances of a civilized mansion upon the lawn in front are palm trees standing erect here and there like sentinels the consular office a small building by itself is enclosed by the same picket which fences in the lawn we found the office closed but in the veranda of the dwelling-house was a lady performing a tonsorial operation on the head of a prim-looking elderly european in a low white cravat the most domestic little scene i had witnessed since leaving home bent upon an interview with wilson the sailors now deputed the doctor to step forward as a polite inquirer after his health the pair stared very hard as he advanced but no ways disconcerted he saluted them gravely and inquired for the consul upon being informed that he had gone down to the beach we proceeded in that direction and soon met a native who told us that apprised of our vicinity wilson was keeping out of the way we resolved to meet him and passing through the village he suddenly came walking towards us having apparently made up his mind that any attempt to elude us would be useless what do you want of me you rascals he cried a greeting which provoked a retort in no measured terms at this juncture the natives began to crowd round and several foreigners strolled along caught in the very act of speaking to such disreputable acquaintances wilson now fidgeted and moved rapidly towards his office the men following turning upon them incensed he bade them be off he would have nothing more to say to us and then hurriedly addressing captain bob in tahitian he hastened on and never stopped till the postern of pritchard's wicket was closed behind him our good old keeper was now highly excited bustling about in his huge petticoats and conjuring us to return to the calabooza after a little debate we acquiesced this interview was decisive sensible that none of the charges brought against us would stand yet unwilling formally to withdraw them the consul now wished to get rid of us altogether but without being suspected of encouraging our escape thus only could we account for his conduct some of the party however with a devotion to principle truly heroic swore they would never leave him happen what might for my own part i began to long for a change and as there seemed to be no getting away in a ship i resolved to hit upon some other expedient but first i cast about for a comrade and of course the long doctor was chosen we at once laid our heads together and for the present resolved to disclose nothing to the rest a few days previous i had fallen in with a couple of yankee lads twins who originally deserting their ship at fanning's island an uninhabited spot but exceedingly prolific in fruit of all kinds had after a long residence there roved about among the society group they were last from imeo the island immediately adjoining where they had been in the employ of two foreigners who had recently started a plantation there these persons they said had charged them to send over from papeti if they could 
two white men for field laborers. Now, all but the prospect of digging and delving suited us exactly. But the opportunity for leaving the island was not to be slighted, and so we held ourselves in readiness to return with the planters, who, in a day or two, were expected to visit Papati in their boat. At the interview which ensued, we were introduced to them as Peter and Paul, and they agreed to give Peter and Paul fifteen silver dollars a month, promising something more should we remain with them permanently. What they wanted was men who would stay. To elude the natives, many of whom not exactly understanding our relations with the consul, might arrest us were they to see us departing, the coming midnight was appointed for that purpose. When the hour drew nigh, we disclosed our intention to the rest. Some upbraided us for deserting them, others applauded and said that on the first opportunity they would follow our example. At last we bade them farewell, and now there would be a serene sadness in thinking over the scene, since we never saw them again, had not all been dashed by McGee's picking the doctor's pocket of a jackknife in the very act of embracing him. We stole down to the beach, where, under the shadow of a grove, the boat was waiting. After some delay, we shipped the oars, and pulling outside of the reef, set the sail, and with a fair wind, glided away for Aimeo. It was a pleasant trip. The moon was up, the air warm, the waves musical, and all above was the tropical night, one purple vault hung round with soft, trembling stars. The channel is some five leagues wide. On one hand, you have the three great peaks of Tahiti lording it over the ranges of mountains and valleys, and on the other, the equally romantic elevations of Aimeo, high above which a lone peak, called by our companions the Marling Spike, shot up its verdant spire. The planters were quite sociable. They had been seafaring men, and this, of course, was a bond between us. To strengthen it, a flask of wine was produced, one of several which had been procured in person from the French Admiral's steward, for whom the planters, when on a former visit to Papati, had done a good turn by introducing the amorous Frenchman to the ladies ashore. Besides this, they had a calabash filled with wild boar's meat, baked yams, breadfruit, and tombe's potatoes. Pipes and tobacco also were produced and while regaling ourselves, plenty of stories were told about the neighboring islands. At last we heard the roar of the Aimeo Reef, and gliding through a break, floated over the expanse within, which was smooth as a young girl's brow, and beached the boat. Chapter 52 The Valley of Martair We went up through groves to an open space, where we heard voices, and a light was seen glimmering from out a bamboo dwelling. It was the planter's retreat, and in their absence several girls were keeping house, assisted by an old native, who, wrapped up in tapa, lay in the corner smoking. A hasty meal was prepared, and after it we essayed a nap, but alas, a plague, little anticipated, prevented. Unknown in Tahiti, the mosquitoes here fairly eddied around us but more of them anon. We were up betimes and strolled out to view the country. We were in the valley of Martair, shut in on both sides by lofty hills. Here and there were steep cliffs, gay with flowering shrubs, or hung with pendulous vines, swinging blossoms in the air. Of considerable width at the sea, the vale contracts as it runs inland, terminating at the distance of several miles, in a range of the most grotesque elevations, which seem embattled with turrets and towers, grown over with verdure, and waving with trees. The valley itself is a wilderness of woodland, with links of streams flashing through, and narrow pathways fairly tunneled through masses of foliage. All alone in this wild place was the abode of the planters, the only one back from the beach, their sole neighbors, the few fishermen and their families, dwelling in a small grove of coconut trees, whose roots were washed by the sea. The cleared tract which they occupied comprised some thirty acres, level as a prairie, part of which was under cultivation, 
the whole being fenced in by a stout palisade of trunks and boughs of trees staked firmly in the ground this was necessary as a defence against the wild cattle and hogs overrunning the island thus far tombe's potatoes footnote perhaps the finest sweet potato in the world it derives its name from a district of peru near cape blanco very favourable to its growth where also it is extensively cultivated the root is very large sometimes as big as a good-sized melon and footnote were the principal crop raised a ready sale for them being obtained among the shipping touching at papati there was a small patch of the taro or indian turnip also another of yams and in one corner a thrifty growth of the sugar-cane just ripening on the side of the enclosure next the sea was the house newly built of bamboos in the native style the furniture consisted of a couple of sea chests an old box a few cooking utensils and agricultural tools together with three fowling pieces hanging from a rafter and two enormous hammocks swinging in opposite corners and composed of dried bullocks hides stretched out with poles the whole plantation was shut in by a dense forest and close by the house a dwarfed aoa or species of banyan tree had purposely been left twisting over the palisade in the most grotesque manner and thus made a pleasant shade the branches of this curious tree afforded low perches upon which the natives frequently squatted after the fashion of their race and smoked and gossiped by the hour we had a good breakfast of fish speared by the natives before sunrise on the reef pudding of indian turnip fried bananas and roasted breadfruit during the repast our new friends were quite sociable and communicative it seems that like nearly all uneducated foreigners residing in polynesia they had some time previous deserted from a ship and having heard a good deal about the money to be made by raising supplies for whaling vessels they determined upon embarking in the business strolling about with this intention they at last came to martair and thinking the soil would suit set themselves to work they began by finding out the owner of the particular spot coveted and then making a tayo of him he turned out to be tonoi the chief of the fishermen who one day when exhilarated with brandy tore his meagre tapa from his loins and gave me to know that he was allied by blood with pomeri himself and that his mother came from the illustrious race of pontiffs who in old times swayed their bamboo crozier over all the pagans of Imeo a regal and right reverend lineage but at the time i speak of the dusky noble was in decayed circumstances and therefore by no means unwilling to alienate a few useless acres as an equivalent he received from the strangers two or three rheumatic old muskets several red woollen shirts and a promise to be provided for in his old age he was always to find a home with the planters desirous of living in the cosy footing of a father-in-law he frankly offered his two daughters for wives but as such they were politely declined the adventurers though not averse to courting being unwilling to entangle themselves in a matrimonial alliance however splendid in point of family tonoi's men the fishermen of the grove were a sad set secluded in a great measure from the ministrations of the missionaries they gave themselves up to all manner of lazy wickedness strolling among the trees of a morning you came upon them napping on the shady side of a canoe hauled up among the bushes lying under a tree smoking or more frequently still gambling with pebbles though a little tobacco excepted what they gambled for at their outlandish games it would be hard to tell other idle diversions they had also in which they seemed to take great delight as for fishing it employed but a small part of their time upon the whole they were a merry indigent godless race tonoi the old sinner leaning against the fallen trunk of a coconut tree invariably squandered his mornings at pebbles a grey-headed rook of a native regularly plucking him of every other stick of tobacco obtained from his friends the planters toward afternoon he strolled back to their abode 
where he tarried till the next morning, smoking and snoozing, and, at times, prating about the hapless fortunes of the house of Tonoi. But, like any other easy-going old dotard, he seemed for the most part perfectly content with cheerful board and lodging. On the whole, the valley of Martyr was the quietest place imaginable. Could the mosquitoes be induced to emigrate, one might spend the month of August there quite pleasantly. But this was not the case with the luckless long ghost and myself, as will presently be seen. End of chapters 51 and 52 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 53 and 54 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 53 Farming in Polynesia. The planters were both whole souled fellows, but in other respects as unlike as possible. One was a tall, robust Yankee, born in the backwoods of Maine, sallow and with a long face. The other was a short little cockney, who had first clapped his eyes on the monument. The voice of Zeke, the Yankee, had a twang like a cracked vial, and Shorty, as his comrade called him, clipped the aspirate from every word beginning with one. The latter, though not the tallest man in the world, was a good-looking young fellow of twenty-five. His cheeks were dyed with the fine Saxon red, burned deeper from his roving life. His blue eye opened well, and a profusion of fair hair curled over a well-shaped head. But Zeke was no beauty. A strong, ugly man, he was well adapted for manual labor, and that was all. His eyes were made to see with, and not for ogling. Compared with the cockney, he was grave and rather taciturn. But there was a deal of good old humor bottled up in him, after all. For the rest, he was frank, good-hearted, shrewd, and resolute and like Shorty, quite illiterate. Though a curious conjunction, the pair got along together famously. But as no two men were ever united in any enterprise without one getting the upper hand of the other, so in most matters Zeke had his own way. Shorty, too, had imbibed from him a spirit of invincible industry, and heaven only knows what ideas of making a fortune on their plantation. We were much concerned at this, for the prospect of their setting us in their own persons an example of downright hard labor was anything but agreeable. But it was now too late to repent what we had done. The first day, thank fortune, we did nothing. Having treated us as guests thus far, they no doubt thought it would be wanting in delicacy to set us to work before the compliments of the occasion were well over. The next morning, however, they both looked businesslike, and we were put to. Well, boys, boys, said Zeke, knocking the ashes out of his pipe after breakfast, we must get at it. Shorty, give Peter there, the doctor, the big hoe, and Paul the other, and let's be off. Going to a corner, Shorty brought forth three of the implements, and distributing them impartially, trudged on after his partner, who took the lead with something in the shape of an axe. For a moment, left alone in the house, we looked at each other, quaking. We were each equipped with a great clumsy piece of a tree, armed at one end with a heavy, flat mass of iron. The cutlery part, especially adapted to primitive soil, was an importation from Sydney. The handles must have been of domestic manufacture. Hoes, so called, we had heard of and seen, but they were harmless in comparison with the tools in our hands. "'What's to be done with them?' inquired I of Peter. "'Lift them up and down,' he replied, "'or put them in motion some way or other. "'Paul, we are in a scrape. "'But hark, they are calling.' "'And shouldering the hose, off we marched. "'Our destination was the farther side of the plantation, "'where the ground, cleared in part, "'had not yet been broken up. "'But they were now setting about it. "'Upon halting, I asked why a plough was not used.' Some of the young wild steers might be caught and trained for draught. Zeke replied that, for such a purpose, no cattle, to his knowledge, had ever been used in any part of Polynesia. As for the soil of Martair, so obstructed was it with roots, crossing and recrossing each other at all points, that no kind of a plough could be used to advantage. 
the heavy sydney hose were the only thing for such land our work was now before us but previous to commencing operations i endeavored to engage the yankee in a little further friendly chat concerning the nature of virgin soils in general and that of the valley of martair in particular so masterly a stratagem made long ghost brighten up and he stood by ready to join in but what our friend had to say about agriculture all referred to the particular part of his plantation upon which we stood and having communicated enough on this head to enable us to set to work to the best advantage he fell to himself and shorty who had been looking on followed suit the surface here and there presented closely amputated branches of what had once been a dense thicket they seemed purposely left projecting as if to furnish a handle whereby to drag out the roots underneath after loosening the hard soil by dint of much thumping and pounding the yankee jerked one of the roots this way and that twisting it round and round and then tugging at it horizontally come lend us a hand he cried at last and running up we all four strained away in concert the tough obstacle convulsed the surface with throes and spasms but stuck fast notwithstanding dumb it cried zeke we'll have to get a rope run to the house shorty and fetch one the end of this being attached we took plenty of room and strained away once more give us a song shorty said the doctor who was rather sociable on a short acquaintance where the work to be accomplished is any way difficult this mode of enlivening toil is quite efficacious among sailors so willing to make everything as cheerful as possible shorty struck up were you ever in dumbarton a marvellously inspiring but somewhat indecorous windless chorus at last the yankee cast a damper on his enthusiasm by exclaiming in a pet oh dumb your singing keep quiet and pull away this we now did in the most uninteresting silence until with a jerk that made every elbow hum the root dragged out and most inelegantly we all landed upon the ground the doctor quite exhausted stayed there and deluded into believing that after so doughty a performance we would be allowed a cessation of toil took off his hat and fanned himself rather a hard customer that peter observed the yankee going up to him but it's no use for any on em to hang back for i'm dumbed if they hain't got to come out whether or no hurrah let's get at it again mercy ejaculated the doctor rising slowly and turning round he'll be the death of us falling to with our hose again we worked singly or together as occasion required until nooning time came the period so called by the planters embraced about three hours in the middle of the day during which it was so excessively hot in this still brooding valley shut out from the trades and only open toward the leeward side of the island that labor in the sun was out of the question to use a hyperbolical phrase of shorty's it was hot enough to melt the nose half a brass monkey returning to the house shorty assisted by old tonoy cooked the dinner and after we had all partaken thereof both the cockney and zeke threw themselves into one of the hammocks inviting us to occupy the other thinking it no bad idea we did so and after skirmishing with the mosquitoes managed to fall into a doze as for the planters more accustomed to nooning they at once presented a nuptial back to each other and were soon snoring away at a great rate tonoy snoozed on a mat in one corner at last we were roused by zeke's crying out up buys up rise and shine time to get at it again looking at the doctor i perceived very plainly that he had decided upon something in a languid voice he told zeke that he was not very well indeed that he had not been himself for some time past though a little rest no doubt would recruit him the yankee thinking from this that our valuable services might be lost to him altogether were he too hard upon us at the outset at once begged us both to consult our own feelings and not exert ourselves for the present unless we felt like it then without recognizing the fact that my comrade claimed to be actually unwell he simply suggested that since he was so tired he had better perhaps swing in his hammock for the rest of the day 
If agreeable, however, I myself might accompany him upon a little bullock hunting excursion in the neighboring hills. In this proposition I gladly acquiesced, though Peter, who was a great sportsman, put on a long face. The muskets and ammunition were forthwith got down from overhead, and, everything being then ready, Zeke cried out, Tonoi, come, Aramai, get up, we want you for pilot. Shorty, my lad, look arter things, you know, and if you likes, why, there's them roots in the field yonder. Having thus arranged his domestic affairs to please himself, though little to Shorty's satisfaction, I thought, he slung his powder-horn over his shoulder, and we started. Tonoi was at once set on in advance, and, leaving the plantation, he struck into a path which led toward the mountains. After hurrying through the thickets for some time, we came out into the sunlight in an open glade, just under the shadow of the hills. Here Zeke pointed aloft to a beetling crag, far distant, where a bullock, with horns thrown back, stood like a statue. CHAPTER 54 SOME ACCOUNT OF THE WILD CATTLE IN POLYNESIA Before we proceed further, a word or two concerning these wild cattle and the way they came on the island. Some fifty years ago, Vancouver left several bullocks, sheep, and goats at various places in the society group. He instructed the natives to look after the animals carefully, and by no means to slaughter any, until a considerable stock had accumulated. The sheep must have died off, for I never saw a solitary fleece in any part of Polynesia. The pair left were an ill-assorted couple, perhaps, separated in disgust, and died without issue. As for the goats, occasionally you came across a black, misanthropic ram, nibbling the scant herbage of some height inaccessible to man, in preference to the sweet grasses of the valley below the goats were not very numerous. The bullocks, coming of a prolific ancestry, are a hardy set, racing over the island of Imeo in considerable numbers, though in Tahiti but few of them are seen. At the former place, the original pair must have scampered off to the interior, because it is now so thickly populated by their wild progeny. The herds are the private property of Queen Pomeree, from whom the planters had obtained permission to shoot for their own use as many as they pleased. The natives stand in great awe of these cattle, and for this reason are excessively timid in crossing the island, preferring rather to sail round to an opposite village in their canoes. Tonoi abounded in bullock stories, most of which, by the by, had a spice of the marvellous. The following is one of these. Once upon a time he was going over the hills with a brother, now no more, when a great bull came bellowing out of the wood, and both took to their heels. The old chief sprang into a tree, his companion, flying in an opposite direction, was pursued, and in the very act of reaching up to a bough, trampled under foot. The unhappy man was then gored, tossed in the air, and finally run away with on the bull's horns. More dead than alive, Tonoi waited till all was over, and then made the best of his way home. The neighbors, armed with two or three muskets, at once started to recover, if possible, his unfortunate brother's remains. At nightfall, they returned without discovering any trace of him. But the next morning, Tonoi himself caught a glimpse of a bullock marching across the mountain's brow, with a long dark object borne aloft on his horns. Having referred to Vancouver's attempts to colonize the islands with useful quadrupeds, we may as well say something concerning his success upon Hawaii, one of the largest islands in the whole Polynesian archipelago, and which gives the native name to the well-known cluster named by Cook in honor of Lord Sandwich. Hawaii is some one hundred leagues in circuit, and covers an area of over four thousand square miles. Until within a few years past, its interior was almost unknown, even to the inhabitants themselves, who, for ages, had been prevented from wandering thither by certain strange superstitions. Pele, the terrific goddess of the volcanoes Mauna Roa and Mauna Kea, footnote, perhaps the most remarkable volcanoes in the world, for very interesting accounts of three adventurous expeditions to their summits, 17,000 feet above the level of the sea, 
see lord byron's voyage of h b m ship blonde ellis's journal of a visit to the sandwich islands and wilkie's narrative of the u s exploring expedition and footnote was supposed to guard all the passes to the extensive valleys lying round their base there are legends of her having chased with streams of fire several impious adventurers near hilo a jet-black cliff is shown with the vitreous torrent apparently pouring over into the sea just as it cooled after one of these supernatural eruptions to these inland valleys and the adjoining hillsides which are clothed in the most luxuriant vegetation vancouver's bullocks soon wandered and unmolested for a long period multiplied in vast herds some twelve or fifteen years ago the natives losing sight of their superstitions and learning the value of the hides in commerce began hunting the creatures that wore them but being very fearful and awkward in a business so novel their success was small and it was not until the arrival of a party of spanish hunters men regularly trained to their calling upon the plains of california that the work of slaughter was fairly begun the spaniards were showy fellows tricked out in gay blankets leggings worked with porcupine quills and jingling spurs mounted upon trained indian mares these heroes pursued their prey up to the very base of the burning mountains making the profoundest solitudes ring with their shouts and flinging the lasso under the very nose of the vixen goddess pele hilo a village upon the coast was their place of resort and thither flocked roving whites from all the islands of the group as pupils of the dashing spaniards many of these dissipated fellows quaffing too freely of the stirrup cup and riding headlong after the herds when they reeled in the saddle were unhorsed and killed this was about the year eighteen thirty five when the present king tamahamaha the third was a lad with royal impudence laying claim to the sole property of the cattle he was delighted with the idea of receiving one of every two silver dollars paid down for their hides so with no thought for the future the work of extermination went madly on in three years time eighteen thousand bullocks were slain almost entirely upon the single island of hawaii the herds being thus nearly destroyed the sagacious young prince imposed a rigorous taboo upon the few surviving cattle which was to remain in force for ten years during this period not yet expired all hunting is forbidden unless directly authorized by the king the massacre of the cattle extended to the hapless goats in one year three thousand of their skins were sold to the merchants of honolulu fetching a quartilia or shilling sterling apiece after this digression it is time to run on after tonoi and the yankee end of chapters fifty three and fifty four recording by tricia g Chapters fifty five and fifty six of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter fifty five. A hunting ramble with Zeke. At the foot of the mountain, a steep path went up among rocks and clefts, mantled with verdure. Here and there were green gulfs, down which it made one giddy to peep at last we gained an overhanging wooded shelf of land which crowned the heights and along this the path well shaded ran like a gallery in every direction the scenery was enchanting there was a low rustling breeze and below in the vale the leaves were quivering the sea lay blue and serene in the distance and inland the surface swelled up ridge after ridge and peak upon peak all bathed in the indian haze of the tropics and dreamy to look upon still valleys leagues away reposed in the deep shadows of the mountains and here and there waterfalls lifted up their voices in the solitude high above all and central the marling spike lifted its finger upon the hillsides small groups of bullocks were seen some quietly browsing others slowly winding into the valleys we went on directing our course for a slope of the hills a mile or two further where the nearest bullocks were seen we were cautious in keeping to windward of them their sense of smell and hearing being 
like those of all wild creatures, exceedingly acute. As there was no knowing that we might not surprise some other kind of game in the coverts through which we were passing, we crept along warily. The wild hogs of the island are uncommonly fierce, and as they often attack the natives, I could not help following Tonoi's example of once in a while peeping in under the foliage. Frequent retrospective glances, also, served to assure me that our retreat was not cut off. As we rounded a clump of bushes, a noise behind them, like the crackling of dry branches, broke the stillness. In an instant, Tonoi's hand was on a bow, ready for a spring, and Zeke's finger touched the trigger of his piece. Again the stillness was broken, and thinking it high time to get ready, I brought my musket to my shoulder. "'Look sharp!' cried the Yankee, and dropping on one knee, he brushed the twigs aside. Presently off went his piece, and with a wild snort, a black, bristling boar, his cherry red lip curled up by two glittering tusks, dashed unharmed across the path, and crashed through the opposite thicket. I saluted him with a charge as he disappeared, but not the slightest notice was taken of the civility. By this time Tonoi, the illustrious descendant of the bishops of Imeo, was twenty feet from the ground. "'Aramai! Come down, you old fool!' cried the Yankee. "'The pesky critters on t'other side of the island afore this!' "'I rather guess,' he continued, as we began reloading, "'that we've spoiled sport by firing at that air tarnal hog. "'Them bullocks heard the racket, and is flinging their tails about now on the keen jump. "'Quick, Paul, and let's climb that rock yonder, and see if so be there's any in sight.' but none were to be seen except at such a distance that they looked like ants. As evening was now at hand, my companion proposed our returning home forthwith, and then after a sound night's rest, starting in the morning upon a good day's hunt with the whole force of the plantation. Following another path in descending into the valley, we passed through some nobly wooded land on the face of the mountain. One variety of tree particularly attracted my attention. The black mossy stem, over seventy feet high, was perfectly branchless for many feet above the ground, when it shot out in broad boughs laden with lustrous leaves of the deepest green. And all round the lower part of the trunk, thin slab-like buttresses of bark, perfectly smooth and radiating from a common centre, projected along the ground for at least two yards. From below, these natural props tapered upward until gradually blended with the trunk itself there were signs of the wild cattle having sheltered themselves behind them. Zeke called this the canoe tree, as in old times it supplied the navies of the kings of Tahiti. For canoe building, the wood is still used. Being extremely dense and impervious to worms, it is very durable. Emerging from the forest, when halfway down the hillside we came upon an open space covered with ferns and grass, over which a few lonely trees were casting long shadows in the setting sun. Here a piece of ground some hundred feet square, covered with weeds and brambles, and sounding hollow to the tread, was enclosed by a ruinous wall of stones. Tonoi said it was an almost forgotten burial place of great antiquity, where no one had been interred since the islanders had been Christians. Sealed up in dry, deep vaults, many a dead heathen was lying there. Curious to prove the old man's statement, I was anxious to get a peep at the catacombs, but, hermetically overgrown with vegetation as they were, no aperture was visible. Before gaining the level of the valley, we passed by the site of a village near a watercourse long since deserted. There was nothing but stone walls and rude, dismantled foundations of houses constructed of the same material. Large trees and brushwood were growing rankly among them. I asked Tonoi how long it was since any one had lived here. Me Tamari, boy, plenty Kanaker, men, Martair, he replied. Now only poor Pehe Kanaka, fisherman, left. Me born here. Going down the valley, vegetation of every kind presented a different aspect from that of the high land. Chief among the trees of the plain on this island is the Ati, large and lofty, with a massive trunk, and broad, laurel-shaped leaves. 
the wood is splendid. In Tahiti I was shown a narrow polished plank, fit to make a cabinet for a king. Taken from the heart of the tree, it was of a deep, rich scarlet, traced with yellow veins, and in some places clouded with hazel. In the same grove with the regal Ati, you may see the beautiful flowering Hotu, its pyramid of shining leaves diversified with numberless small white blossoms. Planted with trees as the valley is, almost throughout its entire length, I was astonished to observe so very few which were useful to the natives. Not one in a hundred was a coconut or breadfruit tree. But here Tonoi again enlightened me. In the sanguinary religious hostilities which ensued upon the conversion to Christianity of the first Pomeroy, a war party from Tahiti destroyed, by girdling the bark, entire groves of these invaluable trees. For some time afterward, they stood stark and leafless in the sun, sad monuments of the fate which befell the inhabitants of the valley. Chapter 56 Mosquitoes The night following the hunting trip, Long Ghost and myself, after a valiant defense, had to fly the house on account of the mosquitoes. And here I cannot avoid relating a story, rife among the natives, concerning the manner in which these insects were introduced upon the island. Some years previous, a whaling captain, touching at an adjoining bay, got into difficulty with its inhabitants, and at last carried his complaint before one of the native tribunals. But receiving no satisfaction, and deeming himself aggrieved, he resolved upon taking signal revenge. One night, he towed a rotten old water cask ashore, and left it in a neglected taro patch, where the ground was warm and moist. Hence the mosquitoes. I tried my best to learn the name of this man, and hereby do what I can to hand it down to posterity. It was Coleman, Nathan Coleman. The ship belonged to Nantucket. When tormented by the mosquitoes, I found much relief in coupling the word Coleman with another of one syllable, and pronouncing them together energetically. The doctor suggested a walk to the beach, where there was a long, low shed tumbling to pieces, but open lengthwise to a current of air which he thought might keep off the mosquitoes. So thither we went. The ruin partially sheltered a relic of times gone by, which, a few days after, we examined with much curiosity. It was an old war canoe, crumbling to dust. Being supported by the same rude blocks upon which, apparently, it had years before been hollowed out, in all probability it had never been afloat. Outside, it seemed originally stained of a green color, which, here and there, was now changed into a dingy purple. The prow terminated in a high, blunt peak. Both sides were covered with carving, and upon the stern was something which Longost maintained to be the arms of the royal house of Pomery. The device had a heraldic look, certainly, being two sharks with the talons of hawks clawing a knot left projecting from the wood. The canoe was at least forty feet long, about two wide, and four deep. The upper part, consisting of narrow planks laced together with cords of sinate, had in many places fallen off, and lay decaying upon the ground. Still there were ample accommodations left for sleeping, and in we sprang, the doctor into the bow, and I into the stern. I soon fell asleep, but waking suddenly, cramped in every joint from my constrained posture, I thought for an instant that I must have been prematurely screwed down in my coffin. Presenting my compliments to Long Ghost, I asked how it fared with him. Bad enough, he replied, as he tossed about in the outlandish rubbish lying in the bottom of our couch. Pa, how these old mats smell! As he continued talking in this exciting strain for some time, I at last made no reply, having resumed certain mathematical reveries to induce repose. But finding the multiplication table to no avail, I summoned up a grayish image of chaos in a sort of sliding fluidity, and was just falling into a nap on the strength of it, when I heard a solitary and distinct buzz. The hour of my calamity was at hand. One blended hum, the creature darted into the canoe like a small swordfish, and I out of it. Upon getting into the open air, to my surprise, 
there was Long Ghost fanning himself wildly with an old paddle. He had just made a noiseless escape from a swarm, which had attacked his own end of the canoe. It was now proposed to try the water, so a small fishing canoe hauled up nearby was quickly launched, and paddling a good distance off, we dropped overboard the native contrivance for an anchor, a heavy stone attached to a cable of braided bark. At this part of the island, the encircling reef was close to the shore, leaving the water within smooth and extremely shallow. It was a blessed thought. We knew nothing till sunrise, when the motion of our aquatic cot awakened us. I looked up, and beheld Zeke wading toward the shore, and towing us after him by the bark cable. Pointing to the reef, he told us we had had a narrow escape. It was true enough. The water sprites had rolled our stone out of its noose, and we had floated away. End of chapters 55 and 56 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 57 and 58 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 57. The Second Hunt in the Mountains. Fair dawned over the hills of Martair the jocund morning of our hunt. Everything had been prepared for it overnight, and when we arrived at the house, a good breakfast was spread by Shorty and old Tonoi was bustling about like an innkeeper. Several of his men also were in attendance to accompany us with calabashes of food, and, in case we met with any success, to officiate as bearers of burdens on our return. Apprised the evening previous of the meditated sport, the doctor had announced his willingness to take part therein. Now subsequent events made us regard this expedition as a shrewd device of the Yankees. Once get us off on a pleasure trip, and with what face could we afterwards refuse to work? Besides, he enjoyed all the credit for giving us a holy day. Nor did he omit assuring us that, work or play, our wages were all the while running on. A dilapidated old musket of Tonoy's was borrowed for the doctor. It was exceedingly short and heavy, with a clumsy lock, which required a strong finger to pull the trigger. On trying the piece by firing at a mark, Long Ghost was satisfied that it could not fail of doing execution. The charge went one way, and he the other. Upon this, he endeavored to negotiate an exchange of muskets with Shorty, but the cockney was proof against his blandishments. At last, he entrusted his weapon to one of the natives to carry for him. Marshalling our forces, we started for the head of the valley near which a path ascended to a range of high land, said to be a favorite resort of the cattle. Shortly after gaining the heights, a small herd, some way off, was perceived entering a wood. We hurried on, and, dividing our party, went in after them at four different points, each white man followed by several natives. I soon found myself in a dense covert, and after looking round, was just emerging into a clear space when I heard a report, and a bullet knocked the bark from a tree nearby. The same instant there was a trampling and crashing, and five bullocks nearly abreast broke into view across the opening and plunged right towards the spot where myself and three of the islanders were standing. They were small, black, vicious-looking creatures, with short, sharp horns, red nostrils, and eyes like coals of fire. On they came, their dark woolly heads hanging down. By this time my island backers were roosting among the trees. Glancing round for an instant, to discover a retreat in case of emergency, I raised my piece when a voice cried out from the wood, Right between the orns, Paul, right between the orns. Down went my barrel in range with a small white tuft on the forehead of the headmost one, and letting him have it, I darted to one side. As I turned again, the five bullocks shot by like a blast, making the air eddy in their wake. The Yankee now burst into view and saluted them in flank, whereupon the fierce little bull with the tufted forehead flirted his long tail over his buttocks, kicked out with his hind feet, and shot forward at full length. It was nothing but a graze, 
and in an instant they were out of sight, the thicket into which they broke rocking overhead and marking their progress. The action over, the heavy artillery came up, in the person of the long doctor with his blunderbuss. "'Where are they?' he cried, out of breath. "'A mile or two half by this time,' replied the cockney. "'Lord, Paul, you ought to have sent an ale-stone into that little blacken.' While excusing my want of skill as well as I could, Zeke, rushing forward, suddenly exclaimed, "'Creation! What are you about there, Peter?' Peter, incensed at our ill luck, and ignorantly imputing it to the cowardice of our native auxiliaries, was bringing his piece to bear upon his trembling squire, the musket-carrier, now descending a tree. Pulling trigger, the bullet went high over his head, and hopping to the ground, bellowing like a calf, the fellow ran away as fast as his heels could carry him. The rest followed us, after this, with fear and trembling." After forming our line of march anew, we went on for several hours without catching a glimpse of the game, the reports of the muskets having been heard at a great distance. At last we mounted a craggy height to obtain a wide view of the country. From this place we beheld three cattle quietly browsing in a green opening of a wood below, the trees shutting them in all round. A general re-examination of the muskets now took place, followed by a hasty lunch from the calabashes. We then started. As we descended the mountainside, the cattle were in plain sight until we entered the forest when we lost sight of them for a moment, but only to see them again as we crept close up to the spot where they grazed. They were a bull, a cow, and a calf. The cow was lying down in the shade by the edge of the wood, the calf sprawling out before her in the grass, licking her lips while old Taurus himself stood close by, casting a paternal glance at this domestic little scene, and conjugally elevating his nose in the air. "'Now then,' said Zeke in a whisper, "'let's take the poor creeters while they are huddled together. Crawl along, boys, crawl along. Fire together, mind, and not till I say the word.' We crept up to the very edge of the open ground, and knelt behind a clump of bushes, resting our leveled barrels among the branches. The slight rustling was heard. Taurus turned round, dropped his head to the ground, and sent forth a low, sullen bellow, then snuffed the air. The cow rose on her foreknees, pitched forward alarmedly, and stood upon her legs, while the calf, with ears pricked, got right underneath her. All three were now grouped, and in an instant would be off. "'I take the bull!' cried our leader fire the calf fell like a clod its dam uttered a cry and thrust her head into the thicket but she turned and came moaning up to the lifeless calf going round and round it snuffing fiercely with her bleeding nostrils a crashing in the wood and a loud roar announced the flying bull soon another shot was fired and the cow fell leaving some of the natives to look after the dead cattle the rest of us hurried on after the bull his dreadful bellowings guiding us to the spot where he lay. Wounded in the shoulder, in his fright and agony, he had bounded into the wood. But when we came up to him, he had sunk to the earth in a green hollow, thrusting his black muzzle into a pool of his own blood, and tossing it over his hide in clots. The Yankee brought his piece to a rest, and the next instant, the wild brute sprang into the air, and with his forelegs crouching under him, fell dead. Our island friends were now in high spirits, all courage and alacrity. Old Tonoi thought nothing of taking poor Taurus himself by the horns and peering into his glazed eyes. Our ship knives were at once in request, and skinning the cattle, we hung them high up by cords of bark from the boughs of a tree. Withdrawing into a covert, we there waited for the wild hogs, which, according to Zeke, would soon make their appearance lured by the smell of blood. Presently we heard them coming in two or three different directions, and in a moment they were tearing the offal to pieces. As only one shot at these creatures could be relied on, we intended firing simultaneously, but somehow or other the doctor's piece went off by itself, and one of the hogs dropped. The others then breaking into the thicket, 
the rest of us sprang after them, resolved to have another shot at all hazards. The cockney darted among some bushes, and a few moments after we heard the report of his musket, followed by a quick cry. On running up, we saw our comrade doing battle with a young devil of a boar, as black as night, whose snout had been partly torn away. Firing when the game was in full career, and coming directly toward him, Shorty had been assailed by the enraged brute. It was now crunching the breech of the musket, with which he had tried to club it, Shorty holding fast to the barrel and fingering his waist for a knife. Being in advance of the others, I clapped my gun to the boar's head, and so put an end to the contest. Evening now coming on, we set to work loading our carriers. The cattle were so small that a stout native could walk off with an entire quarter, rushing through thickets and descending rocks without apparent effort, though, to tell the truth, no white man present could have done the thing with any ease. As for the wild hogs, none of the islanders could be induced to carry shorties some invincible superstition being connected with its black color. We were, therefore, obliged to leave it. The other, a spotted one, being slung by green thongs to a pole, was marched off with by two young natives. With our bearers of burdens ahead, we then commenced our return down the valley. Halfway home, darkness overtook us in the woods, and torches became necessary. We stopped and made them of dry palm branches, and then, sending two lads on in advance, for the purpose of gathering fuel to feed the flambeau, we continued our journey. It was a wild sight. The torches, waved aloft, flashed through the forest, and where the ground admitted, the islanders went along at a brisk trot, notwithstanding they bent forward under their loads. Their naked backs were stained with blood, and occasionally, running by each other, they raised wild cries, which startled the hillsides. CHAPTER 58 THE HUNTING FEAST AND A VISIT TO AFRIHITU Two bullocks and a boar, no bad trophies of our day's sport. So by torchlight we marched into the plantation, the wild hog rocking from its pole, and the doctor singing an old hunting song, Tally Ho, the chorus of which swelled high above the yells of the natives. We resolved to make a night of it, kindling a great fire just outside the dwelling, and hanging one of the heifer's quarters from a limb of the banyan tree, every one was at liberty to cut and broil for himself. Baskets of roasted breadfruit and plenty of taro pudding, bunches of bananas and young coconuts had also been provided by the natives against our return. The fire burned bravely, keeping off the mosquitoes, and making every man's face glow like a beaker of port. The meat had a true wild game flavor, not at all impaired by our famous appetites, and a couple of flasks of white brandy, which Zeke, producing from his secret store, circulated freely. There was no end to my long comrade's spirits. After telling his stories and singing his songs, he sprang to his feet, clasped a young damsel of the grove round the waist, and waltzed over the grass with her. But there's no telling all the pranks he played that night. The natives, who delight in a wag, emphatically pronounced him my tie. It was long after midnight ere we broke up, but when the rest had retired, Zeke, with the true thrift of a Yankee, salted down what was left of the meat. The next day was Sunday, and at my request, Shorty accompanied me to Afrihitu, a neighboring bay and the seat of a mission, almost directly opposite Papati. In Afrihitu is a large church and schoolhouse, both quite dilapidated, and planted amid shrubbery on a fine knoll, stands a very tasteful cottage, commanding a view across the channel. In passing, I caught sight of a graceful calico skirt disappearing from the piazza through a doorway. The place was the residence of the missionary. A trim little sailboat was dancing out at her moorings a few yards from the beach. Straggling over the low lands in the vicinity were several native huts, untidy enough, but much better every way than most of those in Tahiti. We attended service at the church, where we found but a small congregation, and after what I had seen in Papati, nothing very interesting took place. But the audience had a curious, fidgety look, which I knew not how to account for, 
until we ascertained that a sermon with the eighth commandment for a text was being preached it seemed that there lived an englishman in the district who like our friends the planters was cultivating tombe's potatoes for the papeete market in spite of all his precautions the natives were in the habit of making nocturnal forays into his enclosure and carrying off the potatoes one night he fired a fowling piece charged with pepper and salt at several shadows which he discovered stealing across his premises they fled but it was like seasoning anything else the knaves stole again with a greater relish than ever and the very next night he caught a party in the act of roasting a basketful of potatoes under his own cooking shed at last he stated his grievances to the missionary who for the benefit of his congregation preached the sermon we heard now there were no thieves in martyr but then the people of the valley were bribed to be honest it was a regular business transaction between them and the planters in consideration of so many potatoes to them in hand duly paid they were to abstain from all depredations upon the plantation another security against roguery was the permanent residence upon the premises of their chief tonoi on our return to martyr in the afternoon we found the doctor and zeke making themselves comfortable the latter was reclining on the ground pipe in mouth watching the doctor who sitting like a turk before a large iron kettle was slicing potatoes and indian turnip and now and then shattering splinters from a bone all of which by turns were thrown into the pot he was making what he called bullock broth in gastronomic affairs my friend was something of an artist and by way of improving his knowledge did nothing the rest of the day but practice in what might be called experimental cookery broiling and grilling and devilling slices of meat and subjecting them to all sorts of igneous operations it was the first fresh beef that either of us had tasted in more than a year oh ye'll pick up arter a while peter observed zeke toward night as long ghost was turning a great rib over the coals what do ye think paul he'll get along i dare say replied i he only wants to get those cheeks of his tanned to tell the truth i was not a little pleased to see the doctor's reputation as an invalid fading away so fast especially as on the strength of his being one he had promised to have such easy times of it and very likely too at my expense end of chapters fifty seven and fifty eight recording by tricia g Chapters fifty nine and sixty of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter fifty nine. The Murphys. Dozing in our canoe the next morning about daybreak, we were wakened by Zeke's hailing us loudly from the beach. Upon paddling up, he told us that a canoe had arrived overnight from Papeete with an order from a ship lying there for a supply of his potatoes and as they must be on board the vessel by noon he wanted us to assist in bringing them down to his sailboat my long comrade was one of those who from always thrusting forth the wrong foot foremost when they rise or committing some other indiscretion of the limbs are more or less crabbed or sullen before breakfast it was in vain therefore that the yankee deplored the urgency of the case which obliged him to call us up thus early. The doctor only looked the more glum and said nothing in reply. At last, by way of getting up a little enthusiasm for the occasion, the Yankee exclaimed quite spiritedly, What do ye say then, boys? Shall we get at it? Yes, in the devil's name, replied the doctor like a snapping turtle, and we moved on to the house. Notwithstanding his ungracious answer, he probably thought that after the gastronomic performance of the day previous, it would hardly do to hang back. At the house we found Shorty ready with the hose, and we at once repaired to the farther side of the enclosure where the potatoes had yet to be taken out of the ground. The rich, tawny soil seemed specially adapted to the crop, the great yellow murphies rolling out of the hills like eggs from a nest 
my comrade really surprised me by the zeal with which he applied himself to his hoe for my own part exhilarated by the cool breath of the morning i worked away like a good fellow as for zeke and the cockney they seemed mightily pleased at this evidence of our willingness to exert ourselves it was not long ere all the potatoes were turned out and then came the worst of it they were to be lugged down to the beach a distance of at least a quarter of a mile and there being no such thing as a barrow or cart on the island there was nothing for it but spinal marrows and broad shoulders well knowing that this part of the business would be anything but agreeable zeke did his best to put as encouraging a face upon it as possible and giving us no time to indulge in desponding thoughts gleefully directed our attention to a pile of rude baskets made of stout stalks which had been provided for the occasion so without more ado we helped ourselves from the heap and soon we were all four staggering along under our loads the first trip down we arrived at the beach together zeke's enthusiastic cries proving irresistible a trip or two more however and my shoulders began to grate in their sockets while the doctor's tall figure acquired an obvious stoop presently we both threw down our baskets protesting we could stand it no longer but our employers bent as it were upon getting the work out of us by a silent appeal to our moral sense toiled away without pretending to notice us it was as much to say there men we've been boarding and lodging ye for the last three days and yesterday ye did nothing earthly but eat so stand by now and look at us working if ye dare thus driven to it then we resumed our employment yet in spite of all we could do we lagged behind zeke and shorty who breathing hard and perspiring at every pore toiled away without pause or cessation i almost wickedly wished that they would load themselves down with one potato too many gasping as i was with my own hamper i could not for the life of me help laughing at long ghost there he went his long neck thrust forward his arms twisted behind him to form a shelf for his basket to rest on and his stilts of legs every once in a while giving way under him as if his knee joints slipped either way there i carry no more he exclaimed all at once flinging his potatoes into the boat where the yankee was just then stowing them away oh then said zeke quite briskly i guess you and paul had better try the barrel machine come along i'll fix ye out in no time and so saying he waded ashore and hurried back to the house bidding us follow wondering what upon earth the barrel machine could be and rather suspicious of it we limped after on arriving at the house we found him getting ready a sort of sedan chair it was nothing more than an old barrel suspended by a rope from the middle of a stout oar quite an ingenious contrivance of the yankees and his proposed arrangement with regard to mine and the doctor's shoulders was equally so there now said he when everything was ready there's no back-breaking about this you can stand right up under it you see just try it once and he politely rested the blade of the oar on my comrade's right shoulder and the other end on mine leaving the barrel between us just the thing he added standing off admiringly while we remained in this interesting attitude there was no help for us with broken hearts and backs we trudged back to the field the doctor all the while saying masses upon starting with the loaded barrel for a few paces we got along pretty well and were constrained to think the idea not a bad one but we did not long think so in less than five minutes we came to a dead halt the springing and buckling of the clumsy oar being almost unendurable let's shift ends cried the doctor who did not quite relish the blade of the stick which was cutting into the blade of his shoulder at last by stages short and frequent we managed to shamble down to the beach where we again dumped our cargo in something of a pet why not make the natives help asked long ghost rubbing his shoulder natives be dumbed said the yankee twenty on em ain't worth one white man they never was meant to work any them chaps and they knows it too for dumbed little work any on em ever does 
but notwithstanding this abuse, Zeke was at last obliged to press a few of the bipeds into service. Aramai, come here, he shouted to several, who, reclining on a bank, had hitherto been critical observers of our proceedings, and, among other things, had been particularly amused by the performance with the sedan chair. After making these fellows load their baskets together, the Yankee filled his own, and then drove them before him down to the beach. Probably he had seen the herds of panniered mules, driven in this way by mounted Indians, along the great road from Callao to Lima. The boat at last loaded, the Yankee taking with him a couple of natives, at once hoisted sail, and stood across the channel for Papati. The next morning at breakfast, old Tonoi ran in, and told us that the voyagers were returning. We hurried down to the beach, and saw the boat gliding toward us, with a dozing islander at the helm, and Zeke standing up in the bows, jingling a small bag of silver, the proceeds of his cargo. CHAPTER Sixty: WHAT THEY THOUGHT OF US IN MARTER Several quiet days now passed away, during which we just worked sufficiently to sharpen our appetites, the planters leniently exempting us from any severe toil. Their desire to retain us became more and more evident, which was not to be wondered at, for, beside esteeming us from the beginning a couple of civil, good-natured fellows, who would soon become quite at home with them, they were not slow in perceiving that we were far different from the common run of rovers, and that our society was both entertaining and instructive to a couple of solitary, illiterate men like themselves. In a literary point of view, indeed, they soon regarded us with emotions of envy and wonder, and the doctor was considered nothing short of a prodigy. The cockney found out that he, the doctor, could read a book upside down, without even so much as spelling the big words beforehand, and the Yankee, in the twinkling of an eye, received from him the sum total of several arithmetical items, stated aloud, with the view of testing the extent of his mathematical lore. Then, frequently, in discoursing upon men and things, my long comrade employed such imposing phrases, that, upon one occasion, they actually remained uncovered while he talked. In short, their favorable opinion of Long Ghost in particular rose higher and higher every day, and they began to indulge in all manner of dreams concerning the advantages to be derived from employing so learned a laborer. Among other projects revealed was that of building a small craft of some forty tons for the purpose of trading among the neighboring islands. With a native crew, we could then take turns cruising over the tranquil Pacific, touching here and there, as Caprice suggested, and collecting romantic articles of commerce. Biche de Mer, the pearl oyster, arrowroot, ambergris, sandalwood, coconut oil, and edible bird's nests. This South Sea yachting was delightful to think of, and straight away the doctor announced his willingness to navigate the future schooner, clear of all shoals and reefs whatsoever. His impudence was audacious. He enlarged upon the science of navigation, treated us to a dissertation on Mercator's sailing and the azimuth compass, and went into an inexplicable explanation of the Lord only knows what plan of his for infallibly settling the longitude. Whenever my comrade thus gave reins to his fine fancy, it was a treat to listen, and therefore I never interfered, but, with the planters, sat in mute admiration before him. This apparent self-abasement on my part must have been considered as truly indicative of our respective merits, for, to my no small concern, I quickly perceived that in the estimate formed of us, Longghost began to be rated far above myself. For aught I knew indeed, he might have privately thrown out a hint concerning the difference in our respective stations aboard the Julia, or else the planters must have considered him some illustrious individual, for certain inscrutable reasons, going incognito. With this idea of him, his undisguised disinclination for work became venial, and, entertaining such views of extending their business, they counted more upon his ultimate value to them as a man of science than as a mere ditcher. Nor did the humorous doctor forbear to foster an opinion every way so advantageous to himself. 
at times for the sake of the joke assuming airs of superiority over myself which though laughable enough were sometimes annoying to tell the plain truth things at last came to such a pass that i told him up and down that i had no notion to put up with his pretensions if he were going to play the gentleman i was going to follow suit and then there would quickly be an explosion at this he laughed heartily and after some mirthful chat we resolved upon leaving the valley as soon as we could do so with a proper regard to politeness at supper therefore the same evening the doctor hinted at our intention though much surprised and vexed zeke moved not a muscle peter he said at last very gravely and after mature deliberation would you like to do the cooking it's easy work and you needn't do anything else paul's heartier he can work in the field when it suits him and before long we'll have ye at something more agreeable won't we shorty shorty assented doubtless the proposed arrangement was a snug one especially the sinecure for the doctor but i by no means relished the functions allotted to myself they were too indefinite nothing final however was agreed upon our intention to leave was revealed and that was enough for the present but as we said nothing further about going the yankee must have concluded that we might yet be induced to remain he redoubled his endeavors to make us contented it was during this state of affairs that one morning before breakfast we were set to weeding in a potato patch and the planters being engaged at the house we were left to ourselves now though the pulling of weeds was considered by our employers an easy occupation for which reason they had assigned it to us and although as a garden recreation it may be pleasant enough for those who like it still long persisted in the business becomes excessively irksome nevertheless we toiled away for some time until the doctor who from his height was obliged to stoop at a very acute angle suddenly sprang upright and with one hand propping his spinal column exclaimed oh that one's joints were but provided with holes to drop a little oil through vain as the aspiration was for this proposed improvement upon our species i cordially responded thereto for every vertebra in my spine was articulating its sympathy presently the sun rose over the mountains inducing that deadly morning languor so fatal to early exertion in a warm climate we could stand it no longer but shouldering our hose moved on to the house resolved to impose no more upon the good nature of the planters by continuing one moment longer in an occupation so extremely uncongenial we freely told them so zeke was exceedingly hurt and said everything he could think of to alter our determination but finding all unavailing he very hospitably urged us not to be in any hurry about leaving for we might stay with him as guests until we had time to decide upon our future movements we thanked him sincerely but replied that the following morning we must turn our backs upon the hills of Martair. End of chapters 59 and 60 Recording by Tricia G. Chapter 61 and 62 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville chapter sixty one preparing for the journey during the remainder of the day we loitered about talking over our plans the doctor was all eagerness to visit tamai a solitary inland village standing upon the banks of a considerable lake of the same name and embosomed among groves from afrehitu you went to this place by a lonely pathway leading through the wildest scenery in the world much too we had heard concerning the lake itself which abounded in such delicious fish that in former times angling parties occasionally came over to it from papeti upon its banks moreover grew the finest fruit of the islands and in their greatest perfection the ve or brazilian plum here attained the size of an orange and the gorgeous arhia or red apple of tahiti blushed with deeper dyes than in any of the seaward valleys 
Beside all this, in Tamai dwelt the most beautiful and unsophisticated women in the entire society group. In short, the village was so remote from the coast, and had been so much less affected by recent changes than other places, that, in most things, Tahitian life was here seen as formerly existing in the days of young Otu, the boy king, in Cook's time. After obtaining from the planters all the information which was needed, we decided upon penetrating to the village, and after a temporary sojourn there, to strike the beach again and journey round to Talu, a harbour on the opposite side of the island. We at once put ourselves in travelling trim, just previous to leaving Tahiti, having found my wardrobe reduced to two suits, frock and trousers, both much the worse for wear, I had quilted them together for mutual preservation, after a fashion peculiar to sailors, in grafting a red frock upon a blue one, and producing thereby a choice variety in the way of clothing. This was the extent of my wardrobe, nor was the doctor by any means better off. His improvidence had at last driven him to don the nautical garb, but by this time his frock, a light cotton one, had almost given out, and he had nothing to replace it. Shorty very generously offered him one which was a little less ragged, but the alms was proudly refused, Longost preferring to assume the ancient costume of Tahiti, the rura. This garment, once worn as a festival dress, is now seldom met with, but Captain Bob had often shown us one which he kept as an heirloom. It was a cloak or mantle of yellow tapa, precisely similar to the poncho worn by the South American Spaniards. The head being slipped through a slit in the middle, the robe hangs about the person in ample drapery. Tonoy obtained sufficient coarse brown tapa to make a short mantle of this description, and in five minutes the doctor was equipped. Zeke, eyeing his toga, critically reminded its proprietor that there were many streams to ford, and precipices to scale, between Martair and Tamai, and if he travelled in petticoats, he had better hold them up. Besides other deficiencies, we were utterly shoeless. In the free and easy Pacific, sailors seldom wear shoes. Mine had been tossed overboard the day we met the trades, and except in one or two tramps ashore, I had never worn any since. In Martair they would have been desirable, but none were to be had. For the expedition we meditated, however, they were indispensable. Zeke, being the owner of a pair of huge, dilapidated boots, hanging from a rafter-like saddlebags, the doctor succeeded in exchanging for them a case-knife, the last valuable article in his possession. For myself, I made sandals from a bullock's hide, such as are worn by the Indians in California. They are made in a minute, the sole, rudely fashioned to the foot, being confined across the instep by three straps of leather. Our headgear deserves a passing word. My comrade's was a brave old Panama hat made of grass, almost as fine as threads of silk, and so elastic that, upon rolling it up, it sprang into perfect shape again. Set off by the jaunty slouch of this Spanish sombrero, Dr. Longghost, in this and his rura, looked like a mendicant grande. Nor was my own appearance in an eastern turban less distinguished. The way I came to wear it was this. My hat having been knocked overboard a few days before reaching Papati, I was obliged to mount an abominable wad of parti-colored worsted, what sailors call a Scotch cap. Everyone knows the elasticity of knit wool, and this Caledonian headdress crowned my temples so effectually that the confined atmosphere engendered was prejudicial to my curls. In vain I tried to ventilate the cap. Every gash made seemed to heal whole in no time. Then such a continual chafing as it kept up in a hot sun. Seeing my dislike to the thing, Hulu, my worthy friend, prevailed upon me to bestow it upon him. I did so, hinting that a good boiling might restore the original brilliancy of the colors. It was then that I mounted the turban. Taking a new regatta frock of the doctor's, which was of a gay calico, and winding it round my head in folds, I allowed the sleeves to droop behind, thus forming a good defense against the sun, though in a shower it was best off. The pendant sleeves adding much to the effect, the doctor always called me the Basha with two tails. 
Thus arrayed, we were ready for Tamai, in whose green saloons we counted upon creating no small sensation. Chapter 62. Tamai. Long before sunrise the next morning, my sandals were laced on, and the doctor had vaulted into Zeke's boots. Expecting to see us again before we went to Talu, the planters wished us a pleasant journey, and on parting, very generously presented us with a pound or two of what sailors call plug tobacco, telling us to cut it up into small change, the Virginian weed being the principal circulating medium on the island. Tamai, we are told, was not more than three or four leagues distant, so making allowances for a wild road, a few hours to rest at noon, and our determination to take the journey leisurely, we counted upon reaching the shores of the lake some time in the flush of the evening. For several hours we went on slowly through wood and ravine, and over hill and precipice, seeing nothing but occasional herds of wild cattle, and often resting, until we found ourselves about noon in the very heart of the island. It was a green, cool hollow among the mountains, into which we at last descended with a bound. The place was gushing with a hundred springs, and shaded over with great solemn trees, on whose mossy boles the moisture stood in beads. Strange to say, no traces of the bullocks ever having been here were revealed, nor was there a sound to be heard, nor a bird to be seen, nor any breath of wind stirring the leaves. The utter solitude and silence were oppressive, and after peering about under the shades, and seeing nothing but ranks of dark, motionless trunks, we hurried across the hollow, and ascended a steep mountain opposite. Midway up, we rested where the earth had gathered about the roots of three palms, and thus formed a pleasant lounge, from which we looked down upon the hollow, now one dark green tuft of woodland at our feet. Here we brought forth a small calabash of poe, a parting present from Tonoi. After eating heartily, we obtained fire by two sticks, and throwing ourselves back, puffed forth our fatigue in wreaths of smoke. At last we fell asleep, nor did we waken till the sun had sunk so low that its rays darted in upon us under the foliage. Starting up, we then continued our journey, and as we gained the mountain top, there, to our surprise, lay the lake and village of Tamai. We had thought it a good league off. Where we stood, the yellow sunset was still lingering, but over the valley below, long shadows were stealing, the rippling green lake reflecting the houses and trees just as they stood along its banks. Several small canoes, moored here and there to posts in the water, were dancing upon the waves, and one solitary fisherman was paddling over to a grassy point. In front of the houses, groups of natives were seen, some thrown at full length upon the ground, and others indolently leaning against the bamboos. With whoop and halloo we ran down the hills, the villagers soon hurrying forth to see who were coming. As we drew near, they gathered round, all curiosity to know what brought the Karhauris into their quiet country. The doctor contriving to make them understand the purely social object of our visit, they gave us a true Tahitian welcome, pointing into their dwellings, and saying they were ours as long as we chose to remain. We were struck by the appearance of these people, both men and women, so much more healthful than the inhabitants of the bays. As for the young girls, they were more retiring and modest, more tidy in their dress, and far fresher and more beautiful than the damsels of the coast. A thousand pities, thought I, that they should bury their charms in this nook of a valley. That night we abode in the house of Rartu, a hospitable old chief. It was right on the shore of the lake, and at supper we looked out through a rustling screen of foliage upon the surface of the starlit water. The next day we rambled about and found a happy little community, comparatively free from many deplorable evils to which the rest of their countrymen were subject. Their time, too, was more occupied. To my surprise, the manufacture of tapa was going on in several buildings. European calicoes were seldom seen, and not many articles of foreign origin of any description. The people of Tamai were nominally Christians, but being so remote from ecclesiastical jurisdiction, their religion sat lightly upon them. We had been told, even, 
that many heathenish games and dances still secretly lingered in their valley. Now the prospect of seeing an old-fashioned Hevar, or Tahitian reel, was one of the inducements which brought us here. And so, finding Rartu rather liberal in his religious ideas, we disclosed our desire. At first he demurred, and shrugging his shoulders like a Frenchman, declared it could not be brought about, was a dangerous matter to attempt, and might bring all concerned into trouble. But we overcame all this, convinced him that the thing could be done, and a Hevar, a genuine pagan fandango, was arranged for that very night. End of chapters 61 and 62 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 63 and 64 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 63 A Dance in the Valley. There were some ill natured people, tell tales, it seemed, in Tamai, and hence there was a deal of mystery about getting up the dance. An hour or two before midnight, Rartu entered the house and, throwing robes of tapa over us, bade us follow at a distance behind him, and, until out of the village, hood our faces. Keenly alive to the adventure, we obeyed. At last, after taking a wide circuit, we came out upon the farthest shore of the lake. It was a wide, dewy space, lighted up by a full moon, and carpeted with a minute species of fern growing closely together. It swept right down to the water, showing the village opposite, glistening among the groves. Near the trees, on one side of the clear space, was a ruinous pile of stones, many rods in extent, upon which had formerly stood a temple of Oro. At present there was nothing but a rude hut, planted on the lowermost terrace. It seemed to have been used as a tapa hairy, or house for making the native cloth. Here we saw lights gleaming from between the bamboos, and casting long, rod-like shadows upon the ground without. Voices were also heard. We went up and had a peep at the dancers, who were getting ready for the ballet. They were some twenty in number, waited upon by hideous old crones, who might have been duenas. Long Ghost proposed to send the latter packing, but Rartu said it would never do, and so they were permitted to remain. We tried to effect an entrance at the door, which was fastened, but after a noisy discussion with one of the old witches within, our guide became fidgety, and at last told us to desist, or we would spoil all. He then led us off to a distance to await the performance, as the girls, he said, did not wish to be recognized. He, furthermore, made us promise to remain where we were until all was over and the dancers had retired. We waited impatiently, and at last they came forth. They were arrayed in short tunics of white tapa, with garlands of flowers on their heads. Following them were the duenas, who remained clustering about the house, while the girls advanced a few paces. And, in an instant, two of them, taller than their companions, were standing side by side in the middle of a ring formed by the clasped hands of the rest. This movement was made in perfect silence. Presently the two girls join hands overhead, and crying out, Ahlu, Ahlu, wave them to and fro, upon which the ring begins to circle slowly, the dancers moving sideways, with their arms a little drooping. Soon they quicken their pace, and at last fly round and round, bosoms heaving, hair streaming, flowers dropping, and every sparkling eye circling in what seemed a line of light. Meanwhile, the pair within were passing and repassing each other incessantly. Inclining sideways, so that their long hair falls far over, they glide this way and that, one foot continually in the air, and their fingers thrown forth and twirling in the moonbeams. Ahlu, Ahlu, again cry the dance queens, and coming together in the middle of the ring, they once more lift up the arch and stand motionless. Ahlu, Ahlu, Every link of the circle is broken, and the girls, deeply breathing, stand perfectly still. They pant hard and fast a moment or two, and then, just as the deep flush is dying away from their faces, slowly recede all round, 
thus enlarging the ring. Again the two leaders wave their hands when the rest pause, and now, far apart, stand in the still moonlight like a circle of fairies. Presently, raising a strange chant, they softly sway themselves, gradually quickening the movement, until at length, for a few passionate moments, with throbbing bosoms and glowing cheeks, they abandon themselves to all the spirit of the dance, apparently lost to everything round. But soon subsiding again into the same languid measure as before, they become motionless, and then, reeling forward on all sides, their eyes swimming in their heads, join in one wild chorus and sink into each other's arms. Such is the lorry lorry, I think they call it, the dance of the backsliding girls of Tamai. While it was going on, we had as much as we could do to keep the doctor from rushing forward and seizing a partner. They would give us no more hevars that night, and Rartu fairly dragged us away to a canoe hauled up on the lake shore. When we reluctantly embarked and paddling over to the village, arrived there in time for a good nap before sunrise. The next day the doctor went about trying to hunt up the overnight dancers. He thought to detect them by their late rising, but never was man more mistaken, for on first sallying out the whole village was asleep, waking up in concert about an hour after. But in the course of the day he came across several whom he at once charged with taking part in the hevar. There were some prim-looking fellows standing by, visiting elders from Afrahitu, perhaps, and the girls looked embarrassed, but parried the exchange most skillfully. Though soft as doves, in general, the ladies of Tamai are, nevertheless, flavored with a slight tincture of what we queerly enough call the devil, and they showed it on the present occasion, for when the doctor pressed one rather hard, she all at once turned round upon him, and giving him a box on the ear, told him to Henry Parar be off with himself. Chapter 64 Mysterious There was a little old man of a most hideous aspect living in Tamai, who, in a coarse mantle of tapa, went about the village dancing and singing and making faces. He followed us about wherever we went, and, when unobserved by others, plucked at our garments, making frightful signs for us to go along with him somewhere and see something. It was in vain that we tried to get rid of him. Kicks and cuffs, even, were at last resorted to. But, though he howled like one possessed, he would not go away, but still haunted us. At last we conjured the natives to rid us of him, but they only laughed. So we were forced to endure the dispensation as well as we could. On the fourth night of our visit, returning home late from paying a few calls through the village, we turned a dark corner of trees and came full upon our goblin friend, as usual chattering and motioning with his hands. The doctor, venting a curse, hurried forward. But from some impulse or other, I stood my ground, resolved to find out what this unaccountable object wanted of us. Seeing me pause, he crept close up to me, peered into my face, and then retreated, beckoning me to follow, which I did. In a few moments the village was behind us, and with my guide in advance, I found myself in the shadow of the heights overlooking the farther side of the valley. Here my guide paused until I came up with him, when, side by side, and without speaking, we ascended the hill. Presently we came to a wretched hut, barely distinguishable in the shade cast by the neighboring trees. Pushing aside a rude sliding door, held together with thongs, the goblin signed me to enter. Within it looked dark as pitch, so I gave him to understand that he must strike a light and go in before me. Without replying, he disappeared in the darkness, and after groping about, I heard two sticks rubbing together, and directly saw a spark. A native taper was then lighted, and I stooped and entered. It was a mere kennel. Foul old mats and broken coconut shells and calabashes were strewn about the floor of earth, and overhead I caught glimpses of the stars through chinks in the roof. Here and there the thatch had fallen through and hung down in wisps. I now told him to set about what he was going to do or produce whatever he had to show without delay. 
looking round fearfully as if dreading a surprise he commenced turning over and over the rubbish in one corner at last he clutched a calabash stained black and with a neck broken off on one side of it was a large hole something seemed to be stuffed away in the vessel and after a deal of poking at the aperture a musty old pair of sailor trousers was drawn forth and holding them up eagerly he inquired how many pieces of tobacco i would give for them without replying i turned away the old man chasing me and shouting as i ran until i gained the village here i dodged him and made my way home resolved never to disclose so inglorious an adventure to no purpose the next morning my comrade besought me to enlighten him i preserved a mysterious silence the occurrence served me a good turn however so long as we abode in tamai for the old clothes man never afterward troubled me but for ever haunted the doctor who in vain supplicated heaven to be delivered from him End of chapters 63 and 64 Recording by Tricia G Chapters 65 and 66 of Omu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville Chapter 65 The Hegira or Flight I say, doctor, cried i a few days after my adventure with the goblin as in the presence of our host we were one morning lounging upon the matting in his dwelling smoking our reed pipes tamai is a thriving place why not settle down faith said he not a bad idea paul but do you fancy they'll let us stay though why certainly they would be overjoyed to have a couple of karhauris for townsmen gad you're right my pleasant fellow ha ha i'll put up a banana leaf as physician from london deliver lectures on polynesian antiquities teach english in five lessons of one hour each establish power looms for the manufacture of tapa lay out a public park in the middle of the village and found a festival in honour of captain cook but surely not without stopping to take breath observed i the doctor's projects to be sure were of a rather visionary cast but we seriously thought nevertheless of prolonging our stay in the valley for an indefinite period and with this understanding we were turning over various plans for spending our time pleasantly when several women came running into the house and hurriedly besought us to hurry hurry make our escape crying out something about the mickenaries thinking that we were about to be taken up under the act for the suppression of vagrancy we flew out of the house sprang into a canoe before the door and paddled with might and main over to the other side of the lake approaching rartu's dwelling was a great crowd among which we perceived several natives who from their partly european dress we were certain did not reside in tamai plunging into the groves we thanked our stars that we had thus narrowly escaped being apprehended as runaway seamen and marched off to the beach this at least was what we thought we had escaped having fled the village we could not think of prowling about its vicinity and then returning in doing so we might be risking our liberty again we therefore determined upon journeying back to martair and setting our faces thitherward we reached the planter's house about nightfall they gave us a cordial reception and a hearty supper and we sat up talking until a late hour we now prepared to go round to talu a place from which we were not far off when at tamai but wishing to see as much of the island as we could we preferred returning to martair and then going round by way of the beach talu the only frequented harbour of Imeo, lies on the western side of the island almost directly over against martair upon one shore of the bay stands the village of partuwai a missionary station in its vicinity is an extensive sugar plantation the best of the south seas perhaps worked by a person from sydney the patrimonial property of the husband of pomeree and every way a delightful retreat partuwai was one of the occasional residences of the court but at the time i write of it was permanently fixed there the queen having fled thither from tahiti partuwai they told us 
was by no means the place Papati was. Ships seldom touched, and very few foreigners were living ashore. A solitary whaler, however, was reported to be lying in the harbor, wooding and watering, and said to be in want of men. All things considered, I could not help looking upon Talu as offering a splendid opening for us adventurers. To say nothing of the facilities presented for going to sea in the whaler, or hiring ourselves out as day laborers in the sugar plantation, there were hopes to be entertained of being promoted to some office of high trust and emolument about the person of Her Majesty the Queen. Nor was this expectation altogether quixotic. In the train of many Polynesian princes, roving whites were frequently found, gentlemen pensioners of state, basking in the tropical sunshine of the court, and leading the pleasantest lives in the world. Upon islands little visited by foreigners, the first seaman that settles down is generally domesticated in the family of the head chief or king, where he frequently discharges the functions of various offices, elsewhere filled by as many different individuals. As historiographer, for instance, he gives the natives some account of distant countries. As commissioner of the arts and sciences, he instructs them in the use of the jackknife, and the best way of shaping bits of iron hoop into spearheads, and as interpreter to his majesty, he facilitates intercourse with strangers, besides instructing the people generally in the uses of the most common English phrases, civil and profane, but oftener the latter. These men generally marry well, often, like Hardy of Hanamanu, into the blood royal. Sometimes they officiate as personal attendant, or first lord-in-waiting, to the king. At Amboy, one of the Tonga Islands, a vagabond Welshman bends his knee as cupbearer to his cannibal majesty. He mixes his morning cup of arva, and, with profound genuflections, presents it in a coconut bowl, richly carved. Upon another island of the same group, where it is customary to bestow no small pains in dressing the hair, frizzing it out by a curious process into an enormous pope's head, an old man-of-war's man fills the post of barber to the king. And as his majesty is not very neat, his mop is exceedingly populous, so that, when Jack is not engaged in dressing the head entrusted to his charge, he busies himself in gently titillating it, a sort of skewer being actually worn about the patient's hair for that special purpose. Even upon the Sandwich Islands, a low rabble of foreigners is kept about the person of Tamahamaha, for the purpose of ministering to his ease or enjoyment. Billy Loon, a jolly little negro, tricked out in a soiled blue jacket, studded all over with rusty bell buttons, and garnished with shabby gold lace, is the royal drummer and pounder of the tambourine. Joe, a wooden-legged Portuguese, who lost his leg by a whale, is violinist, and Mordecai, as he is called, a villainous-looking scamp, going about with his cups and balls in a side pocket, diverts the court with his jugglery. These idle rascals receive no fixed salary, being altogether dependent upon the casual bounty of their master. Now and then they run up a score at the dance-houses in Honolulu, where the illustrious Tamahamaha III afterwards calls and settles the bill. A few years since, an auctioneer to his majesty came near being added to the retinue of state. It seems that he was the first man who had practiced his vocation on the Sandwich Islands, and delighted with the sport of bidding upon his wares, the king was one of his best customers. At last he besought the man to leave his profession, and he should be handsomely provided for at court. But the auctioneer refused, and so the ivory hammer lost the chance of being borne before him on a velvet cushion when the next king went to be crowned. But it was not as strolling players, nor as footmen out of employ, that the doctor and myself looked forward to our approaching introduction to the court of the Queen of Tahiti. On the contrary, as before hinted, we expected to swell the appropriations of breadfruit and coconuts on the civil list by filling some honorable office in her gift. We were told that to resist the usurpation of the French, the Queen was rallying about her person all the foreigners she could. Her partiality for the English and Americans was well known, and this was an additional ground for our anticipating a favorable reception. 
Zeke had informed us, moreover, that by the Queen's counsellors at Partuwai, a war of aggression against the invaders at Papati had been seriously thought of. Should this prove true, a surgeon's commission for the doctor, and a lieutenancy for myself, were certainly counted upon in our sanguine expectations. Such, then, were our views, and such our hopes, in projecting a trip to Talu. But in our most lofty aspirations, we by no means lost sight of any minor matters which might help us to promotion. The doctor had informed me that he excelled in playing the fiddle. I now suggested that as soon as we arrived at Partuwai, we should endeavor to borrow a violin for him, or if this could not be done, that he should manufacture some kind of a substitute, and thus equipped, apply for an audience of the queen. Her well-known passion for music would at once secure his admittance, and so, under the most favorable auspices, bring about our introduction to her notice. And who knows, said my waggish comrade, throwing his head back and performing an imaginary air by briskly drawing one arm across the other, who knows that I may not fiddle myself into Her Majesty's good graces so as to become a sort of Rizio to the Tahitian princess. Chapter 64. How We Were to Get to Talu The inglorious circumstances of our somewhat premature departure from Tamai filled the sagacious doctor and myself with sundry misgivings for the future. Under Zeke's protection, we were secure from all impertinent interference in our concerns on the part of the natives. But as friendless wanderers over the island, we ran the risk of being apprehended as runaways, and as such, sent back to Tahiti. The truth is that the rewards constantly offered for the apprehension of deserters from ships induce some of the natives to eye all strangers suspiciously. A passport was therefore desirable, but such a thing had never been heard of in Imeo. At last, Longos suggested that as the Yankee was well known and much respected all over the island, we should endeavor to obtain from him some sort of paper, not only certifying to our having been in his employ, but also to our not being highwaymen, kidnappers, nor yet runaway seamen. Even written in English, a paper like this would answer every purpose for the unlettered natives, standing in great awe of the document, would not dare to molest us until acquainted with its purport. Then, if it came to the worst, we might repair to the nearest missionary, and have the passport explained. Upon informing Zeke of these matters, he seemed highly flattered with the opinion we entertained of his reputation abroad, and he agreed to oblige us. The doctor at once offered to furnish him with a draft of the paper, but he refused, saying he would write it himself. With a rooster's quill, therefore, a bit of soiled paper and a stout heart, he set to work. Evidently, he was not accustomed to composition, for his literary throes were so violent that the doctor suggested that some sort of a Caesarean operation might be necessary. The precious paper was at last finished, and a great curiosity it was. We were much diverted with his reasons for not dating it. In this here dumbed climate, he observed, a feller can't keep the run of the months nohow, cause there's no seasons, no summer and winter to go by. One's eternally thinkin' it's always July, it's so pesky hot. A passport provided, we cast about for some means of getting to Talu. The island of Imeo is very nearly surrounded by a regular breakwater of coral, extending within a mile or less of the shore. The smooth canal within furnishes the best means of communication with the different settlements, all of which, with the exception of Tamai, are right upon the water. And so indolent are the Aimeos that they think nothing of going twenty or thirty miles round the island in a canoe in order to reach a place not a quarter of that distance by land. But as hinted before, the fear of the bullocks has something to do with this. The idea of journeying in a canoe struck our fancy quite pleasantly, and we at once set about chartering one if possible, but none could we obtain, for not only did we have nothing to pay for hiring one, but we could not expect to have it loaned, inasmuch as the good-natured owner would, in all probability, have to walk along the beach as we paddled, in order to bring back his property when we had no further use for it. At last it was decided to commence our journey on foot, 
trusting that we would soon fall in with a canoe going our way, in which we might take passage. The planters said we would find no beaten path. All we had to do was to follow the beach, and, however inviting it might look inland, on no account must we stray from it. In short, the longest way round was the nearest way to Talu. At intervals there were little hamlets along the shore, besides lonely fishermen's huts here and there, where we could get plenty to eat without pay, so there was no necessity to lay in any store. Intending to be off before sunrise the next morning, so as to have the benefit of the coolest part of the day, we bade our kind host farewell overnight, and then, repairing to the beach, we launched our floating pallet and slept away merrily till dawn. End of chapters 65 and 66 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 67 and 68 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 67. The Journey Round the Beach. It was on the fourth day of the first month of the Hegira, or flight from Tamai, we now reckoned our time thus, that, rising bright and early, we were up and away out of the valley of Martair, before the fishermen even were stirring. It was the earliest dawn. The morning only showed itself along the lower edge of a bank of purple clouds, pierced by the misty peaks of Tahiti. The tropical day seemed too languid to rise. Sometimes, starting fitfully, it decked the clouds with faint edgings of pink and gray, which, fading away, left all dim again. Anon it threw out thin, pale rays, growing lighter and lighter, until, at last, the golden morning sprang out of the east with a bound, darting its bright beams hither and thither, higher and higher, and sending them broadcast over the face of the heavens. All balmy from the groves of Tahiti came an indolent air, cooled by its transit over the waters, and grateful underfoot was the damp and slightly yielding beach, from which the waves seemed just retired. The doctor was in famous spirits. Removing his rura, he went splashing into the sea, and, after swimming a few yards, waded ashore, hopping, skipping, and jumping along the beach, but very careful to cut all his capers in the direction of our journey. Say what they will of the glowing independence one feels in the saddle, give me the first morning flush of your cheery pedestrian. Thus exhilarated, we went on, as light-hearted and care-free as we could wish. And here I cannot refrain from lauding the very superior inducements which most intertropical countries afford, not only to mere rovers like ourselves, but to penniless people generally. In these genial regions, one's wants are naturally diminished, and those which remain are easily gratified. Fuel, house shelter, and, if you please, clothing may be entirely dispensed with. How different are hard northern latitudes! Alas, the lot of a poor devil, twenty degrees north of the Tropic of Cancer, is indeed pitiable. At last the beach contracted to hardly a yard's width, and the dense thicket almost dipped into the sea. In place of the smooth sand, too, we had sharp fragments of broken coral, which made travelling exceedingly unpleasant. "'Lord, my foot!' roared the doctor, fetching it up for inspection, with a galvanic fling of the limb. A sharp splinter had thrust itself into the flesh through a hole in his boot. My sandals were worse yet, their soles taking a sort of fossil impression of everything trod upon. Turning round a bold sweep of the beach, we came upon a piece of fine open ground, with a fisherman's dwelling in the distance, crowning a knoll which rolled off into the water. The hut proved to be a low, rude erection, very recently thrown up for the bamboos were still green as grass, and the thatching fresh and fragrant as meadow hay. It was open upon three sides, so that, upon drawing near, the domestic arrangements within were in plain sight. No one was stirring, and nothing was to be seen but a clumsy old chest of native workmanship, a few calabashes, and bundles of tapa hanging against a post, and a heap of something, we knew not what, in a dark corner. 
Upon close inspection, the doctor discovered it to be a loving old couple, locked in each other's arms, and rolled together in a tappa mantle. Halloa, Darby! he cried, shaking the one with the beard. But Darby heeded him not, though Joan, a wrinkled old body, started up in a fright and yelled aloud. Neither of us attempted to gag her. She presently became quiet, and after staring hard and asking some intelligible questions, she proceeded to rouse her still slumbering mate. What ailed him we could not tell, but there was no waking him. Equally in vain were all his dear spouse's cuffs, pinches, and other endearments. He lay like a log, face up, and snoring away like a cavalry trumpeter. Here, my good woman, said Long Ghost, just let me try. And, taking the patient right by his nose, he so lifted him bodily into a sitting position, and held him there until his eyes opened. When this event came to pass, Darby looked round like one stupefied, and then, springing to his feet, backed away into a corner, from which place we became the objects of his earnest and respectful attention. Permit me, my dear Darby, to introduce you to my esteemed friend and comrade, Paul, said the doctor, gallanting me up with all the grimace and flourish imaginable. Upon this, Darby began to recover his faculties, and surprised us not a little by talking a few words of English. So far as could be understood, they were expressive of his having been aware that there were two Karhauris in the neighborhood, that he was glad to see us, and would have something for us to eat in no time. How he came by his English was explained to us before we left. Some time previous, he had been a denizen of Papati, where the native language is broidered over with the most classic sailor phrases. He seemed to be quite proud of his residence there, and alluded to it in the same significant way in which a provincial informs you that in his time he has resided in the capital. The old fellow was disposed to be garrulous, but being sharp-set, we told him to get breakfast, after which we would hear his anecdotes. While employed among the calabashes, the strange, antiquated fondness between these old semi-savages was really amusing. I made no doubt that they were saying to each other, Yes, my love, no, my life, just in the same way that some young couples do at home. They gave us a hearty meal and, while we were discussing its merits, they assured us over and over again that they expected nothing in return for their attentions. More, we were at liberty to stay as long as we pleased, and as long as we did stay, their house and everything they had was no longer theirs but ours. Still more, they themselves were our slaves, the old lady to a degree that was altogether superfluous. This now is Tahitian hospitality self-immolation upon one's own hearthstone for the benefit of the guest. The Polynesians carry their hospitality to an amazing extent. Let a native of Waiurar, the westernmost part of Tahiti, make his appearance as a traveler at Partuwai, the most easternly village of Aimeo. Though a perfect stranger, the inhabitants on all sides accost him at their doorways, inviting him to enter and make himself at home. But the traveler passes on, examining every house attentively, until at last he pauses before one which suits him, and then exclaiming, Ah, an amaitai, this one will do, I think. He steps in and makes himself perfectly at ease, flinging himself upon the mats, and very probably calling for a nice young coconut and a piece of toasted breadfruit sliced thin and done brown. Curious to relate, however, should a stranger carrying it thus bravely be afterward discovered to be without a house of his own, why, he may thenceforth go a-begging for his lodgings. The Karhauris, or white men, are exceptions to this rule. Thus is it precisely as in civilized countries, where those who have houses and lands are incessantly bored to death with invitations to come and live in other people's houses, while many a poor gentleman who inks the seams of his coat and to whom the like invitation would be really acceptable may go and sue for it but to the credit of the ancient tahitians it should here be observed that this blemish upon their hospitality is only of recent origin and was wholly unknown in old times so told me captain bob 
in polynesia it is esteemed a great hit if a man succeeded in marrying into a family to which the best part of the community is related heaven knows it is otherwise with us the reason is that when he goes a travelling the greater number of houses are the more completely at his service receiving a paternal benediction from old darby and joan we continued our journey resolved to stop at the very next place of attraction which offered nor did we long stroll for it a fine walk along a beach of shells and we came to a spot where with trees here and there the land was all meadow sloping away to the water which stirred a sedgy growth of reeds bordering its margin close by was a little cove walled in with coral where a fleet of canoes was dancing up and down a few paces distant on a natural terrace overlooking the sea were several native dwellings newly thatched and peeping into view out of the foliage like summer houses as we drew near forth came a burst of voices and presently three gay girls overflowing with life health and youth and full of spirits and mischief one was arrayed in a flaunting robe of calico and her long black hair was braided behind in two immense tresses joined together at the ends and wreathed with the green tendrils of a vine from her self-possessed and forward air i fancied she might be some young lady from papeete on a visit to her country relations her companions wore mere slips of cotton cloth their hair was dishevelled and though very pretty they betrayed the reserve and embarrassment characteristic of the provinces the little gypsy first mentioned ran up to me with great cordiality and giving the tahitian salutation opened upon me such a fire of questions that there was no understanding much less answering them but our hearty welcome to luhulu as she called the hamlet was made plain enough meanwhile dr longghost gallantly presented an arm to each of the other young ladies which at first they knew not what to make of but at last taking it for some kind of joke accepted the civility the names of these three damsels were at once made known by themselves and being so exceedingly romantic i cannot forbear particularizing them upon my comrades arms then were hanging night and morning in the persons of farnowar or the day-born and farnupu or the night-born she with the tresses was very appropriately styled marharar the wakeful or bright-eyed by this time the houses were emptied of the rest of their inmates a few old men and women and several strapping young fellows rubbing their eyes and yawning all crowded round putting questions as to whence we came upon being informed of our acquaintance with zeke they were delighted and one of them recognized the boots worn by the doctor kiki zeke my tie they cried nui nui hannah hannah portarto makes plenty of potatoes there was now a little friendly altercation as to who should have the honor of entertaining the strangers at last a tall old gentleman by name mar harvai with a bald head and white beard took us each by the hand and led us into his dwelling once inside marharvai pointing about with his staff was so obsequious in assuring us that his house was ours that longo suggested he might as well hand over the deed it was drawing near noon so after a light lunch of roasted breadfruit a few whiffs of a pipe and some lively chatting our host admonished the company to lie down and take the everlasting siesta we complied and had a social nap all round chapter sixty eight a dinner party in imeo it was just in the middle of the merry mellow afternoon that they ushered us to dinner underneath a green shelter of palm boughs open all round and so low at the eaves that we stooped to enter within the ground was strewn over with aromatic ferns called nahi freshly gathered which stirred under foot diffused the sweetest odor on one side was a row of yellow mats inwrought with fibres of bark stained a bright red here seated after the fashion of the turk we looked out over a verdant bank upon the mild blue endless pacific so far round had we skirted the island that the view of tahiti was now intercepted upon the ferns before us were laid several layers of broad thick puru leaves 
lapping over one upon the other and upon these were placed side by side newly plucked banana leaves at least two yards in length and very wide the stalks were withdrawn so as to make them lie flat this green cloth was set out and garnished in the manner following first a number of puru leaves by way of plates were ranged along on one side and by each was a rustic nut bowl half filled with sea water and a tahitian roll or small breadfruit roasted brown an immense flat calabash placed in the centre was heaped up with numberless small packages of moist steaming leaves in each was a small fish baked in the earth and done to a turn this pyramid of a dish was flanked on either side by an ornamental calabash one was brimming with the golden-hued poey or pudding made from the red plantain of the mountains the other was stacked up with cakes of the indian turnip previously macerated on a mortar kneaded with the milk of the coconut and then baked in the spaces between the three dishes were piled young coconuts stripped of their husks their eyes had been opened and enlarged so that each was a ready charged goblet there was a sort of side cloth in one corner upon which in bright buff jackets lay the fattest of bananas avies red ripe guavas with the shadows of their crimson pulp flushing through a transparent skin and almost coming and going there like blushes oranges tinged here and there berry brown and great jolly melons which rolled about in very portliness such a heap all ruddy ripe and round bursting with the good cheer of the tropical soil from which they sprang a land of orchards cried the doctor in a rapture and he snatched a morsel from a sort of fruit of which gentlemen of the sanguine temperament are remarkably fond namely the ripe cherry lips of miss dayborn who stood looking on marharvai allotted seats to his guests and the meal began thinking that his hospitality needed some acknowledgment i rose and pledged him in the vegetable wine of the coconut merely repeating the ordinary salutation yar onor boyoi sensible that some compliment after the fashion of white men was paid him with a smile and a courteous flourish of the hand he bade me be seated no people however refined are more easy and graceful in their manners than the aimeos the doctor sitting next our host now came under his special protection lying before his guest one of the packages of fish marharvai opened it and commended its contents to his particular regards but my comrade was one of those who on convivial occasions can always take care of themselves he ate an indefinite number of pehi lilies small fish his own and his next neighbor's breadfruit and helped himself to right and left with all the ease of an accomplished diner out paul said he at last you don't seem to be getting along why don't you try the pepper sauce and by way of example he steeped a morsel of food into his nut full of sea water on following suit i found it quite piquant though rather bitter but on the whole a capital substitute for salt the aimeos invariably use sea water in this way deeming it quite a treat and considering that their country is surrounded by an ocean of ketchup the luxury cannot be deemed an expensive one the fish were delicious the manner of cooking them in the ground preserving all the juices and rendering them exceedingly sweet and tender the plantain pudding was almost cloying the cakes of indian turnip quite palatable and the roasted breadfruit crisp as toast during the meal a native lad walked round and round the party carrying a long staff of bamboo this he occasionally tapped upon the cloth before each guest when a white clotted substance dropped forth with a savour not unlike that of a curd this proved to be loni an excellent relish prepared from the grated meat of ripe coconuts moistened with coconut milk and sea-water and kept perfectly tight until a little past the saccharine stage of fermentation throughout the repast there was much lively chatting among the islanders in which their conversational powers quite exceeded ours the young ladies too showed themselves very expert in the use of their tongues and contributed much to the gaiety which prevailed nor did these lively nymphs suffer the meal to languish 
for upon the doctor's throwing himself back with an air of much satisfaction they sprang to their feet and pelted him with oranges and guavas this at last put an end to the entertainment by a hundred whimsical oddities my long friend became a great favourite with these people and they bestowed upon him a long comical title expressive of his lank figure and rura combined the latter by the by never failed to excite the remark of everybody we encountered the giving of nicknames is quite a passion with the people of tahiti and Imeo. no one with any peculiarity whether of person or temper is exempt not even strangers a pompous captain of a man-of-war visiting tahiti for the second time discovered that among the natives he went by the dignified title of ati poe literally poe head or pudding head nor is the highest rank among themselves any protection the first husband of the present queen was commonly known in the court circles as potbelly he carried the greater part of his person before him to be sure and so did the gentlemanly george the fourth but what a title for a king consort even pomeree itself the royal patronymic was originally a mere nickname and literally signifies one talking through one's nose the first monarch of that name being on a war party and sleeping overnight among the mountains awoke one morning with a cold in his head and some wag of a courtier had no more manners than to vulgarize him thus how different from the volatile polynesian in this as in all other respects is our grave and decorous north american indian while the former bestows a name in accordance with some humorous or ignoble trait the latter seizes upon what is deemed the most exalted or warlike and hence among the red tribes we have the truly patrician appellations of white eagles young oaks fiery eyes and bended bows end of chapters sixty seven and sixty eight recording by tricia g chapters sixty nine and seventy of omu this librivox recording is in the public domain omu a narrative of adventures in the south seas by herman melville chapter sixty nine the cocoa palm while the doctor and the natives were taking a digestive nap after dinner i strolled forth to have a peep at the country which could produce so generous a meal to my surprise a fine strip of land in the vicinity of the hamlet and protected seaward by a grove of coconut and breadfruit trees was under high cultivation sweet potatoes indian turnips and yams were growing also melons a few pineapples and other fruits still more pleasing was the sight of young breadfruit and coconut trees set out with great care as if for once the improvident polynesian had thought of his posterity but this was the only instance of native thrift which ever came under my observation for in all my rambles over tahiti and imeo nothing so much struck me as the comparative scarcity of these trees in many places where they ought to abound entire valleys like martair of inexhaustible fertility are abandoned to all the rankness of untamed vegetation alluvial flats bordering the sea and watered by streams from the mountains are overgrown with a wild scrub guava bush introduced by foreigners and which spreads with such fatal rapidity that the natives standing still while it grows anticipate its covering the entire island even tracts of clear land which with so little pains might be made to wave with orchards lie wholly neglected when i consider their unequalled soil and climate thus unaccountably slighted i often turned in amazement upon the natives about papeete some of whom all but starve in their gardens run to waste upon other islands which i have visited of similar fertility and wholly unreclaimed from their first discovered condition no spectacle of this sort was presented the high estimation in which many of their breadfruit trees are held by the tahitians and Imeos, their beauty in the landscape their manifold uses and the facility with which they are propagated are considerations which render the remissness alluded to still more unaccountable the cocoa palm is an example a tree by far the most important production of nature in the tropics to the polynesian 
it is emphatically the tree of life, transcending even the breadfruit in the multifarious uses to which it is applied. Its very aspect is imposing. Asserting its supremacy by an erect and lofty bearing, it may be said to compare with our trees as man with inferior creatures. The blessings it confers are incalculable. Year after year, the islanders repose beneath its shade, both eating and drinking of its fruit. He thatches his hut with its boughs, and weaves them into baskets to carry his food. He cools himself with a fan plaited from the young leaflets, and shades his head from the sun by a bonnet of the leaves. Sometimes he clothes himself with the cloth-like substance which wraps round the base of the stalks, whose elastic rods, strung with filberts, are used as a taper. The larger nuts, thinned and polished, furnish him with a beautiful goblet, the smaller ones with bowls for his pipes, the dry husks kindle his fires, their fibers are twisted into fishing lines and cords for his canoes, he heals his wounds with a balsam compounded from the juice of the nut, and with the oil extracted from its meat, embalms the bodies of the dead. The noble trunk itself is far from being valueless. Sawn into posts, it upholds the islander's dwelling. Converted into charcoal, it cooks his food. And supported on blocks of stones, rails in his lands. He impels his canoe through the water with a paddle of the wood, and goes to battle with clubs and spears of the same hard material. In pagan Tahiti, a coconut branch was the symbol of regal authority. Laid upon the sacrifice in the temple, it made the offering sacred and with it the priests chastised and put to flight the evil spirits which assailed them. The supreme majesty of Oro, the great god of their mythology, was declared in the coconut log from which his image was rudely carved. Upon one of the Tonga Islands there stands a living tree, revered itself as a deity. Even upon the Sandwich Islands the cocoa palm retains all its ancient reputation the people there having thought of adopting it as the national emblem. The coconut is planted as follows. Selecting a suitable place, you drop into the ground a fully ripe nut and leave it. In a few days, a thin, lance-like shoot forces itself through a minute hole in the shell, pierces the husk, and soon unfolds three pale green leaves in the air, while originating in the same soft white sponge which now completely fills the nut, a pair of fibrous roots, pushing away the stoppers which close two holes in an opposite direction, penetrate the shell, and strike vertically into the ground. A day or two more, and the shell and husk, which in the last and germinating stage of the nut, are so hard that a knife will scarcely make any impression, spontaneously burst by some force within, and henceforth the hardy young plant thrives apace and needing no culture, pruning, or attention of any sort, rapidly arrives at maturity. In four or five years it bears. In twice as many more, it begins to lift its head among the groves, where, waxing strong, it flourishes for near a century. Thus, as some voyager has said, the man who but drops one of those nuts into the ground may be said to confer a greater and more certain benefit upon himself and posterity than many a life's toil in less genial climes. The fruitfulness of the tree is remarkable. As long as it lives, it bears, and without intermission. Two hundred nuts, besides innumerable white blossoms of others, may be seen upon it at one time, and though a whole year is required to bring any one of them to the germinating point, no two, perhaps, are at one time in precisely the same stage of growth. The tree delights in a maritime situation. In its greatest perfection, it is perhaps found right on the seashore, where its roots are actually washed. But such instances are only met with upon islands where the swell of the sea is prevented from breaking on the beach by an encircling reef. No saline flavor is perceptible in the nut produced in such a place. Although it bears in any soil, whether upland or bottom, it does not flourish vigorously inland, and I have frequently observed that when met with far up in the valleys, its tall stem inclines seaward, as if pining after a more genial region. It is a curious fact that, if you deprive the coconut tree of the verdant tuft at its head, 
it dies at once, and if allowed to stand thus, the trunk, which when alive is encased in so hard a bark as to be almost impervious to a bullet, moulders away, and in an incredibly short period becomes dust. This is, perhaps, partly owing to the peculiar constitution of the trunk, a mere cylinder of minute hollow reeds, closely packed, and very hard. But when exposed at top, peculiarly fitted to convey moisture and decay through the entire stem. The finest orchard of cocoa palms I know, and the only plantation of them I ever saw at the islands, is one that stands right upon the southern shore of Papati Bay. They were set out by the first pomery almost a half century ago, and the soil being especially adapted to their growth, the noble trees now form a magnificent grove nearly a mile in extent. No other plant, scarcely a bush, is to be seen within its precincts. The broom road passes through its entire length. At noonday, this grove is one of the most beautiful, serene, witching places that ever was seen. High overhead are ranges of green rustling arches, through which the sun's rays come down to you in sparkles. You seem to be wandering through illimitable halls of pillars. Everywhere you catch glimpses of stately aisles, intersecting each other at all points. A strange silence, too, reigns far and near, the air flushed with the mellow stillness of a sunset. But after the long morning calms, the sea breeze comes in, and creeping over the tops of these thousand trees, they nod their plumes. Soon the breeze freshens, and you hear the branches brushing against each other, and the flexible trunks begin to sway. Towards evening, the whole grove is rocking to and fro, and the traveller on the broom road is startled by the frequent falling of the nuts, snapped from their brittle stems. They come flying through the air, ringing like jugglers' balls, and often bound along the ground for many rods. Chapter 70 Life at Luhulu Finding the society at Luhulu very pleasant, the young ladies in particular being extremely sociable, and, moreover, in love with the famous good cheer of old Marharvai, we acquiesced in an invitation of his to tarry a few days longer. We might then, he said, join a small canoe party, which was going to a place a league or two distant. So averse to all exertion are these people, that they really thought the prospect of thus getting rid of a few miles walking would prevail with us, even if there were no other inducement. The people of the hamlet, as we soon discovered, formed a snug little community of cousins, of which our host seemed the head. Marharvai, in truth, was a petty chief who owned the neighboring islands, and as the wealthy, in most cases, rejoice in a numerous kindred, the family footing upon which everybody visited him was, perhaps, ascribable to the fact of his being the lord of the manor. Like Captain Bob, he was in some things a gentleman of the old school, a stickler for the customs of a past and pagan age. Nowhere else except in Tamai did we find the manners of the natives less vitiated by recent changes. The old-fashioned Tahitian dinner they gave us on the day of our arrival was a fair sample of their general mode of living. Our time passed delightfully. The doctor went his way, and I mine. With a pleasant companion, he was forever strolling inland, ostensibly to collect botanical specimens, while I, for the most part, kept near the sea, sometimes taking the girls an aquatic excursion in a canoe. Often we went fishing, not dozing over stupid hooks and lines, but leaping right into the water and chasing our prey over the coral rocks, spear in hand. Spearing fish is a glorious sport. The Aimeos, all round the island, catch them in no other way. The smooth shallows between the reef and the shore, and at low water the reef itself, being admirably adapted to this mode of capturing them. At almost any time of the day, save ever the sacred hour of noon, you may see the fish hunters pursuing their sport, with loud halloes brandishing their spears and splashing through the water in all directions. Sometimes a solitary native is seen, far out upon a lonely shallow, wading slowly along, with eye intent and poised spear. But the best sport of all is going out upon the great reef itself by torchlight. 
the natives follow this recreation with as much spirit as a gentleman of england does the chase and take full as much delight in it the torch is nothing more than a bunch of dry reeds bound firmly together the spear a long light pole with an iron head on one side barbed i shall never forget the night that old marharvai and the rest of us paddling off to the reef leaped at midnight upon the coral ledges with waving torches and spears we were more than a mile from the land the sullen ocean thundering upon the outside of the rocks dashed the spray in our faces almost extinguishing the flambeaux and far as the eye could reach the darkness of sky and water was streaked with a long misty line of foam marking the course of the coral barrier the wild fishermen flourishing their weapons and yelling like so many demons to scare their prey sprang from ledge to ledge and sometimes darted their spears in the very midst of the breakers but fish spearing was not the only sport we had at luhulu right on the beach was a mighty old coconut tree the roots of which had been underwashed by the waves so that the trunk inclined far over its base from the tuft of the tree a stout cord of bark depended the end of which swept the water several yards from the shore this was a tahitian swing a native lad seizes hold of the cord and after swinging to and fro quite leisurely all at once sends himself fifty or sixty feet from the water rushing through the air like a rocket i doubt whether any of our rope dancers would attempt the feat for my own part i had neither head nor heart for it so after sending a lad aloft with an additional cord by way of security i constructed a large basket of green boughs in which i and some particular friends of mine used to swing over sea and land by the hour end of chapters 69 and 70 recording by trisha g Chapter seventy one and seventy two of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, a narrative of adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter seventy one. We start for Talu. Bright was the morning, and brighter still the smiles of the young ladies who accompanied us when we sprang into a sort of family canoe, wide and roomy, and bid adieu to the hospitable Marharvai and his tenantry. As we paddled away, they stood on the beach waving their hands and crying out aroha aroha farewell farewell as long as we were within hearing very sad at parting with them we endeavoured nevertheless to console ourselves in the society of our fellow passengers among these were two old ladies but as they said nothing to us we will say nothing about them nor anything about the old men who managed the canoe but of the three mischievous, dark-eyed young witches, who lounged in the stern of that comfortable old island gondola, I have a great deal to say. In the first place, one of them was Marhar Rarar, the bright-eyed, and in the second place, neither she nor the romps, her companions, ever dreamed of taking the voyage until the doctor and myself announced our intention. Their going along was nothing more than a madcap frolic. In short, they were a parcel of wicked hoydens bent on mischief who laughed in your face when you looked sentimental and only tolerated your company when making merry at your expense something or other about us was perpetually awaking their mirth attributing this to his own remarkable figure the doctor increased their enjoyment by assuming the part of a merry andrew yet his cap and bells never jingled but to some tune and while playing the tom fool I more than suspected that he was trying to play the rake. At home it is deemed auspicious to go a-wooing in appellates, but coming among the Polynesians your best dress in courting is motley. A fresh breeze springing up, we set our sail of matting and glided along as tranquilly as if floating upon an island stream, the white reef on one hand and the green shore on the other. Soon as we turned a headland we encountered another canoe paddling with might and main in an opposite direction, the strangers shouting to each other, and a tall fellow in the bow dancing up and down like a crazy man. They shot by us like an arrow, though our fellow voyagers shouted again and again for them to cease paddling. According to the natives, this was a kind of royal mail canoe, 
carrying a message from the queen to her friends in a distant part of the island. Passing several shady bowers, which looked quite inviting, we proposed touching and diversifying the monotony of a sea voyage by a stroll ashore. So, forcing our canoe among the bushes, behind a decayed palm lying partly in the water, we left the old folks to take a nap in the shade, and gallanted the others among the trees, which were here trellised with vines and creeping shrubs. In the early part of the afternoon we drew near the place to which the party were going. It was a solitary house, inhabited by four or five old women, who, when we entered, were gathered in a circle about the mats, eating poey from a cracked calabash. They seemed delighted at seeing our companions, but rather drew up when introduced to ourselves. Eyeing us distrustfully, they whispered to know who we were. The answers they received were not satisfactory, for they treated us with marked coolness and reserve, and seemed desirous of breaking off our acquaintance with the girls. Unwilling, therefore, to stay where our company was disagreeable, we resolved to depart without even eating a meal. Informed of this, Marhar Rarar and her companions evinced the most lively concern, and equally unmindful of their former spirits, and the remonstrances of the old ladies, broke forth into sobs and lamentations which were not to be withstood. We agreed, therefore, to tarry until they left for home, which would be at the Aheharar, or falling of the sun, in other words, at sunset. When the hour arrived, after much leave-taking, we saw them safely embarked. As the canoe turned a bluff, they seized the paddles from the hands of the old men, and waved them silently in the air. This was meant for a touching farewell, as the paddle is only waved thus, when the parties separating never more expect to meet. We now continued our journey, and, following the beach, soon came to a level and lofty overhanging bank, which, planted here and there with trees, took a broad sweep round a considerable part of the island. A fine pathway skirted the edge of the bank, and often we paused to admire the scenery. The evening was still and fair, even for so heavenly a climate, and all round, far as the eye could reach, was the bending blue sky and ocean. As we went on, the reef belt still accompanied us, turning as we turned, and thundering its distant face upon the ear, like the unbroken roar of a cataract. Dashing forever against their coral rampart, the breakers looked in the distance like a line of rearing white chargers, reined in, tossing their white manes, and bridling with foam. These great natural breakwaters are admirably designed for the protection of this land. Nearly all the society islands are defended by them. Were the vast swells of the Pacific to break against the soft alluvial bottoms, which in many places border the sea, the soil would soon be washed away, and the natives be thus deprived of their most productive lands. As it is, the banks of no rivulet are firmer. But the coral barriers answer another purpose. They form all the harbors of this group, including the twenty-four round about the shores of Tahiti. Curiously enough, the openings in the reefs, by which alone vessels enter to their anchorage, are invariably opposite the mouths of running streams, an advantage fully appreciated by the mariner who touches for the purpose of watering his ship. It is said that the fresh water of the island, mixing with the salts held in solution by the sea, so acts upon the latter as to resist the formation of the coral, and hence the breaks. Here and there these openings are sentinelled, as it were, by little fairy islets, green as emerald and waving with palms. Strangely and beautifully diversifying the line of breakers, no objects can strike the fancy more vividly. Pomery the second, with a taste in watering places truly Tahitian, selected one of them as a royal retreat. We passed it on our journey. Omitting several further adventures which befell us after leaving the party from Luhulu, we must now hurry on to relate what happened just before reaching the place of our destination. Chapter seventy two A Dealer in the Contraband. It must have been at least the tenth day, reckoning from the Hegira, that we found ourselves the guests of Varvi, an old hermit of an islander, who kept house by himself, perhaps a couple of leagues from Talu. 
a stone's cast from the beach there was a fantastic rock moss-grown and deep in a dell it was insulated by a shallow brook which dividing its waters flowed on both sides until united below twisting its roots round the rock a gnarled aoa spread itself overhead in a wilderness of foliage the elastic branch roots depending from the larger boughs insinuating themselves into every cleft thus forming supports to the parent stem in some places these pendulous branches half grown had not yet reached the rock swinging their loose fibrous ends in the air like whiplashes barvie's hut a mere coop of bamboos was perched upon a level part of the rock the ridge pole resting at one end in a crotch of the aoa and the other propped by a forked bough planted in a fissure notwithstanding our cries as we drew near the first hint the old hermit received of our approach was the doctor's stepping up and touching his shoulder as he was kneeling over on a stone cleaning fish in the brook he leaped up and stared at us but with a variety of uncouth gestures he soon made us welcome informing us by the same means that he was both deaf and dumb he then motioned us into his dwelling going in we threw ourselves upon an old mat and peered round the soiled bamboos and calabashes looked so uninviting that the doctor was for pushing on to talu that night notwithstanding it was near sunset but at length we concluded to stay where we were after a good deal of bustling outside under a decrepit shed the old man made his appearance with our supper in one hand he held a flickering taper and in the other a huge flat calabash scantily filled with viands his eyes were dancing in his head and he looked from the calabash to us and from us to the calabash as much to say ah my lads what do you think of this eh pretty good cheer eh but the fish and indian turnip being none of the best we made but a sorry meal while discussing it the old man tried hard to make himself understood by signs most of which were so excessively ludicrous that we made no doubt he was perpetrating a series of pantomimic jokes the remnants of the feast removed our host left us for a moment returning with a calabash of portly dimensions and furnished with a long hooded neck the mouth of which was stopped with a wooden plug it was covered with particles of earth and looked as if just taken from some place underground with sundry winks and horrible giggles peculiar to the dumb the vegetable demijohn was now tapped the old fellow looking round cautiously and pointing at it as much as to intimate that it contained something which was taboo or forbidden aware that intoxicating liquors were strictly prohibited to the natives we now watched our entertainer with much interest charging a coconut shell he tossed it off and then filling it up again presented the goblet to me disliking the smell i made faces at it upon which he became highly excited so much so that a miracle was wrought upon the spot snatching the cup from my hands he shouted out ah karhauri sabi lili and a arva te maitai in other words what a blockhead of a white man this is the real stuff we could not have been more startled had a frog leaped from his mouth for an instant he looked confused enough himself and then placing a finger mysteriously upon his mouth he contrived to make us understand that at times he was subject to a suspension of the powers of speech deeming the phenomenon a remarkable one every way the doctor desired him to open his mouth so that he might have a look down but he refused this occurrence made us rather suspicious of our host nor could we afterwards account for his conduct except by supposing that his feigning deafness might in some way or other assist him in the nefarious pursuits in which it afterwards turned out that he was engaged this conclusion however was not altogether satisfactory to oblige him we at last took a sip of his arva tea and found it very crude and strong as lucifer curious to know whence it was obtained we questioned him when lighting up with pleasure he seized the taper and led us outside the hut bidding us follow after going some distance through the woods we came to a dismantled old shed of boughs apparently abandoned to decay underneath nothing was to be seen but heaps of decaying leaves and an immense clumsy jar wide-mouthed 
and by some means rudely hollowed out from a ponderous stone here for a while we were left to ourselves the old man placing the light in the jar and then disappearing he returned carrying a long large bamboo and a crotched stick throwing these down he poked under a pile of rubbish and brought out a rough block of wood pierced through and through with a hole which was immediately clapped on top of the jar then planting the crotched stick upright about two yards distant and making it sustain one end of the bamboo he inserted the other end of the ladder into the hole in the block concluding these arrangements by placing an old calabash under the further end of the bamboo coming up to us now with a sly significant look and pointing admirably at his apparatus he exclaimed ah kahauri enahanahana arvati as much as to say this you see is the way it's done his contrivance was nothing less than a native still where he manufactured his island poteen the disarray in which we found it was probably intentional as a security against detection before we left the shed the old fellow toppled the whole concern over and dragged it away piecemeal his disclosing his secret to us thus was characteristic of the two tai or condemners of the missionaries among the natives who presuming that all foreigners are opposed to the ascendancy of the missionaries take pleasure in making them confidants whenever the enactments of their rulers are secretly set at naught the substance from which the liquor is produced is called tea which is a large fibrous root something like a yam but smaller in its green state it is exceedingly acrid but boiled or baked has the sweetness of the sugar cane after being subjected to the fire macerated and reduced to a certain stage of fermentation the tea is stirred up with water and is then ready for distillation on returning to the hut pipes were introduced and after a while long ghost who at first had relished the arva tea as little as myself to my surprise began to wax sociable over it with varvy and before long absolutely got mellow the old toper keeping him company it was a curious sight every one knows that so long as the occasion lasts there is no stronger bond of sympathy and good feeling among men than getting tipsy together and how earnestly nay movingly a brace of worthies thus employed will endeavour to shed light upon and elucidate their mystical ideas fancy varvy and the doctor then lovingly tippling and brimming over with a desire to become better acquainted the doctor politely bent upon carrying on the conversation in the language of his host and the old hermit persisting in trying to talk english the result was that between the two they made such a fricassee of vowels and consonants that it was enough to turn one's brain the next morning on waking i heard a voice from the tombs it was the doctor solemnly pronouncing himself a dead man he was sitting up with both hands clasped over his forehead and his pale face a thousand times paler than ever that infernal stuff has murdered me he cried heavens my head's all wheels and springs like the automaton chess player what's to be done paul i'm poisoned but after drinking an herbal draught concocted by our host and eating a light meal at noon he felt much better so much so that he declared himself ready to continue our journey when we came to start the yankees boots were missing and after a diligent search were not to be found enraged beyond measure their proprietor said that varvy must have stolen them but considering his hospitality i thought this extremely improbable though to whom else to impute the theft i knew not the doctor maintained however that one who was capable of drugging an innocent traveller with arva tea was capable of anything but it was in vain that he stormed and varvy and i searched the boots were gone were it not for this mysterious occurrence and varvy's detestable liquors i would here recommend all travellers going round by the beach to partuwai to stop at the rock and patronize the old gentleman the more especially as he entertains gratis end of chapters 71 and 72 recording by trisha g Chapter seventy three and seventy four of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas, by Herman Melville. Chapter 73. Our Reception at Partu Y. Upon starting at last, I flung away my sandals, by this time quite worn out, with the view of keeping company with the doctor now forced to go barefooted. Recovering his spirits in good time, he protested that boots were a bore after all, and going without them decidedly manly. This was said, be it observed, while strolling along over a soft carpet of grass, a little moist even at midday from the shade of the wood through which we were passing. Emerging from this, we entered upon a blank, sandy tract, upon which the sun's rays fairly flashed, making the loose gravel underfoot well nigh as hot as the floor of an oven. Such yelling and leaping as there was in getting over this ground would be hard to surpass. We could not have crossed at all until towards sunset, had it not been for a few small, wiry bushes growing here and there, into which we every now and then thrust our feet to cool. There was no little judgment necessary in selecting your bush, for if not chosen judiciously, the chances were that on springing forward again and finding the next bush so far off that an intermediate cooling was indispensable, you would have to run back to your old place again. Safely passing the Sahara, or fiery desert, we soothed our half-blistered feet by a pleasant walk through a meadow of long grass, which soon brought us in sight of a few straggling houses sheltered by a grove on the outskirts of the village of Partuwai. My comrade was for entering the first one we came to, but on drawing near they had so much of an air of pretension, at least for native dwellings, that I hesitated, thinking they might be the residences of the higher chiefs, from whom no very extravagant welcome was to be anticipated. While standing irresolute, a voice from the nearest house hailed us. Aramai, Aramai, Karhauri! Come in, come in, strangers! We at once entered, and were warmly greeted. The master of the house was an aristocratic-looking islander, dressed in loose cotton drawers, a fine white shirt, and a sash of red silk tied around the waist, after the fashion of the Spaniards in Chile. He came up to us with a free, frank air, and striking his chest with his hand, introduced himself as Irimir Popo, or to render the Christian name back again into English, Jeremiah Popo. These curious combinations of names among the people of the Society Islands originate in the following way. When a native is baptized, his patronymic often gives offense to the missionaries, and they insist upon changing to something else whatever is objectionable therein. So when Jeremiah came to the font, and gave his name as Narmo Nana Popo, something equivalent to the darer of the devils by night, the reverend gentleman officiating told him that such a heathenish appellation would never do, and a substitute must be had, at least for the devil part of it. Some highly respectable Christian appellations were then submitted, from which the candidate for admission into the church was at liberty to choose. There was Adamo, Adam, Noar, Noah, Davidar, David, Irkobar, James, Eorna, John, Patura, Peter, Erimar, Jeremiah, etc. And thus did he come to be named Jeremiah Popo, or Jeremiah in the Dark, which he certainly was, I fancy, as to the ridiculousness of his new cognomen. We gave our names in return, upon which he bade us be seated, and sitting down himself, asked us a great many questions in mixed English and Tahitian. After giving some directions to an old man to prepare food, our host's wife, a large, benevolent-looking woman, upwards of forty, also sat down by us. In our soiled and travel-stained appearance, the good lady seemed to find abundant matter for commiseration, and all the while kept looking at us piteously, and making mournful exclamations. But Jeremiah and his spouse were not the only inmates of the mansion. In one corner, upon a large native couch, elevated upon posts, reclined a nymph who, half veiled in her own long hair, had yet to make her toilet for the day. She was the only daughter of Popo, and a very beautiful little daughter she was, not more than fourteen, with the most delightful shape, like a bud just blown, and large hazel eyes. They called her Lou, a name rather pretty and genteel, 
and therefore quite appropriate, for a more genteel and ladylike little damsel there was not in all Imeo. She was a cold and haughty young beauty, though, this same little Lou, and never deigned to notice us, further than now and then to let her eyes float over our persons with an expression of indolent indifference. With the tears of the Luhulu girls hardly dry from their sobbing upon our shoulders, this contemptuous treatment stung us not a little. When we first entered, Popo was raking smooth the carpet of dried ferns, which had that morning been newly laid, and now that our meal was ready, it was spread on a banana leaf right upon this fragrant floor. Here we lounged at our ease, eating baked pig and breadfruit off earthen plates, and using, for the first time in many a long month, real knives and forks. These, as well as other symptoms of refinement, somewhat abated our surprise at the reserve of the little Lou. Her parents, doubtless, were magnates in Partuwai, and she herself was an heiress. After being informed of our stay in the Vale of Martair, they were very curious to know on what errand we came to Talu. We merely hinted that the ship lying in the harbor was the reason of our coming. Our Friti, Popo's wife, was a right motherly body. The meal over, she recommended a nap, and upon our waking much refreshed, she led us to the doorway and pointed down among the trees, through which we saw the gleam of water. Taking the hint, we repaired thither, and finding a deep-shaded pool, bathed and returned to the house. Our hostess now sat down by us, and after looking with great interest at the doctor's cloak, felt of my own soiled and tattered garments for the hundredth time, and exclaimed plaintively, Ah, nui nui oli mani, oli mani! Alas, they are very, very old, very old! When our friti, good soul, thus addressed us, she thought she was talking very respectable English. The word nui is so familiar to foreigners throughout Polynesia, and is so often used by them in their intercourse with the natives, that the latter suppose it to be common to all mankind. Oli mani is the native pronunciation of old man, which by society islanders talking Saxon is applied indiscriminately to all aged things and persons whatsoever. Going to a chest filled with various European articles, she took out two suits of new sailor frocks and trousers, and presenting them with a gracious smile, pushed us behind a calico screen and left us. Without any fastidious scruples, we donned the garments, and what with the meal, the nap, and the bath, we now came forth like a couple of bridegrooms. Evening drawing on, lamps were lighted. They were very simple, the half of a green melon, about one-third full of coconut oil, and a wick of twisted tappa floating on the surface. As a night lamp, this contrivance cannot be excelled, a soft dreamy light being shed through the transparent rind. As the evening advanced, other members of the household, whom as yet we had not seen, began to drop in. There was a slender young dandy in a gay striped shirt, and whole fathoms of bright-figured calico tucked about his waist, and falling to the ground. He wore a new straw hat, also, with three distinct ribbons tied about the crown, one black, one green, and one pink. Shoes or stockings, however, he had none. There were a couple of delicate, olive-cheeked little girls, twins, with mild eyes and beautiful hair, who ran about the house, half-naked, like a couple of gazelles. They had a brother, somewhat younger, a fine dark boy, with an eye like a woman's. All these were the children of Popo, begotten in lawful wedlock. Then there were two or three queer-looking old ladies, who wore shabby mantles of soiled sheeting, which fitted so badly, and withal had such a second-hand look, that I at once put their wearers down as domestic paupers, poor relations, supported by the bounty of my lady Arfriti. They were sad, meek old bodies, said little, and ate less and either kept their eyes on the ground or lifted them up deferentially. The semi-civilization of the island must have had something to do with making them what they were. I had almost forgotten Moni, the grinning old man who prepared our meal. His head was a shining, bald globe. He had a round little paunch and legs like a cat. He was Popo's factotum, cook, butler, and climber of the breadfruit and coconut trees, and added to all else, a mighty favorite with his mistress, 
with whom he would sit smoking and gossiping by the hour. Often you saw the indefatigable Moni working away at a great rate, then dropping his employment all at once, never mind what, run off to a little distance, and after rolling himself away in a corner and taking a nap, jump up again and fall to with fresh vigor. From a certain something in the behavior of Popo and his household, I was led to believe that he was a pillar of the church, though, from what I had seen in Tahiti, I could hardly reconcile such a supposition with his frank, cordial, unembarrassed air. But I was not wrong in my conjecture. Popo turned out to be a sort of elder or deacon. He was also accounted a man of wealth, and was nearly related to a high chief. Before retiring, the entire household gathered upon the floor, and in their midst he read aloud a chapter from a Tahitian Bible. Then kneeling with the rest of us, he offered up a prayer. Upon its conclusion, all separated without speaking. These devotions took place regularly every night and morning. Grace, too, was invariably said by this family both before and after eating. After becoming familiarized with the almost utter destitution of anything like practical piety upon these islands, what I observed in our host's house astonished me much. But whatever others might have been, Popo was, in truth, a Christian, the only one, Arfriti excepted, whom I personally knew to be such among all the natives of Polynesia. Chapter 74. Retiring for the Night. The Doctor Grows Devout. They put us to bed very pleasantly. Lying across the foot of Popo's nuptial couch was a smaller one made of core wood, a thin, strong cord twisted from the fibers of the husk of the coconut and woven into an exceedingly light sort of network forming its elastic body. Spread upon this was a single, fine mat with a roll of dried ferns for a pillow and a strip of white tappa for a sheet. This couch was mine. The doctor was provided for in another corner. Lou reposed alone on a little settee with a taper burning by her side, the dandy, her brother, swinging overhead in a sailor's hammock. The two gazelles frisked upon a mat nearby, and the indigent relations borrowed a scant corner of the old butler's pallet, who snored away by the open door. After all had retired, Popo placed the illuminated melon in the middle of the apartment, and so we all slumbered till morning. Upon waking, the sun was streaming brightly through the open bamboos, but no one was stirring. After surveying the fine attitudes into which forgetfulness had thrown at least one of the sleepers, my attention was called off to the general aspect of the dwelling, which was quite significant of the superior circumstances of our host. The house itself was built in the simple but tasteful native style. It was a long, regular oval, some fifty feet in length, with low sides of cane work and a roof thatched with palmetto leaves. The ridge pole was, perhaps, twenty feet from the ground. There was no foundation whatever, the bare earth being merely covered with ferns, a kind of carpeting which serves very well if frequently renewed. Otherwise it becomes dusty and the haunt of vermin, as in the huts of the poorer natives. Beside the couches, the furniture consisted of three or four sailor chests, in which were stored the fine wearing apparel of the household, the ruffled linen shirts of Popo, the calico dresses of his wife and children, and divers odds and ends of European articles, strings of beads, ribbons, Dutch-looking glasses, knives, coarse prints, bunches of keys, bits of crockery, and metal buttons. One of these chests, used as a bandbox by our free tea, contained several of the native hats, coal scuttles, all of the same pattern, but trimmed with variously colored ribbons. Of nothing was our good hostess more proud than of these hats and her dresses. On Sundays she went abroad dozen times, and every time like Queen Elizabeth in a different robe. Popo, for some reason or other, always gave us our meals before the rest of the family were served, and the doctor, who was very discerning in such matters, declared that we fared much better than they. Certain it was, that had Eremir's guests travelled with purses, portmanteaus, and letters of introduction to the queen, they would not have been better cared for. The day after our arrival, Moni, the old butler, brought us in for dinner a small pig baked in the ground. 
all savoury, it lay in a wooden trencher, surrounded by roasted hemispheres of the breadfruit. A large calabash filled with taro pudding, or poey, followed, and the young dandy, overcoming his customary languor, threw down our coconuts from an adjoining tree. When all was ready, and the household looking on, Longost, devoutly clasping his hands over the faded pig, implored a blessing. Hereupon, everybody present looked exceedingly pleased. Popo coming up, and addressing the doctor with much warmth, and our Friti, regarding him with almost maternal affection, exclaimed delightedly, Ah, Mikinari Tata Maitai! In other words, what a pious young man! It was just after this meal that she brought me a roll of grass sinate, of the kind which sailors sew into the frame of their tarpaulins, and then, handing me a needle and thread, bade me begin at once and make myself the hat which I so much needed. An accomplished hand at the business, I finished it that day, merely stitching the braid together, and our Friti, by way of rewarding my industry, with her own olive hands ornamented the crown with a band of flame-colored ribbon the two long ends of which, streaming behind, sailor fashion, still preserved for me the eastern title bestowed by Long Ghost. End of chapters 73 and 74 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 75 and 76 of Omu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 75. A Ramble Through the Settlement. The following morning, making our toilets carefully, we donned our sombreros and sallied out on a tour. Without meaning to reveal our designs upon the court, our principal object was to learn what chances there were for white men to obtain employment under the queen. On this head, it is true, we had questioned Popo, but his answers had been very discouraging so we determined to obtain further information elsewhere. But first, to give some little description of the village. The settlement of Partuwai is nothing more than some eighty houses, scattered here and there, in the midst of an immense grove, where the trees have been thinned out and the underbrush cleared away. Through the grove flows a stream, and the principal avenue crosses it over an elastic bridge of coconut trunks laid together side by side. The avenue is broad and serpentine, well shaded from one end to the other, and as pretty a place for a morning promenade as any lounger could wish. The houses, constructed without the slightest regard to the road, peep into view from among the trees on either side, some looking you right in the face as you pass, and others, without any manners, turning their backs. Occasionally, you observe a rural retreat, enclosed by a picket of bamboos, or with a solitary pane of glass massively framed in the broad side of a dwelling, or with a rude, strange-looking door swinging upon dislocated wooden hinges. Otherwise, the dwellings are built in the original style of the natives, and, never mind how mean and filthy some of them may appear within, they all look picturesque enough without. As we sauntered along, the people we met saluted us pleasantly, and invited us into their houses and in this way we made a good many brief morning calls. But the hour could not have been the fashionable one in Partuwai, since the ladies were invariably in dishabille. However, they in all cases gave us a cordial reception, and were particularly polite to the doctor, caressing him and amorously hanging about his neck, wonderfully taken up, in short, with a gay handkerchief he wore there. A Friti had that morning bestowed it upon the pious youth. With some exceptions, the general appearance of the natives of Partuwai was far better than that of the inhabitants of Papati, a circumstance only to be imputed to their restricted intercourse with foreigners. Strolling on, we turned a sweep of the road when the doctor gave a start, and no wonder. Right before us in the grove was a block of houses, regular square frames boarded over, furnished with windows and doorways, and two stories high. We ran up and found them fast going to decay, very dingy, and here and there covered with moss, no sashes nor doors, and on one side the entire block had settled down nearly a foot. On going into the basement, we looked up clean through the unboarded timbers to the roof, where rays of light glimmering through many a chink 
illuminated the cobwebs which swung all round. The whole interior was dark and close, burrowing among some old mats in one corner, like a parcel of gypsies in a ruin, were a few vagabond natives. They had their dwelling here. Curious to know who on earth could have been thus trying to improve the value of real estate in Partuwai, we made inquiries, and learned that some years previous, the block had been thrown up by a veritable Yankee, one might have known that, a house carpenter by trade, and a bold enterprising fellow by nature. Put ashore from his ship, sick, he first went to work and got well, then sallied out with chisel and plane and made himself generally useful. A sober, steady man, it seems, he at last obtained the confidence of several chiefs, and soon filled them with all sorts of ideas concerning the alarming want of public spirit in the people of Aimeo. More especially did he dwell upon the humiliating fact of their living in paltry huts of bamboo, when magnificent palaces of boards might so easily be mortised together. In the end, these representations so far prevailed with one old chief, that the carpenter was engaged to build a batch of these wonderful palaces. Provided with plenty of men, he at once set to work, built a sawmill among the mountains, felled trees, and sent over to Papati for nails. Presto, the castle rose, but alas, the roof was hardly on, when the Yankee's patron, having speculated beyond his means, broke all to pieces, and was absolutely unable to pay one plug of tobacco in the pound. His failure involved the carpenter, who sailed away from his creditors in the very next ship that touched at the harbor. The natives despised the rickety palace of boards, and often lounged by, wagging their heads and jeering. We were told that the queen's residence was at the extreme end of the village, so without waiting for the doctor to procure a fiddle, we suddenly resolved upon going thither at once, and learning whether any privy councillorships were vacant. Now, although there was a good deal of my waggish comrade's nonsense about what has been said concerning our expectations of court preferment, we, nevertheless, really thought that something to our advantage might turn up in that quarter. Upon approaching the palace grounds, we found them rather peculiar. A broad pier of hewn coral rocks was built right out into the water, and upon this, and extending into the grove adjoining, were some eight or ten very large native houses, constructed in the handsomest style, and enclosed together by a low picket of bamboos, which embraced a considerable area. Throughout the society islands, the residences of the chiefs are mostly found in the immediate vicinity of the sea, a sight which gives them the full benefit of a cooling breeze, nor are they so liable to the annoyance of insects, besides enjoying when they please the fine shade afforded by the neighboring groves, always most luxuriant near the water. Lounging about the grounds were some sixty or eighty handsomely dressed natives, men and women, some reclining on the shady side of the houses, others under the trees, and a small group conversing close by the railing facing us. We went up to the latter, and giving the usual salutation, were on the point of vaulting over the bamboos, when they turned upon us angrily and said we could not enter. We stated our earnest desire to see the queen, hinting that we were bearers of important dispatches, but it was to no purpose, and not a little vexed, we were obliged to return to Popo's without effecting anything. Chapter 76 An Island Jilt We Visit the Ship Upon arriving home, we fully laid open to Popo our motives in visiting Talu, and begged his friendly advice. In his broken English, he cheerfully gave us all the information we needed. It was true, he said, that the Queen entertained some idea of making a stand against the French and it was currently reported also that several chiefs from Bora Bora, Huwaini, Rayatare, and Tahar, the leeward islands of the group, were at that very time taking counsel with her as to the expediency of organizing a general movement throughout the entire cluster, with a view of anticipating any further encroachments on the part of the invaders. Should warlike measures be actually decided upon, it was quite certain that Pomery would be glad to enlist all the foreigners she could. But as to her making officers of either the doctor or me, that was out of the question, because already a number of the Europeans, well known to her, had volunteered as such. 
concerning our getting immediate access to the queen, Popo told us it was altogether doubtful. She living at that time very retired, in poor health and spirits, and averse to receiving calls. Previous to her misfortunes, however, no one, however humble, was denied admittance to her presence. Sailors even attended her levies. Not at all disheartened by these things, we concluded to kill time in Partuwai until some event turned up more favorable to our projects. So that very day we sallied out on an excursion to the ship, which, lying landlocked, far up the bay, yet remained to be visited. Passing on our route a long, low shed, a voice hailed us, White men, ahoy! Turning round, who should we see but a rosy-cheeked Englishman, you could tell his country at a glance, up to his knees in shavings, and planing away at a bench. He turned out to be a runaway ship's carpenter, recently from Tahiti, and now doing a profitable business in Aimeo, by fitting up the dwellings of opulent chiefs with cupboards and other conveniences, and once in a while trying his hand at a lady's work-box. He had been in the settlement but a few months, and already possessed houses and lands. But though blessed with prosperity and high health, there was one thing wanting, a wife, and when he came to speak of the matter, his countenance fell, and he leaned dejectedly upon his plane. It's too bad, he sighed, to wait three long years, and all the while, dear little Luli, living in the same house with that infernal chief from Tahar. Our curiosity was piqued. The poor carpenter, then, had been falling in love with some island coquette who was going to jilt him. But such was not the case. There was a law prohibiting, under a heavy penalty, the marriage of a native with a foreigner, unless the latter, after being three years a resident on the island, was willing to affirm his settled intention of remaining for life. William was therefore in a sad way. He told us that he might have married the girl half a dozen times, had it not been for this odious law. But latterly, she had become less loving and more giddy, particularly with the strangers from Tahar. Desperately smitten, and desirous of securing her at all hazards, he had proposed to the damsel's friends a nice little arrangement introductory to marriage, but they would not hear of it. Besides, if the pair were discovered living together on such a footing, they would be liable to a degrading punishment, sent to work making stone walls and opening roads for the queen. Dr. Longghost was all sympathy. Bill, my good fellow, said he tremulously, let me go and talk to her. But Bill, declining the offer, would not even inform us where his charmer lived. Leaving the disconsolate Willie planing a plank of New Zealand pine, an importation from the Bay of Islands, and thinking the while of Luli, we went on our way. How his suit prospered in the end, we never learned. Going from Popo's house toward the anchorage of the harbor of Talu, you catch no glimpse of the water until coming out from deep groves, you all at once find yourself upon the beach. A bay, considered by many voyagers the most beautiful in the South Seas, then lies before you. You stand upon one side of what seems a deep, green river, flowing through mountain passes to the sea. Right opposite, a majestic promontory divides the inlet from another, called after its discoverer, Captain Cook. The face of this promontory toward Talu is one verdant wall, and at its base the waters lie still and fathomless. On the left hand, you just catch a peep of the widening mouth of the bay, the break in the reef by which ships enter, and beyond, the sea. To the right, the inlet, sweeping boldly round the promontory, runs far away into the land, where, save in one direction, the hills close in on every side, knee-deep in verdure, and shooting aloft in grotesque peaks. The open space lies at the head of the bay, in the distance, it extends into a broad, hazy plain, lying at the foot of an amphitheater of hills. Here is the large sugar plantation previously alluded to. Beyond the first range of hills, you descry the sharp pinnacles of the interior, and among these, the same silent marling spike, which we so often admired from the other side of the island. All alone in the harbor lay the good ship Leviathan. We jumped into the canoe and paddled off to her. 
though early in the afternoon everything was quiet but upon mounting the side we found four or five sailors lounging about the forecastle under an awning they gave us no very cordial reception and though otherwise quite hearty in appearance seemed to assume a look of ill-humour on purpose to honour our arrival there was much eagerness to learn whether we wanted to ship and by the unpleasant accounts they gave of the vessel they seemed desirous to prevent such a thing if possible we asked where the rest of the ship's company were a gruff old fellow made answer one boat's crew of em is gone to davy jones's locker went off after a whale last cruise and never came back again all the starboard watch ran away last night, and the skipper's ashore kitching em. "'And it's shipping you're after, my jewels, is it?' cried a curly-pated little Belfast sailor coming up to us. "'Then arrah, my livelies, just be after sailing ashore in a jiffy. The devil of a skipper will carry yees both to sea, whether or no. Be off with ye, then, darlings, and steer clear of the likes of this ballyhoo of blazes as long as ye live.' they murder us here every day and starve us into the bargain here dick lad harl the poor divil's canoe alongside and paddle away wid yees for dear life but we loitered a while listening to more inducements to ship and at last concluded to stay to supper my sheath knife never cut into a better sea beef than that which we found lying in the kid in the forecastle the bread too was hard dry and brittle as glass and there was plenty of both. While we were below, the mate of the vessel called out for someone to come on deck. I liked his voice. Hearing it was as good as a look at his face. It betokened a true sailor, and no taskmaster. The appearance of the Leviathan herself was quite pleasing. Like all large comfortable old whalemen, she had a sort of motherly look, broad in the beam, flush decks, and four chubby boats hanging at the breast. Her sails were furled loosely upon the yards, as if they had been worn long and fitted easy. Her shrouds swung negligently slack. And as for the running rigging, it never worked hard as it does in some of your dandy ships, jamming in the sheaves of blocks, like Chinese slippers, too small to be useful. On the contrary, the ropes ran glibly through, as if they had many a time travelled the same road and were used to it. When evening came, we dropped into our canoe and paddled ashore, fully convinced that the good ship never deserved the name which they gave her. End of chapters 75 and 76 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 77 and 78 of Omu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. Chapter 77. A Party of Rovers, Little Lou and the Doctor. While in Partuwai, we fell in with a band of six veteran rovers, prowling about the village and harbour, who had just come overland from another part of the island. A few weeks previous, they had been paid off at Papati from a whaling vessel, on board of which they had, six months before, shipped for a single cruise. That is to say, to be discharged at the next port. Their cruise was a famous one, and each man stepped upon the beach at Tahiti, jingling his dollars in a sock. Weary at last of the shore, and having some money left, they clubbed and purchased a sailboat, proposing a visit to a certain uninhabited island, concerning which they had heard strange and golden stories. Of course, they never could think of going to sea without a medicine chest filled with flasks of spirits, and a small cask of the same in the hold, in case the chest should give out. Away they sailed, hoisted a flag of their own, and gave three times three, as they staggered out of the Bay of Papati with a strong breeze, and under all the muslin they could carry. Evening coming on, and feeling in high spirits, and no ways disposed to sleep, they concluded to make a night of it, which they did, all hands getting tipsy, and the two masts going over the side about midnight to the tune of sailing down sailing down on the coast of barbary fortunately one worthy could stand by holding on to the tiller and the rest managed to crawl about and hack away the lanyards of the rigging so as to break clear from the fallen spars while thus employed 
two sailors got tranquilly over the side and went plumb to the bottom under the erroneous impression that they were stepping upon an imaginary wharf to get at their work better after this it blew quite a gale and the commodore at the helm instinctively kept the boat before the wind and by so doing ran over to the opposite island of Aineo. crossing the channel by almost a miracle they went straight through an opening in the reef and shot upon a ledge of coral where the waters were tolerably smooth here they lay until morning when the natives came off to them in their canoes by the help of the islanders the schooner was hove over on her beam ends when finding the bottom knocked to pieces the adventurers sold the boat for a trifle to the chief of the district and went ashore rolling before them their precious cask of spirits its contents soon evaporated and they came to partuai the day after encountering these fellows we were strolling among the groves in the neighbourhood when we came across several parties of natives armed with clumsy muskets rusty cutlasses and outlandish clubs they were beating the bushes shouting aloud and apparently trying to scare somebody they were in pursuit of the strangers who having in a single night set at naught all the laws of the place had thought best to decamp in the daytime popo's house was as pleasant a lounge as one could wish so after strolling about and seeing all there was to be seen we spent the greater part of our mornings there breakfasting late and dining about two hours after noon sometimes we lounged on the floor of ferns smoking and telling stories of which the doctor had as many as a half-pay captain in the army sometimes we chatted as well as we could with the natives and one day joy to us popo brought in three volumes of smollett's novels which had been found in the chest of a sailor who some time previous had died on the island amelia peregrine you hero of rogues count fathom what a debt do we owe you i know not whether it was the reading of these romances or the want of some sentimental pastime which led the doctor about this period to lay siege to the heart of the little Lou. now as i have said before the daughter of popo was most cruelly reserved and never deigned to notice us frequently i addressed her with a long face and an air of the profoundest and most distant respect but in vain she wouldn't even turn up her pretty olive nose ah it's quite plain thought i she knows very well what graceless dogs sailors are and won't have anything to do with us but thus thought not my comrade bent he was upon firing the cold glitter of lou's passionless eyes he opened the campaign with admirable tact making cautious approaches and content for three days with ogling the nymph for about five minutes after every meal on the fourth day he asked her a question on the fifth she dropped a nut of ointment and he picked it up and gave it to her on the sixth he went over and sat down within three yards of the couch where she lay and on the memorable morn of the seventh he proceeded to open his batteries in form the damsel was reclining on the ferns one hand supporting her cheek and the other listlessly turning over the leaves of a tahitian bible the doctor approached now the chief disadvantage under which he laboured was his almost complete ignorance of the love vocabulary of the island but french counts they say make love delightfully in broken english and what hindered the doctor from doing the same in dulcet tahitian so at it he went ah said he smiling bewitchingly oe mickinary oe ready bibly no answer not even a look ah my tie very goody ready bibly mickinary lou without stirring began reading in a low tone to herself mickinary bibly ready goody my tie once more observed the doctor ingeniously transposing his words for the third time but all to no purpose lou gave no sign he paused despairingly but it would never do to give up so he threw himself at full length beside her and audaciously commenced turning over the leaves lou gave a start just one little start barely perceptible and then fumbling something in her hand lay perfectly motionless the doctor rather frightened at his own temerity 
and knowing not what to do next. At last he placed one arm cautiously about her waist. Almost in the same instant he bounded to his feet with a cry. The little witch had pierced him with a thorn. But there she lay, just as quietly as ever, turning over the leaves and reading to herself. My long friend raised the siege incontinently, and made a disorderly retreat to the place where I reclined, looking on. I am pretty sure that Lou must have related this occurrence to her father, who came in shortly afterward, for he looked queerly at the doctor. But he said nothing, and in ten minutes was quite affable as ever. As for Lou, there was not the slightest change in her, and the doctor, of course, forever afterwards held his peace. Chapter 78 Mrs. Bell One day, taking a pensive afternoon stroll along one of the many bridle paths which wind among the shady groves in the neighborhood of Tallu, I was startled by a sunny apparition. It was that of a beautiful young Englishwoman, charmingly dressed, and mounted upon a spirited little white pony. Switching a green branch, she came cantering towards me. I looked round to see whether I could possibly be in Polynesia. There were palm trees, but how to account for the lady? Stepping to one side, as the apparition drew near, I made a polite obeisance. It gave me a bold rosy look, and then, with a gay air, patted its palfrey, crying out, Fly away, Willie! and galloped among the trees. I would have followed, but Willie's heels were making such a pattering among the dry leaves that pursuit would have been useless. So I went straight home to Popo's and related my adventure to the doctor. The next day our inquiries resulted in finding out that the stranger had been in the island about two years, that she came from Sydney and was the wife of Mr. Bell, happy dog, the proprietor of the sugar plantation, to which I have previously referred. To the sugar plantation we went the same day. The country round about was very beautiful, a level basin of verdure surrounded by sloping hillsides. The sugar cane, of which there was about one hundred acres in various stages of cultivation, looked thrifty. A considerable tract of land, however, which seemed to have been formerly tilled, was now abandoned. The place where they extracted the saccharine matter was under an immense shed of bamboos. Here we saw several clumsy pieces of machinery for breaking the cane, also great kettles for boiling the sugar. But at present nothing was going on. Two or three natives were lounging in one of the kettles, smoking. The other was occupied by three sailors from the Leviathan, playing cards. While we were conversing with these worthies, a stranger approached. He was a sunburnt, romantic-looking European, dressed in a loose suit of nankeen. His fine throat and chest were exposed, and he sported a guayaquil hat with a brim like a Chinese umbrella. This was Mr. Bell. He was very civil, showed us the grounds, and, taking us into a sort of arbor, to our surprise, offered to treat us to some wine. People often do the like, but Mr. Bell did more. He produced the bottle. It was spicy sherry, and we drunk out of the halves of fresh citron melons, delectable goblets. The wine was a purchase from the French in Tahiti. Now all this was extremely polite in Mr. Bell. Still, we came to see Mrs. Bell, but she proved to be a phantom, indeed having left the same morning for Papati on a visit to one of the missionary's wives there. I went home much chagrined. To be frank, my curiosity had been wonderfully piqued concerning the lady. In the first place, she was the most beautiful white woman I ever saw in Polynesia. But this is saying nothing. She had such eyes, such moss roses in her cheeks, such a divine air in the saddle, that to my dying day I shall never forget Mrs. Bell. The sugar planter himself was young, robust, and handsome. So, merrily may the little bells increase and multiply, and make music in the land of Imeo. End of chapters 77 and 78 Recording by Tricia G. Chapters 79 and 80 of Omu. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville. 
Chapter 79. Talu Chapel, Holding Court in Polynesia. In Partuwai is to be seen one of the best constructed and handsomest chapels in the South Seas. Like the buildings of the palace, it stands upon an artificial pier, presenting a semicircular sweep to the bay. The chapel is built of hewn blocks of coral, a substance which, although extremely friable, is said to harden by exposure to the atmosphere. To a stranger, these blocks look extremely curious. Their surface is covered with strange fossil-like impressions, the seal of which must have been set before the flood. Very nearly white, when hewn from the reef, the coral darkens with age, so that several churches in Polynesia now look almost as sooty and venerable as famed St. Paul's. In shape, the chapel is an octagon, with galleries all round. It will seat perhaps four hundred people. Everything within is stained a tawny red, and there being but few windows, or rather embrasures, the dusky benches and galleries, and the tall spectre of the pulpit, look anything but cheerful. On Sundays we always went to worship there. Going in the family suite of Popo, we, of course, maintained a most decorous exterior, and hence, by all the elderly people of the village, were doubtless regarded as pattern young men. Popo's seat was in a snug corner, and it being particularly snug, in the immediate vicinity of one of the palm pillars supporting the gallery, I invariably leaned against it, Popo and his lady on one side, the doctor and the dandy on the other, and the children and the poor relations seated behind. As for Lou, instead of sitting, as she ought to have done, by her good father and mother, she must needs run up into the gallery and sit with a parcel of giddy creatures of her own age, who, all through the sermon, did nothing but look down on the congregation, pointing out and giggling at the queer-looking old ladies in dowdy bonnets and scant tunics. But Lou herself was never guilty of these improprieties. Occasionally during the week they have afternoon service in the chapel, when the natives themselves have something to say although their auditors are but few. An introductory prayer being offered by the missionary, and a hymn sung, communicants rise in their places, and exhort in pure Tahitian, and with wonderful tone and gesture. And among them all, Deacon Popo, though he talked most, was the one whom you would have liked best to hear. Much would I have given to have understood some of his impassioned bursts, when he tossed his arms overhead, stamped, scowled, and glared, till he looked like the very angel of vengeance. Deluded man, sighed the doctor on one of these occasions. I fear he takes the fanatical view of the subject. One thing was certain. When Popo spoke, all listened. A great deal more than could be said for the rest, for under the discipline of two or three I could mention, some of the audience napped, others fidgeted, a few yawned, and one irritable old gentleman in a nightcap of coconut leaves used to clutch his long staff in a state of excessive nervousness and stride out of the church, making all the noise he could to emphasize his disgust. Right adjoining the chapel is an immense rickety building with windows and shutters and a half-decayed board flooring laid upon trunks of palm trees. They called it a schoolhouse, but as such we never saw it occupied. It was often used as a courtroom, however, and here we attended several trials among others, that of a decayed naval officer and a young girl of fourteen. The latter, charged with having been very naughty on a particular occasion, set forth in the pleadings, and the former with having aided and abetted her in her naughtiness, and with other misdemeanors. The foreigner was a tall, military-looking fellow, with a dark cheek and black whiskers. According to his own account, he had lost a colonial armed brig on the coast of New Zealand and since then had been leading the life of a man about town among the islands of the Pacific. The doctor wanted to know why he did not go home and report the loss of his brig, but Captain Crash, as they called him, had some incomprehensible reasons for not doing so, about which he could talk by the hour, and no one be any the wiser. Probably he was a discreet man, and thought it best to waive an interview with the lords of the admiralty. For some time past, this extremely suspicious character had been carrying on an illicit trade in French wines and brandies, smuggled over from the men of war lately touching at Tahiti. 
in a grove near the anchorage he had a rustic shanty and arbor where in quiet times when no ships were in taloo a stray native once in a while got boozy and staggered home catching at the coconut trees as he went the captain himself lounged under a tree during the warm afternoons pipe in mouth thinking perhaps over old times and occasionally feeling his shoulders for his lost epaulets but sail ho a ship is descried coming into the bay soon she drops her anchor in its waters and the next day captain crash entertains the sailors in his grove and rare times they have of it drinking and quarrelling together as sociably as you please upon one of these occasions the crew of the leviathan made so prodigious a tumult that the natives indignant at the insult offered their laws plucked up a heart and made a dash at the rioters one hundred strong the sailors fought like tigers but were at last overcome and carried before a native tribunal which after a mighty clamour dismissed everybody but captain crash who was asserted to be the author of the disorders upon this charge then he had been placed in confinement against the coming on of the assizes the judge being expected to lounge along in the course of the afternoon while waiting his honour's arrival numerous additional offences were preferred against the culprit mostly by the old women among others was the bit of a slip in which he stood implicated along with the young lady thus in polynesia as elsewhere charge a man with one misdemeanor and all his peccadilloes are raked up and assorted before him going to the schoolhouse for the purpose of witnessing the trial the din of it assailed our ears a long way off and upon entering the building we were almost stunned about five hundred natives were present each apparently having something to say and determined to say it his honour a handsome benevolent-looking old man sat cross-legged on a little platform seemingly resigned with all christian submission to the uproar he was an hereditary chief in this quarter of the island and judge for life in the district of partuwai there were several cases coming on but the captain and girl were first tried together they were mixing freely with the crowd and as it afterward turned out that every one, no matter who, had a right to address the court, for aught we knew they might have been arguing their own case. At what precise moment the trial began, it would be hard to say. There was no swearing of witnesses, and no regular jury. Footnote. This anomaly exists, notwithstanding that, in other respects, the missionaries have endeavored to organize the native courts upon the English model. End footnote now and then somebody leaped up and shouted out something which might have been evidence the rest meanwhile keeping up an incessant jabbering presently the old judge himself began to get excited and springing to his feet ran in among the crowd wagging his tongue as hard as anybody the tumult lasted about twenty minutes and toward the end of it captain crash might have been seen tranquilly regarding from his honour's platform the judicial uproar in which his fate was about being decided. The result of all was this, that both he and the girl were found guilty. The latter was a judge to make six mats for the queen, and the former, in consideration of his manifold offenses, being deemed incorrigible, was sentenced to eternal banishment from the island. Both these decrees seemed to originate in the general hubbub. His honor, however, appeared to have considerable authority, and was quite plain that the decision received his approval the above penalties were by no means indiscriminately inflicted the missionaries have prepared a sort of penal tariff to facilitate judicial proceedings it costs so many days labor on the broom road to indulge in the pleasures of the calabash so many fathoms of stone wall to steal a musket and so on to the end of the catalogue the judge being provided with a book in which all these matters are cunningly arranged the thing is vastly convenient for instance a crime is proved say bigamy turn to letter b and there you have it bigamy forty days on the broom road and twenty mats for the queen read the passage aloud and sentence is pronounced after taking part in the first trial the other delinquents present were put upon their own in which also the convicted culprits seemed to have quite as much to say as the rest a rather strange proceeding 
but strictly in accordance with the glorious English principle that every man should be tried by his peers. They were all found guilty. Chapter 80 Queen Pomery. It is well to learn something about the people before being introduced to them, and so we will here give some account of Pomery and her family. Every reader of Cook's voyages must remember Otu, who, in that navigator's time, was king of the larger peninsula of Tahiti. Subsequently, assisted by the muskets of the bounty's men, he extended his rule over the entire island. This Otu, before his death, had his name changed into Pomery, which has ever since been the royal patronymic. He was succeeded by his son, Pomery II, the most famous prince in the annals of Tahiti. Though a sad debauchee and drunkard, and even charged with unnatural crimes, he was a great friend of the missionaries, and one of their very first proselytes. During the religious wars into which he was hurried, by his zeal for the new faith, he was defeated and expelled from the island. After a short exile, he returned from Aimeo with an army of eight hundred warriors, and, in the battle of Narai, routed the rebellious pagans with great slaughter, and established himself upon the throne. Thus, by force of arms, was Christianity finally triumphant in Tahiti. Pomery II, dying in 1821, was succeeded by his infant son under the title of Pomery III. This young prince survived his father but six years, and the government then descended to his older sister, Aimata, the present queen, who is commonly called Pomery Vahini I, or the first female Pomery. Her majesty must be now upwards of thirty years of age. She has been twice married. Her first husband was the son of the old king of Tahar, an island about one hundred miles from Tahiti. This proving an unhappy alliance, the pair were soon after divorced. The present husband of the queen is a chief of Aimeo. The reputation of Pomery is not what it ought to be. She and also her mother were, for a long time, excommunicated members of the church and the former, I believe, still is. Among other things, her conjugal fidelity is far from being unquestioned. Indeed, it was upon this ground chiefly that she was excluded from the communion of the church. Previous to her misfortunes, she spent the greater portion of her time sailing about from one island to another, attended by a licentious court, and wherever she went, all manner of games and festivities celebrated her arrival she was always given to display. For several years, the maintenance of a regiment of household troops drew largely upon the royal exchequer. They were trouserless fellows, in a uniform of calico shirts and pasteboard hats, armed with muskets of all shapes and calibers, and commanded by a great noisy chief, strutting it in a coat of fiery red. These heroes escorted their mistress whenever she went abroad. Some time ago, the queen received from her English sister, Victoria, a very showy, though uneasy, headdress, a crown, probably made to order at some tin man's in London. Having no idea of reserving so pretty a bauble for coronation days, which comes so seldom, her majesty sported it whenever she appeared in public, and, to show her familiarity with European customs, politely touched it to all foreigners of distinction, wailing captains and the like, whom she happened to meet in her evening walk on the broom road. The arrival and departure of royalty were always announced at the palace by the court artilleryman, a fat old gentleman, who, in a prodigious hurry and perspiration, discharged minute falling pieces as fast as he could load and fire the same. The Tahitian princess leads her husband a hard life. Poor fellow! He not only caught a queen, but a tartar when he married her. The style by which he is addressed is rather significant. Pomery Tanny, Pomery's man. All things considered, as appropriate a title for a king consort as could be hit upon. If ever there was a hen-pecked husband, that man is the prince. One day, his car esposa, giving audience to a deputation from the captains of the vessels lying in Papati, he ventured to make a suggestion which was very displeasing to her. She turned round, and, boxing his ears, told him to go over to his beggarly island of Aimeo if he wanted to give himself airs. Cuffed and condemned, poor Tanny flies to the bottle, 
or rather to the calabash, for solace. Like his wife and mistress, he drinks more than he ought. Six or seven years ago, when an American man-of-war was lying at Papati, the town was thrown into the greatest commotion by a conjugal assault and battery, made upon the sacred person of Pomery by her intoxicated Tanny. Captain Bob once told me the story, and by way of throwing more spirit into the description, as well as to make up for his oral deficiencies, the old man went through the accompanying action, myself being proxy for the Queen of Tahiti. It seems that on a Sunday morning, being dismissed contemptuously from the royal presence, Tanny was accosted by certain good fellows, friends and boon companions, who condoled with him on his misfortunes, railed against the queen, and finally dragged him away to an illicit vendor of spirits, in whose house the party got gloriously mellow. In this state, Pomery Vahini I was the topic upon which all dilated. A vixen of a queen probably suggested one, it's infamous said another and i'd have satisfaction cried a third and so i will tanny must have hiccoughed for off he went and ascertaining that his royal half was out riding he mounted his horse and galloped after her near the outskirts of the town a cavalcade of women came cantering towards him in the centre of which was the object of his fury smiting his beast right and left he dashed in among them completely overturning one of the party, leaving her on the field, and dispersing everybody else except Pomery. Backing her horse dexterously, the incensed queen heaped upon him every scandalous epithet she could think of, until at last the enraged Tanny leaped out of his saddle, caught Pomery by her dress, and dragging her to the earth, struck her repeatedly in the face, holding on meanwhile by the hair of her head. He was proceeding to strangle her on the spot, when the cries of the frightened attendants brought a crowd of natives to the rescue, who bore the nearly insensible queen away. But his frantic rage was not yet sated. He ran to the palace, and before it could be prevented, demolished a valuable supply of crockery, a recent present from abroad. In the act of perpetrating some other atrocity, he was seized from behind, and carried off with rolling eyes and foaming at the mouth. This is a fair example of a Tahitian in a passion. Though the mildest of mortals in general, and hard to be roused, when once fairly up, he is possessed with a thousand devils. The day following, Tanny was privately paddled over to Imeo in a canoe, where, after remaining in banishment for a couple of weeks, he was allowed to return, and once more give in his domestic adhesion. Though Pomery Vahini I be something of a Jezebel in private life, in her public rule she is said to have been quite lenient and forbearing. This was her true policy. For an hereditary hostility to her family had always lurked in the hearts of many powerful chiefs, the descendants of the old kings of Tayarbu dethroned by her grandfather Otu. Chief among these, and in fact the leader of his party, was Pufai, a bold, able man, who made no secret of his enmity to the missionaries and the government which they controlled. But while events were occurring, calculated to favor the hopes of the disaffected and turbulent, the arrival of the French gave a most unexpected turn to affairs. During my sojourn in Tahiti, a report was rife, which I knew to originate with what is generally called the missionary party, that Pufai and some of the other chiefs of note had actually agreed, for a stipulated bribe, to acquiesce in the appropriation of their country. But subsequent events have rebutted the calumny. Several of these very men have recently died in battle against the French. Under the sovereignty of the Pomeries, the great chiefs of Tahiti were something like the barons of King John, holding feudal sway over their patrimonial valleys, and, on account of their descent, warmly beloved by the people, they frequently cut off the royal revenues by refusing to pay the customary tribute due from them as vassals. The truth is that with the ascendancy of the missionaries, the regal office in Tahiti lost much of its dignity and influence. In the days of paganism, it was supported by all the power of a numerous priesthood, and was solemnly connected with the entire superstitious idolatry of the island. The monarch claimed to be a sort of Biblo of Tararoa, the Saturn of the Polynesian mythology, 
and cousin german to inferior deities his person was thrice holy if he entered an ordinary dwelling never mind for how short a time it was demolished when he left no common mortal being thought worthy to inhabit it afterwards i'm a greater man than king george said the incorrigible young otu to the first missionaries he rides on a horse and i on a man such was the case he travelled post through his dominions on the shoulders of his subjects and relays of immortal beings were provided in all the valleys but alas how times have changed how transient human greatness some years since pomeri vahini the first the granddaughter of the proud otu went into the laundry business publicly soliciting by her agents the washing of the linen belonging to the officers of ships touching in her harbours it is a significant fact and one worthy of record that while the influence of the english missionaries at tahiti has tended to so great a diminution of the regal dignity there that of the american missionaries at the sandwich islands has been purposely exerted to bring about a contrary result End of chapters 79 and 80 Recording by Tricia G Chapters 81 and 82 of Omu This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Omu, A Narrative of Adventures in the South Seas by Herman Melville Chapter 81 We Visit the Court It was about the middle of the second month of the Hegira, and therefore some five weeks after our arrival in Partuwai, that we at last obtained admittance to the residence of the queen. It happened thus. There was a Marquesan in the train of Pomery, who officiated as nurse to her children. According to the Tahitian custom, the royal youngsters are carried about until it requires no small degree of strength to stand up under them. But Marbona was just the man for this, large and muscular, well made as a statue, and with an arm like a degenerate Tahitian's thigh. Embarking at his native island as a sailor, on board of a French whaler, he afterwards ran away from the ship at Tahiti, where, being seen and admired by Pomery, he had been prevailed upon to enlist in her service. Often, when visiting the grounds, we saw him walking about in the shade, carrying two handsome boys, who encircled his neck with their arms marbona's face tattooed as it was in the ornate style of his tribe was as good as a picture-book to these young pomeries they delighted to trace with their fingers the outlines of the strange shapes there delineated the first time my eyes lighted upon the marquesan i knew his country in a moment and hailing him in his own language he turned round surprised that a person so speaking should be a stranger he proved to be a native of Tayor, a glen of Nukohiva. I had visited the place more than once, and so, on the island of Aimeo, we met like old friends. In my frequent conversations with him over the bamboo picket, I found this islander a philosopher of nature, a wild heathen, moralizing upon the vices and follies of the Christian court of Tahiti, a savage scorning the degeneracy of the people among whom fortune had thrown him. I was amazed at the national feelings of the man. No European, when abroad, could speak of his country with more pride than Marbona. He assured me again and again that so soon as he had obtained sufficient money to purchase twenty muskets and as many bags of powder, he was going to return to a place with which Imeo was not worthy to be compared. It was Marbona who, after one or two unsuccessful attempts, at last brought about our admission into the queen's grounds through a considerable crowd he conducted us along the pier to where an old man was sitting to whom he introduced us as a couple of karhauris of his acquaintance anxious to see the sights of the palace the venerable chamberlain stared at us and shook his head the doctor thinking he wanted a fee placed a plug of tobacco in his hand this was ingratiating and we were permitted to pass on Upon the point of entering one of the houses, Marbona's name was shouted in a half a dozen different directions, and he was obliged to withdraw. Thus left at the very threshold to shift for ourselves, my companion's assurance stood us in good stead. He stalked right in, and I followed. The place was full of women, 
who, instead of exhibiting the surprise we expected, accosted us as cordially as if we had called to make our souchong with them by express invitation. In the first place, nothing would do but we must each devour a calabash of poey and several roasted bananas. Pipes were then lighted, and a brisk conversation ensued. These ladies of the court, if not very polished, were surprisingly free and easy in their manners, quite as much so as King Charles's beauties. There was one of them, an arch little miss, who could converse with us pretty fluently, to whom we strove to make ourselves particularly agreeable with the view of engaging her services as Ciceroni. As such, she turned out to be everything we could desire. No one disputing her will, every place was entered without ceremony, curtains brushed aside, mats lifted, and each nook and corner explored. Whether the little damsel carried her mistress's signet, that everything opened to her thus, I know not, but Marbona himself, the bearer of infants, could not have been half so serviceable. Among other houses which we visited was one of large size and fine exterior, the special residence of a European, formerly the mate of a merchant vessel, who had done himself the honor of marrying into the Pomeroy family. The lady he wedded, being a near kinswoman of the queen, he became a permanent member of Her Majesty's household. This adventurer rose late, dressed theatrically in calico and trinkets, assumed a dictatorial tone in conversation, and was evidently upon excellent terms with himself. We found him reclining on a mat, smoking a reed pipe of tobacco, in the midst of an admiring circle of chiefs and ladies. He must have noticed our approach, but instead of rising and offering civilities, he went on talking and smoking without even condescending to look at us. His Highness feels his poey, carelessly observed the doctor. The rest of the company gave us the ordinary salutation, our guide announcing us beforehand. In answer to our earnest requests to see the Queen, we were now conducted to an edifice by far the most spacious in the enclosure. It was at least one hundred and fifty feet in length, very wide, with low eaves, and an exceedingly steep roof of pandanas leaves. There were neither doors nor windows, nothing along the sides but the slight posts supporting the rafters. Between these posts, curtains of fine matting and tappa were rustling all round. Some of them were festooned, or partly withdrawn, so as to admit light and air, and afford a glimpse now and then of what was going on within. Pushing aside one of the screens, we entered. The apartment was one immense hall, the long and lofty ridge pole fluttering with fringed matting and tassels full forty feet from the ground. Lounges of mats, piled one upon another, extended on either side, while here and there were slight screens, forming as many recesses, where groups of natives, all females, were reclining at their evening meal. As we advanced, these various parties ceased their buzzing, and in explanation of our appearance among them, listened to a few cabalistic words from our guide. The whole scene was a strange one, but what most excited our surprise was the incongruous assemblage of the most costly objects from all quarters of the globe. Cheek by jowl, they lay beside the rudest native articles without the slightest attempt at order. Superb writing desks of rosewood, inlaid with silver and mother of pearl, decanters and goblets of cut glass, embossed volumes of plates, gilded candelabras, sets of globes and mathematical instruments, the finest porcelain, richly mounted sabres and fowling pieces, laced hats and sumptuous garments of all sorts, with numerous other matters of European manufacture, were strewn about among greasy calabashes half filled with poey, rolls of old tappa and matting, paddles and fish spears, and the ordinary furniture of a Tahitian dwelling. All the articles first mentioned were, doubtless, presents from foreign powers. They were more or less injured. The fowling pieces and swords were rusted. The finest woods were scratched. And a folio volume of Hogarth lay open, with a coconut shell of some musty preparation capsized among the miscellaneous furniture of the rake's apartment, where that inconsiderate young gentleman is being measured for a coat. While we were amusing ourselves in this museum of curiosities, our conductor plucked us by the sleeve and whispered, Pomery, Pomery, 
are my cow-cow she is coming to sup then said the doctor staring in the direction indicated what say you paul suppose we step up just then a curtain near by lifted and from a private building a few yards distant the queen entered unattended she wore a loose gown of blue silk with two rich shawls one red and the other yellow tied about her neck her royal majesty was barefooted she was about the ordinary size rather matronly her features not very handsome her mouth voluptuous but there was a careworn expression in her face probably attributed to her late misfortunes from her appearance one would judge her about forty but she is not so old as the queen approached one of the recesses her attendants hurried up escorted her in and smoothed the mats on which she at last reclined two girls soon appeared carrying their mistress's repast and then surrounded by cut glass and porcelain and jars of sweetmeats and confections pomeri vahini the first the titular queen of tahiti ate fish and poey out of her native calabashes disdaining either knife or spoon come on whispered long ghost let's have an audience at once and he was on the point of introducing himself when our guide quite alarmed held him back and implored silence the other natives also interfered and as he was pressing forward raised such an outcry that pomeroy lifted her eyes and saw us for the first she seemed surprised and offended and issuing an order in a commanding tone to several of her women waved us out of the house summary as the dismissal was court etiquette no doubt required our compliance we withdrew making a profound inclination as we disappeared behind the tapa eras we departed the grounds without seeking marbona and previous to vaulting over the picket fed our pretty guide after a fashion of our own looking round a few moments after we saw the damsel escorted back by two men who seemed to have been sent after her i trust she received nothing more than a reprimand the next day popo informed us that strict orders had been issued to admit no strangers within the palace precincts chapter eighty one which ends the book disappointed in going to court we determined upon going to sea it would never do longer to trespass on popo's hospitality and then weary somewhat of life in imeo like all sailors ashore i at last pined for the billows now if her crew were to be credited the leviathan was not the craft to our mind but i had seen the captain and liked him he was an uncommonly tall robust fine-looking man in the prime of life there was a deep crimson spot in the middle of each sunburnt cheek doubtless the effect of his sea potations he was a vineyarder or native of the island of martha's vineyard adjoining nantucket and i would have sworn it a sailor and no tyrant previous to this we had rather avoided the leviathan's men when they came ashore but now we purposely threw ourselves in their way in order to learn more of the vessel we became acquainted with a third mate a prussian and an old merchant seaman a right jolly fellow with a face like a ruby we took him to popo's and gave him a dinner of baked pig and breadfruit with pipes and tobacco for dessert the account he gave us of the ship agreed with my own surmises a cosier old craft never floated and the captain was the finest man in the world there was plenty to eat too and at sea nothing to do but sit on the windlass and sail the only bad trait about the vessel was this she had been launched under some baleful star and so was a luckless ship in the fishery she dropped her boats into the brine often enough and they frequently got fast to the whales but lance and harpoon almost invariably drew when darted by the men of the leviathan but what of that we would have all the sport of chasing the monsters with none of the detestable work which follows their capture so hurrah for the coast of japan thither the ship was bound a word now about the hard stories we heard the first time we visited the ship they were nothing but idle fictions got up by the sailors for the purpose of frightening us away so as to oblige the captain who was in want of more hands to lie the longer in a pleasant harbour the next time the vineyarder came ashore we flung ourselves in his path 
when informed of our desire to sail with him, he wanted to know our history, and above all, what countrymen we were. We said that we had left a whaler in Tahiti some time previous, and since then, had been, in the most praiseworthy manner, employed upon a plantation. As for our country, sailors belonged to no nation in particular. We were, on this occasion, both Yankees. Upon this, he looked decidedly incredulous, and freely told us that he verily believed we were both from Sydney. Be it known here that American sea captains in the Pacific are mortally afraid of these Sydney gentry who, to tell the truth, wherever known, are in excessively bad odor. Is there a mutiny on board a ship in the South Seas? Ten to one a Sydney man is the ringleader. Ashore, these fellows are equally riotous. It was on this account that we were anxious to conceal the fact of our having belonged to the Julia, though it annoyed me much thus to deny the dashing little craft. For the same reason, also, the doctor fibbed about his birthplace. Unfortunately, one part of our raiment, our Freetie's blue frocks, was deemed a sort of collateral evidence against us. For, curiously enough, an American sailor is generally distinguished by his red frock, and an English tar by his blue one, thus reversing the national colors. The circumstance was pointed out by the captain, and we quickly explained the anomaly. But in vain. He seemed inveterately prejudiced against us, and in particular, eyed the doctor most distrustfully. By way of propping the latter's pretensions, I was throwing out a hint concerning Kentucky as a land of tall men, when our vineyarder turned away abruptly, and desired to hear nothing more. It was evident that he took Longhost for an exceedingly problematical character. Perceiving this, I resolved to see what a private interview would do. So, one afternoon, I found the captain smoking a pipe in the dwelling of a portly old native, one Mai Mai, who for a reasonable compensation did the honors of Partuwai to illustrious strangers. His guest had just risen from a sumptuous meal of baked pig and taro pudding, and the remnants of the repast were still visible. Two reeking bottles also, with their necks wrenched off, lay upon the mat. All this was encouraging, for, after a good dinner, one feels affluent and amiable, and particularly open to conviction. So, at all events, I found the noble vineyarder. I began by saying that I called for the purpose of setting him right, touching certain opinions of his concerning the place of my nativity. I was an American, thank heaven, and wanted to convince him of the fact. After looking me in the eye for some time, and by so doing, revealing an obvious unsteadiness in his own visual organs, he begged me to reach forth my arm. I did so, wondering what upon earth that useful member had to do with the matter in hand. He placed his fingers upon my wrist, and, holding them there for a moment, sprang to his feet, and, with much enthusiasm, pronounced me a Yankee every beat of my pulse. "'Here, my my!' he cried. "'Another bottle!' and when it came, with one stroke of a knife, he summarily beheaded it, and commanded me to drain it to the bottom. He then told me that if I would come on board his vessel the following morning, I would find the ship's articles on the cabin transom. This was getting along famously, but what was to become of the doctor? I forthwith made an adroit allusion to my long friend, but it was worse than useless. The vineyarder swore he would have nothing to do with him. He, my long friend, was a bird from Sydney, and nothing would make him, the man of little faith, believe otherwise. I could not help loving the free-hearted captain, but indignant at this most unaccountable prejudice against my comrade, I abruptly took leave. Upon informing the doctor of the result of the interview, he was greatly amused, and laughingly declared that the vineyarder must be a penetrating fellow. He then insisted upon my going to sea in the ship, since he well knew how anxious I was to leave. As for himself, on second thoughts, he was no sailor, and although landsmen very often compose part of a whaler's crew, he did not quite relish the idea of occupying a position so humble. In short, he had made up his mind to tarry a while in Aimeo. I turned the matter over and at last decided upon quitting the island. The impulse urging me to see once more, 
and the prospect of eventually reaching home were too much to be resisted especially as the leviathan was so comfortable a craft was now bound on her last whaling cruise and in little more than a year's time would be going round cape horn i did not however covenant to remain in the vessel for the residue of the voyage which would have been needlessly binding myself i merely stipulated for the coming cruise leaving my subsequent movements unrestrained for there is no knowing that i might not change my mind and prefer journeying home by short and easy stages the next day i paddled off to the ship signed and sealed and stepped ashore with my advance fifteen spanish dollars tasseling the ends of my neck handkerchief i forced half of the silver on long ghost and having little use for the remainder would have given it to popo as some small return for his kindness but although he well knew the value of the coin not a dollar would he accept in three days time the prussian came to popo's and told us that the captain having made good the number of his crew by shipping several islanders had determined upon sailing with the land breeze at dawn the following morning these tidings were received in the afternoon the doctor immediately disappeared returning soon after with a couple of flasks of wine concealed in the folds of his frock through the agency of the marquesan he had purchased them from an understrapper of the court i prevailed upon popo to drink a parting shell and even little lou actually looking conscious that one of her hopeless admirers was about leaving partuai for ever sipped a few drops from a folded leaf as for the warm-hearted arfriti her grief was unbounded she even besought me to spend my last night under her own palm thatch and then in the morning she would herself paddle me off to the ship but this i would not consent to and so as something to remember her by she presented me with a roll of fine matting and another of tappa these gifts placed in my hammock i afterwards found very agreeable in the warm latitudes to which we were bound nor did they fail to awaken most grateful remembrances about nightfall we broke away from this generous-hearted household and hurried down to the water it was a mad merry night among the sailors they had on tap a small cask of wine procured in the same way as the doctor's flasks an hour or two after midnight everything was noiseless but when the first streak of the dawn showed itself over the mountains a sharp voice hailed the forecastle and ordered the ship unmoored the anchors came up cheerily the sails were soon set and with the early breath of the tropical morning fresh and fragrant from the hillsides we slowly glided down the bay and were swept through the opening in the reef presently we hove to and the canoes came alongside to take off the islanders who had accompanied us thus far as he stepped over the side i shook the doctor long and heartily by the hand i have never seen or heard of him since crowding all sail we braced the yards square and the breeze freshening bowled straight away from the land once more the sailor's cradle rocked under me and i found myself rolling in my gait by noon the island had gone down in the horizon and all before us was the wide pacific end of chapters 81 and 82 recording by trisha g end of omu a narrative of adventures in the south seas by herman melville